Today we'll discuss the unconventional manifestations of dengue fever. Uh, it's actually not well-defined terminology, though there are some terms called expanded dengue syndrome is mentioned in WHO reports. But I made it very clear that we are not dealing too much with the conventional problems or issues dealt with the dengue. So this is my lecture outline. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of uh, dengue fever, epidemiology, uh, conventional presentation in brief. Then I'll go in details with the unconventional or the, what you call an expanded dengue syndrome. In addition, I'll be sharing with you the real life case scenarios. All these cases are actually my own patients in the last year or so. Most of them are not published yet, one or two are, uh, are, are published. So why we need to know about uh, dengue? It is a disease with a high burden everywhere. Maybe it's less in America or Europe, more common in Asia and uh, Africa. It has a serious drain on country's economy and the health system also. It has a, puts on a lot of stress. As I told you, it's a geographical blood this everywhere kind of large number of cases. And the most uh, important issue is the last one. The, the, the severe dengue or the severity of the dengue cases, which ends up in uh, uh, severe morbidity and including mortality. So that is the uh, major issue. So long back, this fever, there are some fever, it's called as a break bone fever, which is named by Benjamin Bush in 1789. In India, actually, the first confirmed case was in 1963. Of course, it was there before. There's no doubt in that. If you look at the basic disease, how it spreads, it's a, it's a mosquito-borne disease transmitted by Aedes and predominantly the Aedes aegypti. In India, actually, it's predominantly only Aedes aegypti. And the virus belongs to flavivirus uh, genus. There are different serotypes. Again, there are some studies identified serotypes. End of it, actually, it didn't have much implication that which one is more severe, which is less severe. There are some reports of saying particular one is more severe in one area, but still there are one, two, three, four is called den den dengue virus one, two, three, four like this. Disease is endemic in more than 100 countries and, and the, the transmission of the disease, probably mainly by the, the, the how the, the principal vector that it is Egypt I behaves, probably that's the matter that matters a lot for transmission. However, uh, the weather, the rain, of course, in our area, actually, when it rains, it rains heavily. And it rains heavily means next probably for a month or two months, you don't find any dengue because it carries away all the larva out in that heavy rain. After that, there will be water which gets accumulated in small, small areas. Then this uh, it is starts growing. So at heavy rain, it comes down. After some time, it, it increases. That's what happens in our area. We have a heavy rain between June, July, August and dengue increases by end of August, September, like that. That's the usual thing it happens. And there is a lot of, uh, you know, like importance given for urbanization, uh, again, for uh, like uh, the, the sewage system, which actually helps in kind of, uh, un un like an unclean sewage system, it helps in mosquito breeding. And in fact, around 10 years ago, there are a huge outbreak in uh, our capital of India in Delhi. Later, that time it was told that dengue is disease only of the big cities. But now it's not like that. Everywhere we see dengue. So if you look at the epidemiology of dengue, half of the world population is at risk. Half the population is at risk. And that is the estimated number, because actual numbers are quite less than the estimated number. The reason is very often we don't test for dengue. Very often it is very mild disease. We don't even bother to test because there is no use in testing, because spending so much money on testing. So estimated is almost 400 million infections per year. And the second, third line is very important. Almost 80% of the disease are mild and asymptomatic. So hence, it always goes underreported. So Asia takes around 70% of the burden of dengue fever, and India is one of the big country, and it takes a lot of patient burden. There is an increase in uh, proved cases, almost an eight-fold increase in last two decades. For example, around 0.5 million in 2000 to 5.2 million in 2019. These are proved cases, not the estimated cases. And for some reason, uh, the number of dengue in 2021 has come down. We are not sure what is the reason following the COVID. Maybe the moment of the people has come down or something happened to mosquitoes, we don't know. In fact, in my area, even if you are endemic for malaria also, the last two years I have seen only one or two cases, whereas previously I used to see every day in my ward at least two, three cases of malaria, every day. 
So it's come down significantly in the last two years for some reason, maybe for the uh, movement of the people, probably. This is a, a world map showing the, the overall prevalence of dengue. The bigger the circle, it's actually the larger number. I think I've quoted somewhere here, the five countries with the maximum number of uh, uh, cases in 2021, Brazil, India, Vietnam, Philippines, and Cambodia. Uh, again, it's, there is a lot of cases are underreported, so it may not be actual number, but however, uh, these are the countries which are with the high burden. Just for example, in America, they actually together, they report almost 1.2 million cases according to the uh, uh, American Health Association there, Pan American Health Association, whereas in India, they reported positive cases are very less, 1,93,000, but it's obviously is underreported. That is not true, actually. So in India, if you just look at the zero prevalence, there are some epidemiological community-based studies done, which showed almost 56% of people who are at general population were IgM zero positive for the dengue, the IgG positive. But in a suspected sample, like if you send a sample with an acute febrile illness, the chance of getting dengue is almost 40%. So that means it's quite high. Probably we suspect also high because alternative causes would have ruled out by the time you send a dengue fever. The fatality rate is almost same as all over the world, around 2 to 4 percent, they say. And this particular study said it's 2.6 percent. This is a classical uh, dengue presentation. I will not go to the details of this. Febrile phase, critical phase, and convalescent phase. Typical severe headache, retroorbital pain is supposedly one of the very important features of a dengue fever. Myalgia, arthralgia, nausea, vomiting. And do you find many patients with this macular rash also? And the back pain also, I think I've not mentioned there, uh, what I call originally called as a break bone fever, you have a severe back pain also. It's something like any other virus, probably the more important thing will be the more common headache probably. The critical case is very important. As I told you, 80% of the people will not go for this critical phase. This is the phase actually we see patients in a tertiary care hospital. And the most important issues are hemoconcentration. That means there will be a fluid leak from the plasma to outside. For example, in children, it's very easy to identify. You have a very high hematocrit and hemoglobin. That is a very uh, important indicator of a fluid leak and, of course, thrombocytopenia. And convalescent phase, and generally, they improve. Originally, WHO has told uh, dengue was classified as a dengue fever, then dengue hemorrhagic fever, dengue shock syndrome. This is the way, actually, they originally classified. They changed it into 2009 into more kind of a clinical classification, I would say. It's not a mathematical, it's more clinical rather. So simple dengue fever, that means dengue without warning sign, dengue with warning sign. I mentioned these are the, according to WHO, these are the warning sign, abdominal pain, persistent vomiting, fluid accumulation, mucosal bleeding, lethargy, liver enlargement, and increasing hematocrit with decreasing platelets. These are the usually taken as a warning signs. Why it's important? Because if the person does not have any warning sign, we need not actually admit the patient and waste the kind of time or the, uh, or the burden on the health care. Of course, severe dengue is actually we are interested in. It says around 5% of the cases will end up in the severe dengue. This is a term coined in uh, 2012. Still not very well accepted probably all over, but still uh, WHO mentioned this. That is called expanded dengue syndrome. And most of the thing I'm going to talk is on this only. So this is basically the manifestation involving the multiple organ systems or, or the, the dengue affecting in the specific situations. That's what I told in the second line. Pregnant women, infants, elderly, patients with ischemic heart disease, and the immunocompromised who are susceptible to this. So the multiple organs can be anything, cardiac, renal, respiratory, hematologic, GIT. And another important issue is the co-infections. I, I think you must have seen, in, even we do see a lot of co-infections with dengue, maybe virus, or sometimes even other infections like leptospirosis, or even a scrub typhus, we do see very common in India. So somebody has a co-infection along with dengue, it also can be called as expanded dengue syndrome. There is a nice article published in uh, Indian Journal, actually, by Kadam. He's actually a, from Pune. Uh, he has done a lot of work on uh, dengue fever. There is a vaccine which is licensed in 2015, approved for use in almost 20 countries. We are, in India, we are not using that commonly. So basically, it's targeted for the people who are living in endemic areas. 
uh, 9 to 45 years of age and had at least one infection in the past. The reason for that is you must be knowing the dengue, the second infection or the third infection usually be more severe than the first infection. Particularly if it is by dengue 1 followed by 2, there are a lot of studies on that, 2 followed by 3 or 3 followed by 2 like that. But whatever it is, the repeat of the second infection will be generally more severe. So what is the WHO response to dengue? It supports kind of everything which confirmation of the outbreaks which is actually not, not a big issue now because it's many countries it continues to happen like an endemic. Technical support for guidance of management and it formulates the strategies and policies also. And uh, dengue prevention control is also well in mentioned that 2007 to 2030 there is some specific global vector control response. And finally, it publishes guidelines, handbooks on surveillance, management, and diagnosis as well. So we'll move on to the main topic, that is uh, unconventional or manifestation of uh, uh, dengue fever, cardiac, neurologic, pulmonary, GAT, these are the thing. And last two are also important, co-infections and special situations, something like pregnancy. These are, as I told you, these are the, my, my own cases. Uh, some of these are published, some of these are not yet published because very recent ones they are. A 46-year-old lady from a rural Karnataka comes with a fever, headache. She was found to have a low platelets. She was managed in a smaller hospital symptomatically. She developed severe dyspnea on the third or fourth day and referred to a tertiary care. When we saw her, she had a pulse rate of 40 and a bilateral crepitations, which is suggestive of a cardiac involvement. So the ECG showed sinus bradycardia with TA wave inversions. There is a severe left ventricular ejection fraction decrease. That is only 15% of left ventricular ejection fraction, saying that there is a severe left heart failure. So dengue was positive. She was put on mechanical ventilation. Heart failure medicines were used optimally. Her platelets improved, her left improved, but he has to stay in the ICU for a long time and finally we could not save her. So diagnosis here is severe dengue with myocarditis and a severe heart failure. So if you look into the cardiac manifestations, the pathophysiologically, it's actually, it can be a systemic injury or a localized cardiac injury, like myocardial necrosis inflammation, like any other infection probably. Uh, there are some reports of saying that virus and NSO antigen. NSO antigen is a specific antigen. It's actually detected in uh, dengue virus infection. It adheres to the heparin sulfate and endothelial glycocalyx layer disruption will happen. And there are some reports of high levels of NS1 uh, antigen and hyaluron related to the disease severity also. So if you look at the histology, postmortem finding there will be a necrosis of muscle fibers, inflammation and marked interstitial edema. We are not sure it's a direct viral invasion or it's a cytokine related. Clinically, the cardiac manifestation present as any cardiac symptom, chest pain, palpitation, irregular pulse is very common. In fact, bradycardia is more common. Hypotension, pulmonary edema, what our patient had pulmonary edema and bradycardia. Myocarditis is a usual have seen in only severe dengue people. There are rare manifestations like tacosubos or pericarditis. Arrhythmias are quite common. I think one of the reports says almost 34 to 75 percent of the severe dengue people had some kind of arrhythmias. Even when the patient is recovering, convalescent stay, they can have bradyarrhythmias. This is a nice review article published in Cardiovascular Journal of Africa, which actually tells about, which select some of the published articles with manifestations of dengue. I will not go to the details of that. Just to tell you that there are mainly from India, Sri Lanka and Brazil. And most of the manifestation look are, are asymptomatic bradycardias, systolic dysfunction. And this is a study which I think looked at only the severe 17 patient, but they all 17 are severe. And there are 12 had a global hypokinesia and ECG changes. And Sri Lanka also they found mainly arrhythmias, heart blocks and hypotension. Uh, this is actually only now five cases, a case series from Brazil said there is an increased incidence of thrombosis. Not very sure or what, what may be the reason here, maybe some hemoconcentration, which is not commonly seen in our patients. So if you suspect a dengue, uh, confirmed case, if there are cardiac symptoms, do an ECG. If it is abnormal, do an echocardiogram and cardiac biomarkers that we did top T and all. Then if it is unconclusive, you may have to do an MRI, which is not really required and it's abnormal, take it as a dengue cardiac involvement. This is around study of 1,008 patients in that around 42 had a cardiac manifestations and common symptoms are dyspnea, shock, fatigue and of course fever. 
almost all had elevated troponin level which are the markers of a myocarditis and the BNP that is brain natriuretic peptide that is also increased the mean value of around 4000 which is quite high and almost more than half had ECG abnormalities. So move on to the next that is case 2 a 20 year old student from rural Karnataka. Karnataka is a state where I live in which is the west coast of uh, South India. Uh, presented with fever, arthralgia of 5 days. He had a seizure followed by altered sensorium, meningeal signs of elicitable, CNS examination. Normal. Initially, he thought it's a typical meningoencephalitis or a meningitis. The uh, CBC showed neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, which is not common in a bacterial meningitis, and we found that dengue was positive here. This is the imaging which shows that the bilateral uh, thalamic hyperintensities and some amount of meningeal enhancement. So EEG showed uh, diffuse electrical dysfunction. We started with the anti-seizure medications and the supportive treatment by paracetamol IV fluid. And this patient completely improved, neurologically improved without any sequelae. So diagnosis a dengue fever with encephalitis. This is published well, last week only uh, in an in Indian journal. If you look at the neurologic manifestations, there are good publications on these. There is a recent report on current neurology and neuroscience report in 2022. It describes most of the neurological manifestations. Neuropathogenesis, both viral and host factors may contribute. And you remember always the dengue virus is a neurotropic virus. It likes yeah, yeah, neurons. So the manifestation may be related to direct invasion of the virus like encephalitis, meningitis, myositis. Autoimmune reactions are common following any virus. Like that it happens following dengue also. Like ADEM, neuritis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, myelitis, metabolic alteration, encephalopathy. So dengue encephalitis, initially there are some diagnostic criteria mentioned by SOS and Mazia, but we don't follow it correctly because they said CSF cellularity rules out an encephalitis say, but it's not common. Very often you find some increased cells also. Neuroimaging will be often non-specific and there is no specific treatment for this. If the patient had uh, convulsion, you have to give anticonvulsants, otherwise manage as any other dengue. Dengue encephalopathy is more common than encephalitis probably. It's the most common logical manifestation. It's a diffuse involvement of the brain, so they're present with alt sensorium, cognitive dysfunction, behavioral changes. Of course, it's more common in children, more common in severe dengue. And in fact, one of the study mentioned that it's a serious patient, almost 50% had a mortality. It's a quite old study, but still they said it's a very high, carries a very high mortality. This is an autoimmune disease, you must be knowing. Following a dengue fever, you get a demyelination of the spinal cord. They present with the lower limb weakness and bladder bowel involvement. Not a common man, still 2007, only around 12 reported cases. It can be para-infectious also. This is another demyelinating problem, what is called ADEM. Uh, again, it's a diffuse problem in the brain, inflammatory demyelination, multifocal white matter involvement. Here, the CSF may be usually abnormal. MRI will detect the diagnosis. The only difference here is somebody has an ADEM. It may be worth trying a steroids. Whereas any other manifestation, there is no specific treatment. This is only probably a complication of dengue. We may try steroid. Guillain-Barre syndrome must have heard. There are also not a very common manifestation. Around uh, 20 cases are reported in uh, till 2017. More common in pediatrics, more common in severe. It's immune reaction. And of course, if at all the patient has a severe dengue and GB syndrome, you have to treat it like any other GB syndrome. And treatment of choice will be plasma exchange or immunoglobulins. Of late, we don't use steroid. Previously used to steroid. Now we don't use steroids. Uh, these are very another publication which is recently published in 2022. Uh, this is only pure sense. Guillain-Barre actually is no pure motor problem, but once in a while you may have a sensory issues, and this is one of the rare manifestations, sensory predominant Guillain-Barre syndrome with the dengue infection. Uh, there are other few neurological involvement like stroke, cerebral are all been reported, not many. Uh, there are some cranial and peripheral neuropathy reports from India. Ocular also, there are ophthalmology journal. If you look, there are many publications on subconjunctal hemorrhage, maculopathy, macular edema. I won't go into the details of those things. Next, move on to pulmonary involvement. Uh, ARDS is the, probably the most serious issue here. 
adult respiratory distress syndrome or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Pleural effusion is very common, even without a serious complication, you may have a effusion because there will be plasma leakage. Pulmonary hemorrhage again a serious issue and pneumonitis also. This is another article which is uh, predominantly focused on a pulmonary involvement in patients with the dengue fever. Uh, a, a word on pleural effusion, as I told you, it's very common to have a pleural effusion in, in an uncomplicated dengue also because it's a part of a little bit of plasma leakage, but it's a common cause for the dyspnea in uh, adult patients. It's usually seen in the context of uh, plasma leakage. Sometimes it can be bloody. Rarely it is massive. In fact, I have a patient in my ward now where before coming back, I had recently had a dengue fever and he still has still has uh, effusion, which is actually hemorrhagic. ARDS is a very serious complication. They have with severe hypoxia, radiologic infiltrates, decreased lung compliance, which carries a high mortality. In fact, in India, I was also surprised initially we didn't see too many patients with ARDS in my place, whereas I went to some other place, as I told you that Pune, where Dr. Gautam was practicing, I went as an examiner, I saw many patients with ARDS due to dengue there. Now we do see many patients with this. It's one of the cause for leading cause of ARDS in India actually. We'll move on to the next case. It's a 60 year old lady, it's a homemaker. Uh, she had fever for a very one day. One, I, in fact, only one spike of fever a week ago, settled down. She came with the mild abdominal pain and the laboratory showed mild thrombocytopenia. And we looked into the cause of abdominal pain. Ultrasound showed some mildly increased pancreas, otherwise normal, but amylase lipase levels were very high. So as a cause of, as a, we made a diagnosis of pancreatitis and we managed conservatively with the IV fluids and we kept our NPO for some time, the pain settled within two days. But the amylase lipase serum level remained high for many weeks. Incidentally, we found when we looked into the cause of this, we found a high TSH level and the anti tp antibody. That means there is an autoimmune disease going on. So anti tp antibody positive and hypothyroidism. And one of our residents thought it may be an IgG4 disease which can present as a pancreatitis as well. But in the meanwhile, we got a dengue IgM positive and uh, other autoimmune markers were negative and the diagnosis of dengue fever is an acute pancreatitis, which is not a rare scene in our face, but most of them are asymptomatic, but this patient had pain for some time. But following that, actually she remained asymptomatic, but uh, remained almost four months for the enzymes to return to normal. In fact, every time I was to ask her, do you have pain? She says, I don't have any pain, no symptoms, but uh, my levels of MLS lipase are still high. It took quite a long time to settle down, and now she's doing well. Hepatobiliary complications are quite common. Hepatitis, I think uh, we have to take it as a kind of a conventional rather than unconventional because a lot of people have an elevated uh, like transaminitis, like AST, LT elevation. Liver failure, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, parotitis, all have been mentioned. Hematologically, of course, cytopenia is, again, it's not unconventional, it's a usual manifestation. There are some reports of immune thrombocytopenic purpura and rare cases of HLH, that is hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis and of course DIC. Uh, this is a publication in, again, the recent publication in 2022, a prolonged fever and pancytopenia, they worked out and found to be dengue positive and also found to be, have a features of a hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis on a bone marrow. The case number four is a 22-year-old gentleman presented with severe chest pain and pain in the bones. He is a known case of sickle cell disease. He had a history of low-grade fever a uh, day, few days ago. He didn't tell me, tell us initially. And hemoglobin was low, platelets were low. Initially, we thought it's just a sickle disease with an acute crisis. We managed accordingly. Sickling was almost 90% positive. He was hypoxic. He was put on oxygen, IV fluid, morphine, antibiotic. We did an exchange transfusion of two sessions there. Hemoglobin and platelet improved, but pain has settled, settled, and uh, later he found the cause of fever, the dengue was positive. This is to say that the co-infections are, uh, or uh, rare infections are also common, which can manifest as a, 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 a complication of an existing disease. So this is also taken as an, something like an expanded dengue syndrome. Renal, we do find cases with acute kidney injury, glomerulonephritis, proteinuria are not common, IG nephropathy rarely reported. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, there are few cases. In fact, we had one case. This is an article published in uh, our own experience in a few years ago, actually, uh, which looked into the 
the unconventional complications like elevated AST LT. To our surprise, we see the AST, normal AST was found in only one third people. Two third of the people had elevated AST level, half the people had elevated ALT level, almost 13 percent had a renal failure, and around 3 uh, percent, that is, total number is 364, around 11 had a features of ARDS. These are the serious complications which we observed here. And we looked into the mortality, the survived patient versus the person who passed away. We had around 15 out of 364 patients. 15 patients we lost, and there is a significant relationship. If you look at the AST level, renal failure, encephalopathy, multi-organ dysfunction, and ARDS, and there is a clinical significance, statistical significance in looking to the mortality. You can take them as a mortality indicators. I just briefly went through this article. This is a nice article. It says that uh, series of 10 different manifestations of a dengue fever, unusual presentation of and complication in Sri Lanka. And he listed the 10 complications, which are most of them I have told, but some of them are visually, most of them happened in uh, young people, except maybe one old here, remaining all are kind of young people. And it starts from an erratic plasma leak during critical phase itself, severe hepatitis, intracranial hemorrhage, myocarditis with heart failure, and uh, there are some uh, dysentery as a compensated shock, occult uh, leaking of plasma, undetected decompensated shock, severe septic shock, severe diarrhea also. So kind of different rare manifestations have been published in, in one case series as such. So last case I'm discussing is 25 year old bank officer. Uh, he came with the fever and body ache of five days. His pulse rate, blood pressure, everything was normal. He had a mild leukopenia, had mild thrombocytopenia. He was managed conservatively as a viral fever. Uh, but following uh, next day or third day, he developed an altered sensorium, become stuporous. He was not, not, not talking normally to us. He was shifted to ICU. He did not have any focal deficit. There are no meningeal signs. Brain imaging was normal. So it was confusing us what's happening here. His uh, dengue IgM was positive. As expected, it was a viral fever, we're thinking. But the issue here is he continued to have a high-grade fever. Generally, the fever settles down after around five to seven days in dengue fever. Somebody continues to have fever after five to seven days, we are worried. There is something else happening. So we looked into the peripheral smear, plateau to further dropping. They were not improving. There are cystocytes in smear, high LDH. All this is suggestive of what you call a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So we are a little worried. Meanwhile, we had sent a blood culture initially. It grew salmonella typhi. So we have to respect this. We have to respect this also. That means there are two infections happening at a time. Uh, he was managed with ceftriaxone. He was managed with the, we didn't do a plasma exchange, plasma paresis as such. We did a plasma transfusion for three days for an uh, maha and patient improved. And uh, in fact, a fever settled also slowly following a dose of ceftriaxone. So issue here is kind of a triple trouble. He had a dengue infection, he had a typhoid infection along with features of a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. It's a very difficult case for us to manage. Luckily, he improved and got discharged. Okay, so I'm just talking about co-infections. So these are the one we see commonly co-infections. Other mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, which is very common. Leptospirosis is very common in our area. Typhoid, I've just discussed with you one of the cases. And typhus fever is also quite common in our area. This is one special situation, pregnancy and dengue. I will not go to the other special situations. Uh, few points here. One is the vertical transmission is possible. When the person is having dengue, kind of in a late part of the pregnancy, it can be transmitted to child. There is a definite increase uh, preterm birth and low birth weight. In fact, the double the risk in severe dengue, almost 15% increase risk in the mild dengue. And this is also very important. Person is having a recently, in fact, we had a patient with the almost near term came with the fever, thrombocytopenia. The platelet went down to almost 10,000. She was almost about to kind of deliver. So we managed her with plant transfusions and she improved. So during, if at all the uh, critical phase happens during delivery, it carries a multiple challenges. So this is another publication on the pregnancy and uh, dengue. And uh, there are some reports, same, same publication says around five people had, I think had a total number of 57 in that uh, nine had a severe dengue, five patients had abortions, and uh, 
10 had some oligohydramnias, one had abruption, one has a postpartum hemorrhage. There are two maternal deaths, this is very important. There are three people died, this is a very important issue. As far as fetal outcome is concerned, almost around 12 or 14 patients had issues and two had an IUGR also, IUD also. So, summarizing, ladies and gentlemen, I have, as expected, unconventional manifestations are less common, but they are there. They are there to, we have to face them. So, any organ system can be affected. I have just mentioned some of the important things like pulmonary, cardiac and, uh, and uh, pancreas as such. Uh, it can be due to either viral invasion or immunologically mediated. These are more common in pediatric age group as well as in adult with severe dengue. So, mild dengue probably probably hopefully it doesn't happen to most of the people. So supported treatment of this manifestation, there is no specific treatment except maybe some rare case I told that ADEM might need steroid like that. Otherwise, manifestation should be recognized and diagnosed and treat accordingly like heart failure or encephalopathy or whatever it is. But this is the most important point I think take home message I would say. The co-infections like malaria, leptospirosis, typhus are not uncommon. So don't just label every fever as dengue, maybe fever with thrombocytopenia as dengue. It's worth testing some of the common infection in your place and because all the three have a specific treatment, whereas dengue does not have a specific treatment. So it needs to be suspected, diagnosed and treated with the specific medications. Thank you patient, thank you for our patient hearing. Thank you Professor Vasudeva for that wonderful presentation. Um, just to remind the rest of the speakers, we are doing the presentation plus the questions in 30 minutes. So let's try to stick to that. We're taking two questions from the audience here and two from the online audience. As we remember, it's a hybrid conference that we are doing, okay? So with your permission, I will take two questions from the audience here first and then we can go for the online. If you have a question, just wave and then we will get a mic to you. Okay. Um, the other one? Okay. Yes. Uh, Dr. Vasudeva, it was really very wonderful presentation and I really enjoyed every part of it. Uh, in one slide you mentioned the co-infection with malaria as well. Dengue yes. patient. Yes. Uh, is it there? Is it there? We have yeah. been seeing malaria also. Yes. Recently, I have not seen, as I told you, malaria has come down after COVID. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I have seen malaria with the dengue also uh, because I mosquitoes are different. Yes, yes. You know, the That's mosquitoes right, yeah. are different. That's Their breeding right. patterns are different. Yes, exactly. Some people buy a day and night, but yeah. we find all these mosquitoes in our place. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But for some reason, it's come down. Malaria significantly come down following a COVID, but dengue has not come down. Dengue is still there in our place. Thank you, Professor, for that presentation. Um, I am Dr. Kitabo Jami from the Gambia. Yeah. Um, uh, for our part of the world, dengue is not very commonly seen. Uh, we have mosquitoes a lot, but malaria is the commonest condition we see. Um, you mentioned in the last two decades, there has been an eightfold increase in the number of dengue cases. Um, in one slide, I saw vaccines being introduced in 2015. Uh, what could be an explanation for this increase? Increase, you mean to say? Yes. Uh, those are the factors which are contributed, but which I have told in one of the slides, say that one is the urbanization, which I don't believe as I told. The other thing is the people movement, movement from uh, from place to place has increased. And the uh, vaccine has been introduced, but how effective that we don't know. And most of the countries which are having high burden, still they are not using it because the efficacy, each it has against only the one serotype, we have to give for other serotypes. There are some newer vaccines coming up, but still, I think it's not become very popular yet. Um, can some, who is monitoring the online? Okay, the online is not, so we will just take the other two here until the technical support comes in. You can give. <coughs> uh, thank you so much uh, yeah. for the brilliant presentation. I'm Dr. Desmond from Sierra Leone. And over some years back, I followed up on an outbreak of dengue in Central America, where we did an outbreak investigation. 
and we saw dengue one, dengue two, and even we saw cases of the hemorrhagic dengue. Uh, back back in, in Africa, as my colleague was saying, we have cases of malaria and also yellow fever, which is also caused by yes. the same virus. Not so. And but we are not following up on dengue. And we know the atmosphere or the conditions within the continent might or might not favor dengue. So I really want to know over the past years, uh, maybe you have done a lot of research or interacted with several other colleagues, what might be the cause that in Africa actually we are not seeing cases of dengue. I have worked, I think, for some few years, but we have, I have never seen a case of dengue in okay. Sierra Leone. Okay. So mm. what might be the actual picture mm. that either are we not focusing, but also I don't think so. Why mm. is it that we are not getting cases of <laughs> dengue with all um, the... I also don't have an answer. May some, like maybe geographical patterns have not changed, of course, in Africa. So I'm not sure why, why it's less common. But in our country, as I told you, 10 years ago, it was a disease of urban. So Delhi had reported so many cases, it came in all newspapers. But now if you go to my village, my, I'm in a very interior village I stay, so you find dengue there. The first case we presented is very close to my village, the person who succumbed. So it's there everywhere now. I'm not sure what exactly happened. Or post-COVID, of course, there is a decrease in the, some of the infections, but I'm not very sure exactly why Africa is not reporting this. And it's good, actually, good that you're not finding too many dengues. You already have other malaria, other things going on there. Thank you very much for the presentation, Prof. Um, I'm Dr. Sanguinia from Zimbabwe. Um, I noticed that in your presentation you mentioned that um, there has been in the past uh, two years, 2020, 2021, uh, some form of decrease in terms of, the, um, in terms of dengue. I just wanted to find out, is this an absolute decrease in terms of the cases that are notified, or this is a decrease in the overall incidence? And secondly, what factors would you attribute to the decrease? Um, is there a relationship between COVID? Uh, is there a relationship yes. with uh, movement restrictions and also on? And do we have any particular studies that we have done um, that might actually confirm or sort of like, um, sort of like imply that we have had okay. um, a decrease due to such yeah. such factors? Thank yeah. you. That's a good question. Uh, what, what knowledge we have is definitely there is a, these are all the WHO reports I'm quoting. Most of the numbers are actually from the WHO reports. There is a definite decrease in the incidence. But the, the, the people at, at risk are still same. As I told you that 400 million are at risk at the same time. Uh, the two reasons I personally feel for the decrease is one is the movement. Movement of the people is mainly restricted and probably the spread of disease has come down from maybe one village to other village also one person carries a, a virus the EDC is always there it is always there is a virus virus entering to next village or next town is actually the matters That's the first thing and second thing i personally feel maybe we are not testing too many because of covid people are scared to test other tests we do only the, we, i think everyone agree with me that so many people were lost because of non covid diseases during covid pandemic that's a very big issue. Actually, I have actually personally I got, had affected very badly during those days. So a lot of non-COVID patients died. And uh, we are probably are not testing too many cases for dengue during that time. Testing only COVID and everybody positive, put them in some isolation. Dengue, they survive, survive, die, died, and label them as COVID death. And you get a compensation. That's what happened in, in our country also. I think these are the two reasons comes to my mind for the decrease in the incidence. Hoping that it will not increase, but I'm not very sure. 2022, I have to see what happens. In my, if you ask me in my place, it is the numbers are good enough now. Probably it, it will increase. It will increase. Thank you very much, Professor. A round of applause, please. So, road, uh, as you said, uh, we will be taking a talk about road traffic accident and spinal injuries uh, in, in Kenya. Yeah, so I'm, I'm coming from Kenya, and that is the location that uh, we are uh, in reference to the map of Africa. Okay, next. Yeah, so we're talking about road traffic uh, accident and spinal injury. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, with the improvement of roads in the developing countries, uh, more and more road traffic accidents occur. Next slide. Yeah, so with increasing urbanization and uh, motorized transportation, road traffic uh, accidents have increased significantly. Uh, fatalities emanating from uh, these accidents have increased to, uh, to 1.3 uh, million per, per year worldwide. Uh, more than 93% of these accidents uh, occur in low <coughs> income and middle income countries. And uh, the most affected age group is uh, between 5 and 29 years, which is the most productive uh, age group that uh, we need for development. And uh, the vulnerable road users, uh, which include pedestrian, cyclist, and motorcycle riders, are the most affected, accounting for 46% of the deaths that occurred due to road traffic accidents. We, uh, WHO also reports that there is a major imbalance on the number of registered vehicles per 1,000 people and that uh, the rate of death per 100,000 persons in African region compared to the, to the rest of the world. Uh, next slide. Uh, this road traffic accident uh, uh, has huge financial implications uh, uh, to the economy of uh, low and middle income countries, accounting for between uh, 1.3 to 3.0 of the gross domestic product <coughs> of these countries. Uh, this calls for concerted efforts to combat the menace of road traffic accident that will include public uh, sensitization, policy formulation and enforcement, and uh, redesign of the, of the roads to be able to reduce on the accidents. Next. Uh, so uh, the term spinal cord injury uh, refers to the damage to the spinal cord due to trauma. However, there are other causes which may be due to other diseases. This talk will focus mainly on the, on the trauma part of it. Uh, there is no reliable estimate of the global prevalence but uh, estimated annual uh, global incidence is uh, 40 to 80 cases per a million population. And uh, up to 90% of these cases are due to accident, traumatic causes, uh, while the rest is due to other non-traumatic cases. Next. Trauma is responsible uh, for about uh, 15 to 41 cases of spinal cord injury per a million inhabitants annually worldwide. Uh, population most affected uh, is, a young, is uh, the young between uh, uh, the age of 15 and 35, and uh, males are more affected with a ratio of four, four to one. Next, you went back. Uh, a spinal cord uh, injury may generate uh, physical disability and economic dis dependency, which is worse in the low and middle level uh, and middle developing countries. The cost of dealing with the traumatic spinal cord injury is estimated to be about $100 billion annually by WHO. And therefore, prevention is the key because it is quite expensive to deal with. Next. So, road traffic accident is a leading cause of spinal injuries worldwide accounting for more than 50%. Other causes that we see is falls from heights, mainly cons construction sites, assaults, or gunshots. In the low and the middle income countries, road traffic accidents account for up to 75% of the traumatic spinal cord injuries. Uh, uh, Pre-hospital care, hospital, and uh, special spine units are not well developed in these countries and therefore the morbidity and the mortality is very high, uh, leading to devastation of the affected patients. The end result of this is a loss of many productive members of the society due to road traffic accident and resultant spinal cord injury. Next. Uh, a spinal cord uh, injury is associated with the risk 
also of developing secondary uh, conditions, uh, which are equally life threatening, including uh, DVT, urinary tract infections, muscle spasms, osteoporosis, pressure sores, chronic pain, and respiratory complications, which if we don't deal with, will definitely lead to death. Uh, acute care, rehabilitation services, and ongoing health maintenance is uh, essential for prevention and for management of these conditions. Next. Uh, spinal cord injury may render the patient uh, totally dependent on caregivers, especially if they are quadriplegic, and uh, they'll require assistive technology uh, in many uh, situations for purposes of communication, uh, self-care, and for domestic uh, activities. An estimated uh, 20 to 30 percent of people with spinal cord injuries show significant, uh, clinically significant signs of depression, which in turn has a negative impact on improvement in the functioning and the overall health of, of the patient. Uh, societal misconception, negative attitudes, and the physical barriers also affect the management of this patient and uh, lead to exclusion of spinal cord injury, uh, of the spinal cord injured patient from participating in, in the society. Uh, the, the children with spinal cord injury are also less likely to start school, and if they go to school, they are likely to drop out and not finish their, their school, uh, leading to them being uh, economically uh, disfranchised. Next. So uh, back home uh, examples in Kenya, with the increasing Kenyan population, currently at about 50 million people, uh, road traffic accidents have increased sig significantly uh, and over 3,000 uh, people are killed on Kenyan roads annually. Uh, this is a four-fold increase in, uh, in the rate in the last 30 years. Uh, more than 75% of road traffic casualties are economic economically productive members of uh, the country and therefore we are losing uh, uh, the needed uh, part of the population. The most affected are pedestrians and passengers uh, using public service vehicles. Next. Uh, uh, this is an example of a, a, a public uh, transport vehicle in uh, Kenya, and most of them don't have the safety features like seat belts, they're always uh, over speeding, and therefore, uh, the many number of accidents that we end up with and uh, spinal cord injury. Next. That's the second mode of transport and uh, uh, type of vehicle which may also be used uh, for ferrying the patient from the scene of accident to, to the hospital. Next. So uh, uh, how is the care for the spinal cord injured, uh, I injured patients? Patient care is very demanding, and uh, it includes the acute phase of uh, taking care of the patient and also the rehabilitation phase. Uh, it requires highly specialized uh, healthcare personnel, specialized equipment, a prolonged hospital stay, and uh, patients who present late to the spine unit may be coming in with complications already and they are prone to high mortality rates. Uh, a spinal injured patient at the end of the treatment will also need to be resettled back to the community and be empowered to undertake new economic activities. Next. So in Kenya, like uh, most developing countries, less than 10% of patients with spinal cord injury get admitted to the specialized unit. Most of them are managed in the general hospitals. Uh, this is due to lack of, of capacity. The, currently, the hospital we have is only 35 bed, uh, but there is a 200 bed in, in, in the construction phase. The average uh, hospital stay for this patient range from two to uh, six months, uh, with the quadriplegics staying longer than the, the paraplegics. And uh, uh, investment in uh, hospital equipment and training of personnel 
has been initiated to try and improve onto, onto the care. We still send a number of patients abroad, mainly to India, and that leads to loss of foreign exchange. Uh, next. The, the challenges in uh, management of spinal cord injuries include uh, limited uh, specialized personnel, inadequate equipment, expensive uh, material to fix the patients, prolonged hospital stay, and limited uh, rehabilitation centers. So this is one of the units, uh, the spinal, National Spinal Injury Hospital. Uh, next. Uh, it is uh, the only facility for the population of 49 million, as I've said before, with the 35 bed capacity. The 200 bed hospital is yet to be, uh, to be started. Uh, it serves also uh, to take care of patients from the neighboring uh, uh, countries. And uh, just back. Next. So these are some of the cases that uh, we, we could share. The first case there is a C4, C5 injury of a patient who was in an accident, uh, did not have a seat belt, was unrestrained, and eventually ended up with a cervical spine uh, injury, as we see on the CT scan and on the opposite side as we see on the MRI scan. So you need a CT, you need an MRI in a good facility to be able to make your diagnosis and manage your patient. Next is uh, a case of the thoracic spine bust fracture at around T, T9. Again, this was a pedestrian who was hit uh, with a car, a case of accident, and on the opposite side, it shows the fixation which was given to the patient. Uh, next is uh, a case of fixation on uh, thoracolumbar region, and on the opposite side is a fixation of the cervical spine. Uh, uh, the fixation devices are pretty expensive, so there is normally delay before these patients are fixed if they don't have an insurance cover. Next, next. Yeah, these are some of the of the images of uh, the cases fresh after an accident occurs. You can see a compression fracture on the vertebra on a plain X-ray, and you could see a similar thing on the on the MRI scan. Next. Uh, that is just a post-operative x-ray after a patient is stabilized. So the ones who came earlier came in with loss of power and after fixation they regained their power and were able to, uh, able to walk home. We know that uh, if the patient comes in early, then you will be able to at least salvage and save. But if they come late, then the neurology may be fully damaged. Next. Uh, those are other images, a CT scan in uh, 3D showing a complete uh, spine injury following a, a pedestrian who was hit and uh, fell. So the spinal cord is completely in two parts. So such patients require fixation and uh, rehabilitation. Next. Uh, that's a bus fracture at T9, also com complete injury, another pedestrian case. Next. So these are just some of the images of the hospital. You need uh, a well-equipped operating room with a number of gadgets to be able to f fix the patient, including fluoroscopy, advanced imaging, good lighting, and uh, equipment. Next. At the spine hospital, we also need a well-equipped uh, uh, rehabilitation unit in form of physiotherapy to be able to rehabilitate your patients well. The next. After uh, treatment of the patient, there is a therapy to be done and then follow up uh, to be done too. And what are the implications? Then the treatment does not end with the discharge of the patient. The patients have to be resettled back to the community where you give health education to the uh, relatives and the community members to continue with the care and also to stress the fact that they need to come back to the hospital for follow up. Uh, this is one of the scenarios of a home visit, so we send our team to go back to the village to see how the patients are doing and uh, ensure that they don't develop complications 
and are able to continue with their life in the, in the communities. And uh, for the patients who come back to the hospital, this is just a follow-up clinic to see how they're doing. So in summary, uh, the way forward, the key thing f with the road traffic accident and spinal cord injury is prevention. So we need to advocate for control of speed, uh, road redesign, educating uh, members of the public uh, to drive properly, uh, prompt comprehensive treatment of spinal cord patients, advocate for health insurance, national health schemes, and provide social support for persons with a spinal cord injury. Uh, timely, appropriate, and pre-hospital uh, management, quick recognition of suspected spinal cord injury uh, will be able to help the patient. In the acute phase, even if you are in a small unit, uh, suspected spine, spinal cord injury need to be splinted and urgently referred to an appropriate center where the care can be given. Then those with a spinal cord injury once identified needs to be either surgically fixed or given appropriate uh, rehabilitation and eventually uh, resettled back to the community. The key thing to stress is that prevention of road traffic accident will prevent spinal cord injuries and improve uh, uh, quality of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Soren. And we apologize tremendously for all the technical difficulties we have during your presentation. I know it makes it a bit difficult. Um, we're going to take two questions again. Uh, this time, we actually have a little bit more time, so we can take more than two. As we can see, road traffic accidents are something very, very important, and it affects the most valuable in our communities because we see the age data from 15 to 46 years of age. And it's part of WHO's uh, health goals that 2020 it should be reduced. Instead, it's on the increase. So it's something to take note. That's a very wonderful presentation. Um, okay, so just put your hands and then we will get a mic to you. Okay, uh, Dr. Vino will help me with that. Um, good morning, um, Dr. Thaki for that beautiful presentation. I am Dr. Cole from Sierra Leone. And um, I think it's the same story in Sierra Leone we have increase in road traffic accident. So my, my question to you, I know you're a clinician, but what do you do non-clinically to engage the um, authorities in preventing these road traffic accidents? Um, how do you contribute to the policies like um, ensuring um, putting on of seat belts and things like that? What do you do as a clinician to advise the authorities that, hey, this is getting up, we need to put it down not just when they come to the hospital. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, what we do non-clinically is the public health component of it, uh, advocacy. So we work with different groups on uh, road safety, as road safety ambassadors, by uh, working uh, right from the schools, uh, uh, initiated programs like uh, uh, how to cross the road, at what point do you cross the road. We have footbridges, but you find that people don't want to use footbridges. Instead, they run across the road. So we work with authorities to ensure that enforcement is made, that people use those footbridges. Uh, we also have uh, well, uh, a day dedicated just to uh, either do a march or a procession to teach people about that, ab about road safety. We have things like uh, working with the people in the industry, in the, tra in, the, in the transport industry. We get drivers of these public service vehicles come to our unit to be able to see for themselves the damage they caused and see their colleagues who are driving recklessly, who can no longer walk. And that sends the message into their groups that uh, peer pressure is not the best thing on the road. Use of seat belt is for your own safety. You don't just put it on because the policeman uh, is next door. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for the awesome presentation. So my question is, I'm um, Dr. Horata from Botswana. My question in terms of your facility in the spinal 
Spanner of Rural Hospital, how far are you in terms of using technology, in terms of using those spine robots, technology, or artificial intelligence? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Uh, in terms of training, uh, I've worked with robotics in doing spine surgery, but not in Kenya. Uh, the closest we have with robotics is a rehabilitation component of it. We're in the process of acquiring a few in the rehabilitation part of it. Uh, we call them exoskeletons, uh, such that if you are paralyzed from waist down, that you are paraplegic, we could be able to put you into an exoskeleton and then that helps you with movement and uh, rehabilitation. So it's basically an assistive device to assist our physiotherapist to rehabilitate you better. But I know that uh, in spine surgery, robotic surgery is already well developed in the, in the West, but in Africa and specifically in Kenya, we still don't have it. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Tieno. Yes. I'm uh, Dr. Sam Rutare from Rwanda. Uh, I've been in Kenya for some time. That's where I did my residence in Nairobi, pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to make a few comments as far as Rwanda has uh, progressed to address this issue of uh, over speeding so that it prevents roadside accidents. Uh, previously, we were recording uh, many cases, including spine cord injuries. Uh, uh, and at our hospital where I work, Kigari University Teaching Hospital, which is the main public hospital in Kigari, cases were rising. And what the government of Rwanda did was to put roadside cameras so that for those people who are speeding, uh, they, they are given a, a fine. So in Kigari, basically, when you exceed a speed of 60 kilometers per hour, those cameras will give you a fine. They will photo your, uh, the print number of your, uh, the, the car you are driving, and the owner of the car will automatically see a, an SMS message who indicating him that he's paying a fine of uh, so and so. And if you are speeding over 80% in the city, that is over speeding, then you pay extra amount of money. Besides that, uh, when you are caught driving when you, you've taken alcohol, the policemen are always on the roadside and uh, you automatically pay a fine. And plus uh, imprisonment of five days. This is serious. I think the ones who are reading uh, BBC News yesterday you saw how an MP resigned because of taking alcohol while uh, drunkard. I think, I think you saw that, BBC News yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you, uh, far back in 2013 when I was in Nairobi, I didn't see those cameras by then. I don't know where, whether they are now there on the roadside. And uh, uh, with overspeeding in Nairobi, as far as I remember, there were no uh, those policemen to test alcohol. So I think those are possible mechanisms that can be, can be put in place to prevent overspeeding that is a major factor in the road traffic accidents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those comments. Um, uh, all, all those facts are real. We have alcohol blows on the, on the, on the street uh, with the policemen using them. We have cameras as well. Uh, the problem has been the implementation part of it and the corruption part of it. So in terms of technology, all that you are talking about is available. So it's the issue of the mindset and whom to implement and how to punish those who circumvent that system. Uh, recently, they've talked of trying to reactivate that because the, the hardware is already there. It's the issue of who to implement and uh, the citizens how to adhere to those rules. But I totally agree with your comments. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Stern. For Today's topic is timing and utilization of systemic steroids in prevention of laryngeal edema during extubation of mechanically ventilated patients. 
Before going into the role of steroids, I wish to explain how laryngeal edema is happening in these patients. So this is a picture of video laryngoscopy, which is showing the swelling of vocal cords, leading to the narrowing of airway lumen, which can lead to further respiratory compromise. And these type of patients, they land up with reintubation. So laryngeal edema, it basically happens from the direct mechanical trauma by endotracheal tube at the surfaces of contact and laryngeal mucosa. Mucosal damage of larynx caused by pressure and ischemia, which leads to inflammatory response. And depending on the factors and varying factors causing the uh, injury, to the, uh, which leads to edema, ulceration, and vocal cord immobility which results in luminal narrowing, which leads to airway obstruction, and, uh, or airway obstruction after obst extubation. And these are the patients who causes acute respiratory compromise and leads to emergency reintubation. So post-extubation laryngeal edema is the most frequent cause, which leads to 15% of all reintubations in our patients. This is another picture which is showing when the endotracheal tube is in situ, it causing and the cuff uh, is inflated and causing the pressure injury to the surrounding structures leading to edema. It can lead to necrosis, granulation. It depends on how long the patient is intubated in ICU to further stenosis and vocal cord immobility. So the patients who, who are with post-extubation laryngeal edema, they present with strido, which is the clinically marker, which is the clinical marker of post-extubation laryngeal edema. And approximately 50% of these patients who are presenting with post-extubation strido, they end up with reintubation. So uh, reintubation, it is uh, reintubation associated with increased uh, in ICU on ventilator and it causes higher cost, morbidity, and mortality in our patients. So careful prevention and proper management of these patients is required to prevent reintubation in ICU. So there was a systematic analysis study was done by Brodsky and colleagues in 2017, which showed prevalence of laryngeal injury grade in relation to average intubation duration. So they were nine, they, he took nine studies from five different countries and approximately of 775 patients. He focused on the laryngeal injury from oral endotracheal intubation in mechanically ventilated ICU patients. So in 22% studies, they did direct visualization by laryngoscope. And in 89% studies, they did indirect visualization by laryngeal mirror, rigid endoscopes, flexible nasoendoscopy, and flexible bronchoscopy. After extubation, the assessment was done, and it was completed within six hours, within 24 hours, 72 hours, and two weeks post-extubation. And what the results they got, that there was high prevalence of minor injury, and there was lower prevalence of more severe injury. There was increased prevalence and increased severity of injury, which was observed in the patients who stayed for a longer time on the, on the ventilator, say five to 10 days, compared to those patients who were intubated only for five days, or below five days. So the, there were three types of injury, grade one, grade two, grade three. Grade one injuries were mild injuries, self-limiting, presenting with uh, erythema, with the prevalence of 82%, followed by edema, prevalence 70%. The grade two injuries were moderate. Most frequent was ulcerations with 31% prevalence, prevalence, and granulomas with 27%. The grade three injuries were severe, causing vocal cord immobility and glottic stenosis with the prevalence of 21% for vocal fold immobility and glottic stenosis 6%. So this is a table which is showing the patient who stayed for more than 10 days in ICU on ventilator. They were having severe type of injuries, uh, moderate to severe type of injuries, and the patients who stayed for below five days they were having mild self-limiting type of injuries. So what we learned so far is that prolonged in endotracheal intubation, it causes inflammation, swelling, ulcerations, 
uh, to the damage, uh, damage to the oropharynx, larynx, and trachea. And uh, when the patient stayed for more than four days, it leads to laryngeal edema, mucosal ulcerations, and this causes further laryngeal luminal narrowing, which results in increased airflow velocity, which manifests as strido, and it is a sign of airway obstruction. So the, uh, the patients who present with strido, there is respiratory distress, which develop in these patients who have more than 50% of narrowing of tracheal lumen. So these are some risk factors for post-intubation laryngeal edema. These are intubation, post-intubation, and patient factors. Intubation factors, when uh, there is history of difficult intubation, there's large tube size, and post-intubation factors, when the high cuff pressures, prolonged endotracheal intubation, the patient is agitated while intubated, self-extubation, and then re-intubation. There are some patient factors. Something further. Next. The patient factors are basically the type of surgeries which are performed on the, on the patient, and then patient has put on ventilator like head and neck surgeries, prone positioning during neurosurgical procedures, female gender pregnancy, fluid resuscitation, neck airway injuries, increased BMI, all these are the factors. There were studies published who were showing the, how the risk factors are uh, causing post-extubation laryngeal edema. There was a study done by Darman and colleagues in 1992, which was published in the Journal of Anesthesiology. He did this study on 700 ICU patients. It showed that the risk factors for, for post-extubation laryngeal edema were a duration of venti on ventilator for more than six, 36 hours and female gender. And there was another study who was done by Francois and colleagues, which was published in Lancet in 2007. He did this surgery on 761 ICU patients, and uh, he found that the traumatic intubation, female gender, large tube size, absence of pretreatment with methylprednisolone are the risk factors for the development of post-extubation laryngeal edema. So what is the message? Post-intubation laryngeal edema might be a more appropriate term rather than saying post-extubation laryngeal edema because the pathological process starts soon after the intubation, though it becomes clinically evident only after removal of endotracheal tube. And why prompt recognition and management of post-intubation laryngeal edema is extremely important before extubating the patient because significant contributor to the development of post-extubation strido and these patients, 50% uh, of these patients, they get re-intubated, which increases the morbidity and mortality of the patients. So how to recognize this pathology? There are several tests which have been proposed for the evaluation of airway patency before extubation. The, one of the gold uh, tests is cuff leak test, laryngeal endo, uh, ultrasonography, and video laryngoscopy. Cuff leak test is basically uh, divided into two qualitative assessment and quantitative assessment. Qualitative assessment when, is very simple. We deflate the cuff and auscultate the tracheal area, and we uh, hear the audible leak. If it is present, it means the test is positive. Uh, and if it is not present, then the uh, test is negative. And the other test is quantitative test. In this test, we uh, generally do the suction of the endotracheal and oral secretions. We put the ventilator on volume control mode, and uh, we deflate the cuff, and we measure the cuff leak volume. If the cuff leak volume is below 110, the test is considered as failure negative, and if it is more than 110 ml, the test is considered positive. So this is a picture where it is showing that endotracheal tube is in situ. Here you can see there is, uh, there is leak when we have deflated the cuff, which is more than about 12 to 15 percent. And here it is considered as positive test. And here in this case, when we have deflated the cuff, the, there is no leak. His leak is zero. So the edema is there. Uh, that's why this test is considered as negative. And uh, these are the patients. We have to be careful. We have to start their treatment early so that we don't have to re-intubate these patients. Next. 
The other test is laryngeal ultrasonography, which is a very simple, rapid, non-invasive evaluation, which can be done bedside. And uh, of course, the patients with the risk of post-extubation strider, these are our patients when we do laryngeal ultrasonography. So it basically it measures the air, air column width, the width of acoustic shadow at the level of cords before and after cuff deflation in the intubated patients. This is the width decreased in the patients who presented with post-extubation laryngeal edema. Back. No, no, no. Next. Yes, this is a picture post, uh, this is a picture of video laryngoscopy. Video laryngoscopy or uh, fiber optic endoscopy evaluation, which is very promising because you can see the perilaryngeal structures and you can visualize the abnormalities. It can identify and differentiate between the structural versus functional laryngeal abnormalities, for example, between laryngeal edema and laryngospasm, thus guiding the appropriate management for our patients. Next. This is a flowchart which is showing that all the intubated patients who are at risk of developing post-extubation laryngeal edema should undergo cuff leak test. If uh, cuff leak volume is more than 110 ml, patients are safe, we can extubate them under close observation, of course, because there can be uh, other factors also which can cause post-extubation strider. And the patients who are cuff leak volume is below 110 ml, and there are other risk factors who are present at the time of intubation or post-intubation, female gender, long duration of intubation, large endotracheal tube size, high cuff pressure. These patients, we have to administer steroids. And we administer methylprednisolone 20 milligram four hourly, starting at least uh, minimum four hours before extubation. So uh, the other thing which we can consider is placement of airway exchange catheter. If we are, uh, we are thinking that we have to maybe reintubate this patient and then we can extubate these patients on close observation. If no symptoms occur in one hour, then we remove airway exchange catheter and consider discharge. And in case when there is post-extubation strider, there is other treatment which we can give before reintubating our patient. If that strider is very severe, in that case, we have to reintubate. There is no other thing we can think of. But in case it is, we can still give a chance, then we give methylprednisolone stat dose 20 to 40 milligram, followed by nebulization with budesonide and epinephrine. And then if patient improve in one hour, we reintubate our patients and continue steroid treatment if it is necessary. The common differentials which can mimic like post-extubation laryngeal edema are laryngospasm, angioedema due to anaphylaxis, foreign body in the airway, post-surgical hematomas, vocal cord palsies, and sleep apneas. The medical treatment for this is systemic steroids, epinephrine nebulization, helium administration. The role of non-invasive ventilation is a very big question mark here because many of the chest physicians and anesthetists, they, so they think that there is respiratory compromise post-extubation, so we just put a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation to these patients and the patient will improve. Yes, patient can improve for some small period of time, but the process of edema which has already started there, it worsens and can cause mortality in these patients. So I have put it here because there is always a controversy regarding the use of non-invasive ventilation. The, the last ultimate step when nothing is working is emergency tracheostomy. So the role of systemic steroids. The, the corticosteroids downregulate the inflammatory response by inhibiting the action of inflammatory cells. They decrease in the capillary vessel dilatation and permeability, and this reduces edema. In the most re recent literature, suggested that the multiple doses of corticosteroids administered four to 48 hours before extubation are effective in decreasing the rate of post-extubation strider and need of reintubation. There was a study done by Francois and colleagues in 2007. He used, they used 20 milligram of methylprednisolone every four hourly till extubation. The therapy was started 12 hours before the planned extubations and the total of four doses were given. The last dose was given just before extubation. 
and they concluded that the significant decrease in post-extubation obstruction as well as reintubation rate in the steroid group. There was another study done by Lin and colleagues in 2016. He showed that the administration of multiple doses is effective in reducing post-extubation airway obstruction than the use of single dose. Then comes another therapy is epinephrine nebulization, which is also another post very uh, potentially effective therapy. And the mechanism of action is epinephrine. It acts through the local stimulation of alpha adrenergic receptors on vascular smooth muscles. It causes vasoconstriction and decreased blood flow, which diminishes edema. So a dose of uh, 0 0.5 to 1 milligram racemic epinephrine in 5 ml normal line it proved successful in cases of upper airway obstruction in adults. So one thing is there, it can cause rebound edema. So you have to be careful while we are treating our patients with epinephrine nebulization. This I have already said that non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, uh, its evidence is lacking in treating post-extubation laryngeal edema. There was a study was done by Esban and colleagues in 2004. He found there is increased mortality in non-invasive positive pressure ventilation group, which could, in, which, which could be explained by increased time from the onset of respiratory failure to reintubation. So what happened, we put the patient uh, on an IV and then edema keep on progressing and it causes further obstruction of airways and it makes our reintubation more difficult and patients they end up with sometimes mortality, sometimes with emergency tracheostomy. Next slide. Helium oxygen mixture is another important step which can be taken in these patients. So a lower density of oxygen enriched air is given. Uh, with 40% of helium in it, with the profound hypoxemia, and uh, it basically reduces the airflow resistance most effectively while not compromising the oxygenation. And the ultimate step is emergency tracheostomy when everything fails. So according to the clinical practice guidelines which were published in 2017 uh, uh, regarding the management of post-extubation strider were that uh, guidelines suggest that the cuff leak test should be performed on mechanically ventilated patients who meet extubation criteria and are at high risk of post-extubation strider. Systemic steroids should be administered to patients who fail cuff leak tests, and the failed cuff leak test is defined as cuff leak volume below 110 ml, and consider cuff leak test eligibility for high-risk patients. And what are these high-risk patients are? Uh, traumatic intubation, female sex, prolonged endotracheal intubation more than six days, trauma to upper airway anatomy, uh, reintubated after unexpected extubation, and when the large endotracheal tube for more than eight millimeter size. So the prophylaxis for post-extubation strider is that we have to give methylprednisolone 20 milligram IV four hourly for four doses, for four doses, and the last dose should be administered immediately before extubation, and we have to notify respiratory physician in case of respiratory failure. And uh, next treatment, when the patients they develop strider, we have to give a stat dose of methylprednisolone followed by nebulization with racemic epinephrine. We have to monitor for rebound edema, can give cool aerosols, and if strider persists for more than 60 minutes, we have to consider for reintubation. And once more, NIV is not recommended owing to the evidence of increased mortality versus standard of care as a result of delayed intubation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awato, for that insightful presentation. We are going to take only one question from the audience here, but we already have another one from the online platform, which uh, we will read to you from Dr. So this is a question from Obedai Vumi Malenge Nkoba. And he says, thanks for the good presentation. You said that the pathologic process starts as soon as, as soon after intubation. Yes. Is it related to the technique or the caliber we use? Are there ways to prevent that? Most for patients with long stay in the ICU service. Thanks. Uh, 
That's exactly what I said in my presentation. There are a lot of factors which depends on it. So it's not only the technique, it can be the patient factors, it can be the intubation factors, it can be the long stay in ICU on ventilator. So all these factors, a total role is there which is causing post-extubation laryngeal edema. It is not only one factor, there are many, several factors are there. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, my concern is uh... Yes, I'm Dr. Hubala from Sierra Leone. Um, just one of my most uh, concerning uh, complications here is that of a tracheal stenosis. Yes. And I would just like to know what is the management protocol for uh, tracheal stenosis if it develops. Uh, I mean, I was thinking maybe you'll do a tracheostomy but probably that would be uh, temporary. Is there any measurements or ways done for, to handle uh, or treat uh, tracheal stenosis? Maybe well, like dilatation, surgical? Yes. I would just like to know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, uh, tracheal, before we have to do the prevention to go patient into tracheal stenosis, and this can be done when the patients are intubated before 15 days. Suppose the patient is going to stay for more than 10 days on ventilator, uh, mechanically on in, with the endotracheal tube, we should consider for tracheostomy before itself. We should not wait till then when the tracheal stenosis will happen and then we will do something. So what we can do, we can do the tracheostomy. We start, uh, in, uh, we start our ventilation with the tracheostomy tube in the trachea directly for some time, to buy time. And then w once the patient is good out of ventilator, then we can remove this tracheostomy tube. It is one of the way of prevention for tracheal stenosis in the patients who are going for long on ventilator. First thing, and second thing, when the patient, it has happened, tracheal stenosis. Now, as you said, there are procedures which are done by surgeon, I'm not surgeon. So they do uh, dilatation, they put some stents, there are some stents, and these type of procedures are there which can be helpful later on for tracheal stenosis. Yes. Thank you for the question. My name is Dr. Salam from yes. Ghana. Yeah. Um, with regards to the, the study by Botsky um, et al., which, which you mentioned, the 2017 one, yes. you mentioned that they were looking on the, um, the day, second day, um, five days, seven days. Yes. Um, my question is, would that extent of um, laryngeal manipulation, wouldn't it cause, isn't it a possible cause of um, the laryngeal edema itself? What are alternatives rather than, or like, you know, manipulating the airway just to see if there's any laryngeal edema? Is there any other way they could have objectively measured apart from the, you know, because by that point, the tube is no longer there, but they are still manipulating to see, is there a laryngeal edema or is no not? I have done myself. There is no manipulation there at okay. all. Okay, when you, that, endotracheal tube is there, okay, you are opening your mouth, you are putting the laryngoscope, you are putting, you are watching inside video. It, it does not cause that much of manipulation. Anyhow, you have to do manipulation in ICU when you are doing suction and all. Okay. So sometimes you have to do many times dental section with your patients. Okay. Endotracheal tube is there, inflation is there, cuffs are there, so you are not going, doing much harm to the patient, just you have to be a bit gentle and careful. Okay, and this, this also, this, my other part of the question is, uh, is there any room for um, pre-extubation nebulized ep epinephrine in your setting? I mean, in our setting, we do that. We do, before we extubate, we give, we nebulize with um, epinephrine, and I've seen other studies, including a study by Suri et al. in 2022, which also suggests that yeah, it's that a is, good thing. That is a How good thing. Yours? That is a good thing. It has a short effect. Uh, epinephrine, when you nebulize, it has a short period of effect. And here the systemic steroids, they come in. When you are nebulizing your patient with epinephrine, and uh, by the time the steroids will take over, we can do that. There is no, there is no problem in it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Aoto. So for the next few minutes, let's go through some of the emergency ECG patterns that we'll come across that we should not miss. Okay, the first ECG. This is a 68-year-old male, diabetes, chest pain since three hours with sweating. That means the patient has mostly had an acute coronary syndrome or acute MI. 
That's our provision of clinical diagnosis. So we take an ECG and this is the ECG. You can see that there is ST elevation in lead 2, lead 3, lead A, V, F and also some elevations in V1, V2, V3, V4. So we, it is not difficult to say it's ST elevation MI but the ST elevation in lead 3 is more than that in lead 2 and there is ST depression in lead 1 and lead AVL. So we know it is an inferior wall MI, STEMI or ST elevation MI but the occlusion is in proximal right coronary artery because of these findings and that means we have to be very aggressive with the patient or it is just a matter of time before the patient develops hypotension, bradycardia, complete heart block and potential death. Next ECG. So we all know the management of STEMI. If we are in a facility where you can do a cath lab based primary angioplasty, we proceed with it. If not, if the time duration between the first medical contact to the device time, that means putting an angioplasty and stent, is more than two hours, then we should not waste time because time is myocardium. And so we go ahead with thrombolysis or fibrinolysis with the best medicine available in our center. Mostly it is tenecteplase that would be the best choice. If tenecteplase is not there, whichever is alternate fibrinolytic therapy is there, we proceed with that. Next ECG, I'll be showing a few MI ECGs because that is very important. It's an emergency and you'll be coming up across these uh, ECGs in your everyday life. This is a hypertensive patient coming with chest pain and sweating and he's in hypotension. So there are different causes of hypotension but this is the ECG and ECG says AVR, ST elevation. This means bad prognosis. And there is ST elevation V1, V2, V3 and ST depression in V4, V5, V6, 2, 3, AVF, 1, AVL. But this AVR ST elevation means bad prognosis for the patient because it is either left main disease or left main equivalent which means critical stenosis or occlusion of the proximal left anterior descending artery and proximal left circumflex artery. This patient needs emergency procedure with hemodynamic support that is intraartic balloon pump as a first option if financially constraints are there and if there are no constraints maybe we can consider ECMO and impeller device but what we usually use is an intraartic balloon pump for hemodynamic support and we proceed with primary PCI emergency bypass surgery is an option but very often the cardiac surgeon won't undertake because the patient is very very sick before he does a sternotomy the patient will collapse, so mostly it is up to the cardiologist to do a primary PCI wherever the cardiac cath lab facility is available. Next ECG, 40-year-old female, ankle fracture, bedridden for the last few days, sudden onset of breathlessness and low BP. This is the ECG, tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, axis lead 1 negative, lead AVF positive, so right axis deviation, incomplete right bundle branch block, T inversion V1, V2, V3, V4, suggestive of RV strain pattern and we also have what is called S1, that means lead 1 has an S wave, Q3, lead 3 has small Q and T3, T inversion in lead 3, so S1, Q3, T3 pattern that is quite commonly seen in pulmonary embolism even though not common presently. If there is RV strain, it is quite commonly present and once it is present, you strongly suspect pulmonary embolism and confirm the diagnosis with echocardiography and CT pulmonary angiography. So pulmonary embolism, once you diagnose acute pulmonary embolism, you need to restrictify the patient based on blood pressure, oxygen saturation, echo wise RV function and troponin T elevation to low risk or high risk and if low risk means you can manage with anticoagulation alone. If high risk you have to consider thrombolysis and if the patient is high risk for thrombolysis you may have to consider embolectomy and anticoagulation. 
Next ECG. 68 male, lung malignancy, sudden breathlessness. This is the ECG. You can see that there is sinus tachycardia. But what is more significant here is the identification of alternate tall and short QRS. What is called electrical alternates. That is a reflection of the heart swinging inside the pericardium with significant amount of pericardial effusion and most likely cardiac tamponade. Confirm with echocardiography, you can see the pericardial effusion outside the heart. By echo guidance or by fluoroscopic guidance, you aspirate through the substernal with a needle and then you aspirate, put a pictorial catheter there, aspirate the effusion, keep the pictorial catheter there for one or two days so that once the effusion is completely drained, you can remove the pictate. 67 male, chronic kidney disease, fatigue, breathing difficulty. This is the ECG. Very typical, tall, tender T waves, tending of T waves. Suggest very high potassium levels. This patient, it was seven, of course, commonly associated with renal failure. So once you diagnose and suspect hyperkalemia, you have to aggressively initiate the patient on antihyperkalemic measures. Otherwise, there is increased risk of sudden death. Yet another patient, same chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis, extreme fatigue, giddiness. This is the QRS, which is very wide in the ECG. So let's go ahead systematically. Tall T waves tented hyperkalemia but next stage if the qrs if the potassium is very high there is widening of qrs what we call a sine wave pattern that means it goes like this sine wave and this patient the potassium was 9 with the creatinine of 3.9 and we need to be diagnosing hyperkalemia and very aggressive with antihyperkalemic measures so that sudden death is prevented so a revision of hyperkalemia we have to protect the heart, so IV calcium gluconate. Remove potassium back into cells, glucose insulin infusion, salbutamol inhalation, soda bicarb infusion, and may need <coughs> removal of potassium from the body with new drugs like sodium zirconium cyclosilicate or other potassium binders. <coughs> Early institution of renal replacement therapy is very important. The nephrologist must be called into the picture for early initiation of dialysis. This is the management of hyperkalemia protocol that is quite uh, the, uh, available in all the guidelines, but it is almost important to know that once the potassium level starts to climb, starts with peaking of T waves, then P wave gets flattened, then PR gets prolonged, then the QRS gets prolonged, and then, then there is sine wave, and if still not managed aggressively, there will be a systole. Yet another case, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 58-year-old meal, on diuretic therapy, presented with extreme fatigue, and one episode of syncope. You can see that these kind of waves after the QRS and the T wave, they are actually U waves, commonly seen if there is a very low heart rate. And they usually signify, or you need to suspect low potassium. The QT gets prolonged there will be some SGT changes. And these people are at higher risk of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So hypokalemia, we need to suspect and check potassium, syrup potassium quickly. And if it is low, which is most likely it will be low, you need to be correcting it aggressively, either orally or IV, based on the general level of consciousness and ability to take orally. This is Another patient who had hypokalemia, you can see the U waves and prolonged QT. And suddenly, this patient degenerates into a polymorphic VT, otherwise called torsa de ponte. And then we are in an emergency scenario where we need to give DC cardioversion to the patient for hemodynamic stability. Yet another ECG, 46-year-old female presented with palpitation and twitching sensation in the neck. You can see that there is tachycardia, 
it's narrow QRS, it's regular, so you provisionally make a diagnosis of SVT. And you can see that there is the pseudo R dash pattern in V1, which means that it is most likely AV and RT, which the electrophysiologist will later on confirm during his electrophysiologic studies. But what we have to do on an emergency basis is either give a carotid sinus massage or IV adenosine and wait and convert it to sinus rhythm as soon as possible. Yet another case, 43-year-old male, fever two days, and along with fever, he had syncope. So fever with syncope, very often we suspect vasovagal syncope because there is probably some amount of hypotension, hypolemia. But then what we have to be careful is the ECG we need to take mandatorily, and this ECG shows ST elevation in V1, V2. This is otherwise called Brugada syndrome. You can see that pseudo ST elevation with incomplete right bundle branch block pattern is a feature of Brugada syndrome. And these people are at increased risk of ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, and sudden death. So identifying and risk stratifying this patient is very important, even though these people, the Brugada syndrome is manifest during times of stress like fever. This is the t three types are there. This is the type one type 2 with the saddleback appearance, and type 3. So if you have Brugada, there is further risk stratification. You need to evaluate further. And if the patient is at high risk for VT or VFib, and if the patient has had a syncope, you should be very careful. This patient may need implantable cardioverter defibrillator, ICD implantation. But the first step is you, who decides to take an ECG and make a diagnosis of Brugada based on the V1 finding. <laughs> this patient had another fever spike. ECG was being taken and repeated. He had syncope in the hospital. You can see this patient had a sudden polymorphic VT. So needs emergency cardioversion. Another patient, 28-year-old male, came with palpitation to emergency, sweating, two days duration. You can see broad QRS, tachycardia, and this patient was cardiovertered suddenly because of hemodynamic compromise. And post cardioversion, we should always take one more ECG to find out the morphology, I mean the QRS morphology and how the ECG looks like in sinus rhythm. You can see after the QRS, there is this tiny wave called the epsilon wave. This is the magnified version of this. This epsilon wave is diagnostic of arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy. So this was the tachycardia ECG. These people are at increased risk of ventricular tachycardia. And that's why identifying any broad QRS tachycardia is very important. And if you are confused, consider that as ventricular tachycardia. Assess if the patient is hemodynamically stable. And if there is low blood pressure, extreme tachycardia, or giddiness, cardiovert as soon as possible before thinking too much and take one more ECG and then communicate with your cardiologist. Yet, very common scenario, 72-year-old, hypertensive, coming with headache, stroke, no chest pain. You take an ECG, suddenly ECG looks like this, deep T inversions in anterior leads. These are called CVA T waves or cerebral T waves because these kind of T wave changes are very common in patients who have developed stroke. So, management of stroke and careful monitoring of the patient is most important, rather than diagnosing acute MI and trying to call the cardiologist. Sometimes children can come to emergency, especially coming with seizures. Neurologists will be called for, you will evaluate the neurological examination, but it is also important. <coughs> you take the ECG and make sure it is normal. This patient had ECG like this, 
it may appear normal but then there is something abnormal here these are not normal t post t wave changes this patient this child has a long qt syndrome and people with long qt syndrome can have ventricular tachycardia and when the baby gets ventricular tachycardia she may fall down because of hemodynamic collapse and they may have a seizure post ictal eeg may be normal or have mild abnormalities but the key is to take the ecg identify the long qt especially the two waves the two hums in v2 v3 and diagnose long qt syndrome yet another patient young healthy male 24 years giddiness sweating for 2 hours syncope one month back the ecg is like this broad qrs tachycardia so check the bp if bp is unstable cardioversion dc cardioversion but here this patient also had irregular these are not regular tachycardias these are irregular tachycardias because the heart rate is very fast they may appear regular but actually if you look observe carefully they are actually irregular and this irregular heart rates have a heart rate of more than 200 beats per minute so irregularly irregular broad qrs tachycardia with heart rate of more than 200 is almost always seen in wpw syndrome because they have accessory pathways there's no delay at the av node and through the accessory pathway the impulses are conducted from the atria directly into the ventricles and hence they have very fast heart rates like you see here this patient was cardioverted and after cardioversion as we always do take a sinus rhythm ecg and confirm what was the pathology here you can see there is short pr interval because of the so called delta wave or the pre excitation wave so these patients need to undergo electrophysiological studies and radio frequency ablation by the electrophysiologist at uh, an appropriate place near you so that the risk is not there hope you this talk helps you significantly in your daily practice thank you very much thank you very much professor davasia for that insightful presentation we are going to take some questions now from the audience if you have just wave your hand and we we'll get a mic to you Thank you very much for the presentation, Professor. I'm sure most of us don't like EPGs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, my name is Dr. Monga from uh, Zambia. Uh, my question is um, on one of the ECGs you presented, uh, the WPW, which had the white QRS complex. So on, ini on, on initial presentation, that would look like a ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So for a primary care physician, um, what would be the fastest way to differentiate uh, a white QRS complex uh, VT from uh, an SVT with aberrancy, for example, in this presentation? And what should be the approach for a primary care physician? Thank you very much. Excellent question, because uh, we come across, uh, even I have come across these scenarios when long back, 20 years back, when I was starting my medical career. So one practical point, uh, both from the medical aspect and from a professional aspect if you do not like ecg have good mobile contact with your cardiologist friend so that you can order somebody please take ecg fast they take the ecg take a snapshot and send it to a cardiologist and say what to do next so that you are safe and comfortable and your patient is also safe and comfortable but i'm very sure you are going to be a great doctor or already are a great doctor so what to do in case of broad qrs tachycardia 
So this case and the ventricular tachycardia, this patient had WPW and that patient had ventricular tachycardia and both of them had hemodynamic compromise. So very often broad QRS with very fast rates, they will be having hemodynamic compromise. So we do a DC cardioversion for both cases. So the, what we did was same. And taking an ECG again after the cardioversion is very important because that tells you what is the primary problem. One rule of thumb is when you don't know, you're confused, so much of tachycardia, it's broad, consider it as ventricular tachycardia and do a DC cardioversion, shock. And uh, the key sentence in a WPW is if the patient had broad QRS, irregular tachycardia, and heart rate more than 200, it can only be WPW because they are directly conducting it from the atria to the ventricle by passing the AV node. So normal physiological delay of AV node is not there because of this accessory pathway. Thank you very much. No offense. Thank you. Here my friend would like to ask a question. So just follow up to the question he's, he's asking. Uh, what if in the case where you do not have a means to do cardioversion, what do you do then? Oh, uh, I don't know about the rules of hospital or clinic in Africa, but in our country, if you have to run a clinic, you should have a defibrillator with you. You cannot open or run a clinic without a defibrillator. And the reason is this. There is no substitute for defibrillator and it's not costly. So uh, you just have to tell your team, get the defibrillator ready. Like some uh, cardiac emergency medicines we always need. We need a defibrillator, we need atropine for bradycardia patients, uh, we need uh, some noradrenaline, some dopamine, some adrenaline, and some adenosine, some IV diltia, some, some IV metoprolol. These drugs we need to do if we are planning to see an emergency patient. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation. Mine is a very simple question. Uh, what is the treatment modality for a patient with uh, long QTC interval? Okay, so long QT, we need to restratify them to see their potential risk of uh, ventricular tachycardia, but most of the times, so once you diagnose long QT, they would have had some symptoms, they would have come to you, that means they are high risk and they need to have an ICD, implantable cardioactive defibrillator, implanted them for protection against dangerous ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. He, he's there, our friend is there. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I just want to add on to the question he asked about long Q syndrome, especially in pediatric patients. Um, maybe when they have seizures, there are other things that we may think of. Um, so what are some of the things that may raise your suspicion that is long Q syndrome and you, 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 you have to do um, ECG to diagnose it? Okay, so anybody who comes to you with syncope or seizure, you obviously you will evaluate uh, the neurological system definitely but you need to the point is you need to evaluate your cardiovascular system as well and a simple ecg is mandatory in everybody that is the point you take 100 children or 100 young men with syncope or seizure you take ECG for everybody, no problem. And you confirm and document that you have got a patient with seizure, syncope, his ECG is normal, fine. But the next 101st patient will be having an abnormal ECG, let's say, and you look for these T waves in V2, V3 that looks like a double camel hump. That will tell you that it is most likely abnormalities of QT, long QT syndrome. 
and many of the ECG machines will tell you, calculate and tell you what is the QT or QTC, corrected QT level. So if the QTC is prolonged, it has to be somewhere below 400 for children. Anything more than 450 means warning for both the clinician and the patient. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, we see uh, out of 10 patients, we see in about three, four patients at least. Yes. Yes. Okay. So not that common, but it can happen. Out of 10, three, four is quite common. Oh, yes. It's one yes. out of three. That's 40%. Okay. Yeah, it's a one out of three at least. Yeah, yes, yes. So it all depends on when you take the ECGs. Uh, acute stroke, immediately you take it, maybe there, and after two, three days, they may nearly normalize or may get flat also. So the timing of taking the ECG is also important. And then that will be the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. So today I'll be talking about a long COVID syndrome and basically I'll be looking at it as an, basically a perplexing sequel of something that uh, has devastated us over the past few years. Eh? So basically the term long COVID, actually it was coined by patients and, and not doctors and it was coined on social media. And uh, the people who coined it, actually one of them was Perago, who went on to publish about it. Uh, basically what they were trying to describe were the manifestations four weeks or more after being diagnosed or suffering from COVID. And uh, their basic intention here was just to try and mobilize other people who were suffering from the same kind of challenge and uh, to try and bring them to speed so that uh, they would be able to understand the medical challenges that they had, the epidemiologic challenges, work-related challenges, and the socio-political ch challenges that occurred at that time. So basically what uh, they were trying to describe was just the journey after COVID, and uh, that's what gave rise to the same. So long COVID, as per their description, actually was a more of a, a multi-systemic state because it affected everywhere. You know, some had fatigue, some, had, you know, mental issues, some uh, had cardiac issues, some had lung issues. So we will handle this as we move on. And uh, basically long COVID from all these things in a study by Revandran, it basically is just what happens is, is the time lag between the microbiological recovery that is after four weeks of having COVID and the time when you clinically recover, come back to your normal status as it is. So just as uh, you know, I've mentioned the terminology arose more from social interactions, there have also been controversies in terms of naming basically what happens or what we are describing as long COVID. So several uh, names have come up, and uh, this include chronic COVID syndrome, long COVID syndrome, the long haulers, post-COVID syndrome, and even the WHO came up with the terminology, the post-COVID condition. But all of them refer to the same thing. Now, the post-COVID syndromes, just as I mentioned, this thing is multisystemic. Yeah, it affects everywhere. So you'll notice some have fatigue, some have uh, cardiorespiratory conditions, some have GIT conditions. You know, it, it touches everywhere, even the skin itself, eh? it, it, it touches that. So it's something that uh, is truly perplexing as it is. So these are just uh, COVID uh, statistics from the WHO. And uh, what I just wanted to highlight was that COVID is still there. This was as at October, but even the current uh, scenario is that it is still there, although the incidences have uh, largely reduced. So, in terms of symptom symptomatic presentation, this is from the UK Office for National Statistics in 2021. Uh, at uh, five weeks post-infection, 21% of the patients still had symptoms. And uh, at 12 weeks, 9.9% of them had still symptoms. And the median duration of symptom follow-up was 
39.5 days, according to them at that time. But of course, these figures have changed, and there are even 2,002 studies from all over the world that are even giving us uh, median durations that are longer than the same. Now, the CDC also tried to map out COVID. So in their household uh, pulse uh, survey, so basically what they did is that they included a 20-minute uh, questionnaire session trying to look at uh, long COVID or long COVID-related presentations. Most of these studies, by the way, are, uh, they, 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 they are either prospective or retrospective cohort, and uh, most of them tend to be run either using questionnaires or, 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 or phone interviews. So like in the CDC, this is a web-based uh, questionnaire. So you answer some questions and they try to figure out whether you would be having long COVID. So what uh, was observed was that the national estimate, according to them, was at around 29.6%, whereby the denominator in this case was uh, actually someone who had experienced COVID or who had COVID that was confirmed and managed somehow. So the global prevalence, again, there's a Chen in 2002 who did a, actually a big uh, systematic review. He looked at around 4,500 papers at the initial selection and uh, brought it down to 40 papers. And uh, from this, he came up with uh, a prevalence of 43%, a global prevalence of 43% for people who had long COVID or what was thought to be long COVID-related symptoms. And uh, from the meta-analysis, again, by Chen, these are some of the things that he noted. He noted that uh, the long COVID uh, presentation was more common in females. It was uh, more common in Asia and uh, followed by Europe. Then the follow-up time, actually, it tended to, the symptoms tended to increase as the period increased. And the most common symptom was actually fatigue. And then there were other symptoms, like the neurologic symptoms, uh, memory issues that would come. So maybe after COVID, I think many of us started forgetting because of the same. Eh? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the other thing he noted eh, in his uh, basically review is that it was a multisystemic you know, manifestation. It affected several systems, as has been indicated. So in the same study, so the prevalence I've spoken about, he certified them again into hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients. And what we notice is that among the hospitalized patients, there was a higher propensity for them to develop long COVID as it is. Then he looked at uh, three continents. Uh, unfortunately, there's, there isn't much about uh, long COVID in Africa, but I'll talk about this. Eh? I'll, I'll just mention it. Then, uh, of course, the gender uh, imbalance was also mentioned, and then the increased symptoms with duration. Yeah. So, in 2021, you actually conducted a meta-analysis again on uh, long COVID. And 2021 was, uh, I think, in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So, at that point, he actually noticed that uh, there were no studies from Africa. But uh, that scenario has actually changed. Yeah. So I didn't put up that slide because uh, at the time when I was pre pre presenting this slide, you know, it, it was already locked, so any other modifications wouldn't come in. But there are actually studies, three studies from South Africa I picked up, from Nigeria, about uh, three that picked up the same. And uh, there were reasonable studies. Some of them were good. Another one of them was a commentary in the Lancet. So th the thing is there, and uh, you know, people are starting to pick it up. Like in the South African study by Dredsen, I think uh, one of his conclusions was that among the COVID patients, one out of 20 developed uh, long COVID or had long COVID symptoms. In the Nigerian study, 
among the cohorts that they, they looked at, they found that uh, about 40% of them had long COVID manifestations. So it's something that is starting to come up, and uh, I know that in the next year or so, we'll have uh, some literature from our continent. So the other thing that uh, I mentioned that this thing is multi-systemic. So it basically affects the whole body, yeah? And this is uh, what I'm trying to highlight here. So I'll just go back a little bit. This one uh, is just a highlight of uh, COVID itself, acute COVID. Eh? And uh, basically, it, uh, COVID, you know, it has an incubation set, the symptomatic set, early pulmonary phase and late pulmonary phase. But of course, this pathophysiologic description has uh, been overtaken by time because uh, it ha has actually been observed now that COVID itself is multisystemic yeah, and uh, not only restricted to the pulmonary system. Now, this uh, highlights the same. At the time when you are PCR uh, likely positive at four weeks, you turn out to be PCR negative and that's where long COVID comes in. So acute COVID basically was uh, described, you know, as we were trying to come up with case definitions, there were issues like clustering and the COVID uh, symptom study group clusters were actually used to define basically what happened. So there were six clusters and then uh, these clusters were of course divided into severe level one, severe level two, severe level three. And uh, you had flu-like symptoms, flu-like symptoms with fever, GI symptoms. And then of course, uh, in a further modification, there was even a seventh group that included the other systems. So in terms of classification, this is where long COVID comes in here. And uh, the commonest uh, manifestation is that post COVID after suffering from COVID, one develops fatigue, there's a higher chance that they would have cough post, uh, of course, confirming that they don't have a co positive COVID PCR, headache, loss of taste, loss of smell, myalgia, sore throat, shortness of breath, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. <coughs> so this just highlights the same thing from another study again by Peterson. And uh, again, another observation from Chen, just the same thing, fatigue is more common, memory, dyspnea, and it comes down like that. Now, Cirulli also observed, uh, of course, period variations, that if you had a positive PCR, you tended to have a, there, there was a higher propensity for you to develop long COVID compared to someone who had COVID-like symptoms based on the cluster definition and uh, was not tested or was negative. So this is what those violin curves actually are telling us. And if you had more symptoms and you are positive, then you tended to move closer to long COVID than someone who didn't have either of those. So this is just again another symptom plot describing the same thing. So what are the risk factors for long COVID? One is an elevated uh, BUN, elevated D-dimers, and D-dimers, these are things that we tested a lot in COVID, during COVID time. Elevated levels of interleukin-6, and remember that some interventions actually worked on interleukin-6 itself. Uh, high levels of CRP, procalcitonin, and lymphopenia. Radiologic abnormalities, uh, in the lungs, heart, liver, and kidneys, the female gender. However, this has uh, been disputed. Peterson uh, in the Faroe Islands actually noted that there was a higher propensity in males than females. Yeah, but uh, of course, uh, still work in progress. Then, uh, of course, the initial acute COVID-19 severity, and especially if you landed in an ICU, then you had a higher chance of developing post-COVID syndrome. Uh, Post-traumatic stress dis disorder symptoms, especially in people who are in ICUs, someone who had more than five symptoms in the first week of illness, age of greater than 70, a high BMI, and 
the need for invasive mechanical ve ventilation or ICU are also thought to be risk factors for the same. So this just highlights the same. So from a pathophysiologic point of view, basically it's interesting, but uh, the thing is that COVID interferes with your angiotensin converting enzyme. And uh, basically by doing that and interfering with the receptor per se, what it does is that uh, it, 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 it pushes you more towards vasoconstriction and reduces your capacity to vasodilate, almost opposite to what a uh, professor told us about dengue. But uh, the consequences, of course, uh, they appear to come or to merge at one particular point and they're devastating. So the pathophysiologic considerations, basically, I'll just gross over them. One, drug side effects could be thought to prolong some of the symptoms of COVID. Organ damage, comorbidities could actually prolong the same. Inflammation, infections, an alteration in your immune status or immune dysfunction per se, psychological issues, and then the sequelae of uh, hospitalization and issues of deconditioning and post-traumatic stress per se. So this I think I've mentioned. So specific pathophysiologic considerations. So we look at uh, some of the organ systems. There are many. So I'll just touch on a few. So we talk about the neurocognitive impairment per se that is characteristic of long COVID. Why does it come in? You know, the current explanations include things like a hypometabolic brain activity that gives you the brain fog itself and also results in the anosmia. Then uh, trigeminal and nerve root involvements that will give you the headaches and the pain syndromes, which some come here and here also. Then uh, you have neuroepithelial viral invasion and inflammation, which will result in anosmia, dysgeusia, dysgeusia and the persistent fatigue that are characteristic of the same. Then uh, in the cardiovascular system, again, another very broad uh, coverage area. But basically, the considerations here are one, endothelial cell dysfunction and uh, cardiomyocyte injury. Then you have uh, issues or effects on your autonomic nervous system itself, which uh, also contributes towards the same. And then you have uh, lung effects where you have fibrotic changes and uh, you have things like microthrombi in your lungs. And this again will result in some of the sequelae that uh, we had mentioned. So our differential diagnosis, therefore, include uh, the following, the myalgic encep encephalopathies and uh, the chronic fatigue syndromes, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndromes, which are largely associated with the autonomic dysfunction, and then mast cell uh, activation syndromes. So you, the management considerations, therefore, are as follows. Now for long COVID, largely what you want to do is just to manage the symptoms manage the comorbidities, uh, manage any complications related to treatment, and then also try to address uh, any psychological issues that uh, could be arising from the same. And of course, if uh, there are other comorbidities, then those need to be handled as they are. So there is no specific treatment. Basically, what we do is just manage you know, as you move along. And you try to optimize therapy for what is known as you try to handle what is unknown here. So, so uh, basically, R Ravendran came up with this tool. He, uh, it's a nice paper, you know, he's trying to come up with a method of following up these patients in an objective manner. So, what he proposes are the following one, that in every patient review, you try to look at uh, the overall improvement in symptoms on a daily basis and you score them on a scale of 1 to 10. Then you try to look at their functional status on a daily basis, again score it. Yeah? 
and then you look at their mental well-being. So more like the SOAP uh, algorithms that we use to you know, review our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. But now, of course, having the scales here. So in summary, this is uh, basically what I've been talking about. Uh, in the interest of time, maybe I'll just leave it at that. But this slide actually summarizes everything that I've spoken about. I think they'll be shared. It will make it easier to capture what's happening. Then uh, as I wind up, I'd like to talk about the role of vaccination in long COVID. And actually it has been observed in several studies that vaccination does reduce the incidence of long COVID syndrome. And a single vaccination reduces the incidence. Two vaccines reduce it further. Three vaccines reduce it even further. And uh, these are some of the studies that uh, actually have described uh, this phenomenon. So we need to encourage people in as much as uh, COVID uh, prevalence and incidences are going down, we need to encourage people to go for vaccination. And this actually is explained here in this study by, 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 by Biambasuren et al. in uh, 2002. And what you notice is that most of the studies had actually favorable responses to vaccination compared to very few, actually one that had a very small and favorable response and two others that were neutral in terms of uh, their description. So this is a topic that uh, still can be looked at and uh, there are many questions, of course, that arise out of it. And uh, some of the areas that we need maybe to think about are, one, what uh, are some of or other extrapulmonary areas affected by COVID-19 itself? Uh, what is the relationship between autoimmunity and COVID-19? Are there specific autoantibody effects on uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme receptors? And of course, prevalence and manifestation of long COVID syndromes in Africa, Middle East, and Asia. Studies are already coming up, so that question is being answered. And then health response, responses or health system responses to long COVID syndrome, especially in setups like ours. And then issues of vaccine hesitancy and uh, its impact on long COVID. So those are just some of the possible areas that I thought about. But of course, there are many that will come up as uh, we move on. So those are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Steve, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Yes, you said uh, COVID prevalence is going down, but we are going back to the winter and we see what happened last year as well. It goes down and it came back up. So let's encourage the vaccination. We will take questions from the audience now and then before we continue with the session. Thank you very much. Um, I want to know, is there a diagnostic criteria or maybe a laboratory confirmation of diagnosing the long COVID? I'm asking on the basis uh, of the fact that most of the time when uh, maybe people have COVID, they isolate when they are no longer infectious, um, they de-isolate. And then for those of us in the maybe hospitals or workers, they give them some days off, then they can resume work. I've had challenges with people that, as you said, after a long time, after they've re recovered from, I mean, they, they are no longer infectious. They still maybe complain of some headache, fatigue, and all that. So that's why I'm asking about the diagnostic criteria as to where do we draw the line so that we know that indeed um, it, it, he's, the person is having long COVID and we have to give an extension of maybe excuse it or something, or maybe the person is just using the COVID as an excuse to continue to stay at home. Because at times it's, it's, it's not that easy to tell the two. Yeah, th thank you very much. Actually, you have asked a very good question. Uh, the definition of a 
long COVID is uh, fairly ambiguous and uh, it's still work in progress. But what we know is that it's a constellation of the symptoms that I had described. And these symptoms are occurring after a confirmation of a, a, a negative COVID uh, you know, PCR. So that's when they come in. Now, what you have mentioned, and I didn't talk about here, but it's actually there, is that uh, one, the WHO came up with a definition. Why did it come up with this definition, post-COVID condition? It's because there are a number of cases you know, of disability actually that are, are, are coming up. And some people are even proposing that this post-COVID condition should actually be classified as a disability because it results in, in, in loss, loss of, of, of work hours. It results in loss of revenue. So I think uh, it's something that is being worked up. The time you know they're thinking of it as a co cause of disability, then uh, they are trying to malingering and, and actually a, a, a disease state as it is. So we got two online questions. Yes. Uh, one is from Kuzai Murembwe, yes. and it says, in your country, what measures have you taken in, in addressing long COVID as far as, one, capacitating healthcare workers in primary care facilities to diagnose long COVID considering the lack of clear criteria on diagnosis and subsequent linkage to care like mental health care? That's question one. And then the second question is from uh, Obedaim Nkoba. And it says, why is it more common in women, as in long COVID? Why is it more common in women? And is it hormone related? OK. I think those are nice questions. Uh, I want to acknowledge Kudzai. Actually, he was one of my classmates. So in Kenya, actually, we don't have uh, any clear guidelines relating to long COVID per se. There are no clear guidelines. Um, thank you, doctor, for the um, good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, pediatric emergency medicine is quite a broad uh, subject to, to cover within the 30 minutes that is given. So I'm actually just going to give you a broad overview. Um, I'm going to give you a broad overview of the most common concepts uh, in pediatric med emergency medicine. Um, to illustrate some of these concepts, I will make references to the patients I have seen in clinical practice. Okay. So patient A is to illustrate uh, some of the presentations of comas in children. This was a three-year-old who presented with a two-day history of lethargy. Um, clinically also had a depressed level of consciousness with a GCS of 12 over 15 um, with deep labored breathing, was diagnosed with diabetic ketoacidosis, newly diagnosed diabetic type 1. So also presented with a met metabolic acidosis. Where's your pointer? Yeah. Met yeah. Metabolic acidosis and 10% um, uh, dehydration. So this is an example of coma in children due to metabolicosis. Okay. Patient B is a four-year-old who presented with upper motor neuron signs and depressed level of consciousness with a GCS of 4 or 15, that was E1, V1, and M2. She had a posterior fossa, she had a posterior fossa uh, tumor with herniation. This is an example of a tumor secondary to uh, intracranial lesion. Patient C, a 28-month-old boy who ingested insecticide and that was left unattended on the lawn, presented with a depressed level of consciousness with GCS of 4 over 15. That was E1, V1, M2, and pinpoint pupils. Patient was diagnosed with organophosphate poisoning. This is an example of coma in children due to toxic. Um, coma in general can be traumatic Coma in general can be traumatic or non-traumatic. 
As a pediatrician, um, we don't really deal with a traumatic coma. It's usually handled by the pediatric surgeon and general pediatrician, uh, general surgeons. Um, it presents with non-specific signs with wide potential differential diagnosis. The, the consequences is, is, is varied in, um, with serious pathological processes. It's an acute emergency with quick diagnosis, where the quick diagnosis of utmost importance. So a detailed history of the clinical presentation, examination, and specific investigation is quite important. And early diagnosis and pro management can improve outcome. So now this is the causes of now traumatic coma, of which you have seen already the three examples. So I'm not going to go into detail with this. But mostly it, it depends, especially the infectious causes depend on your geographical location. In some area, we still have a lot of malaria, so some children will be present in coma because of cerebral malaria. As by the uh, case study done in Berlin, on children in Berlin, where the non-traumatic causes of coma, the mostly of them were cerebral malaria. And then you get your metabolic causes, uh, which of which diabetic acidosis I just referred to. We see a lot of to uh, coma because of toxins, especially organophosphates and snake envenomation. When it comes to investigation of coma, it's a structured approach that's going to enable you to initiate specific treatment. So with emergency laboratory investigation, phatoscopy is always important, uh, and a possible analysis of cerebrospinal fluid, depending whether there's no indication to doing a lumbar puncture. Imaging is very important, cranial imaging and electrophysiology, uh, EEGs, sorry. Okay, so this table just summarizes everything I have said about coma, and basically it's, it's of utmost importance that you get to the cause of the problem, but that shouldn't prevent you from doing the emergent treatment like intubation and ventilation. Most of the cases I have referred to, those kids it needed to be immediately intubated and invent, ventilated while we're working up the cause of the coma. The next thing that's also have an increased emergency services use hospital admitting intensive care and also high mortality is convulsive status. Um, it's a common and serious neurological emergency in children. History defined as a seizure that lasting at least 30 minutes, but clinical evidence suggests seizure lasting at least five minutes and are unlikely to self-terminate without intervention. Cloda et al. have done a study on a Scottish population, a cohort study, where they found the epidemiology and outcome of status epilepticus. Um, the majority of children has unprovoked children, uh, unprovoked seizures, sorry. Febrile seizure made up most of the symptomatic seizure, about 95% of that. For every minute increase in duration, there was a 3% increased risk of adverse outcome. So when it comes to status convulsions uh, epilepticus, it's very of utmost importance to abort the, the status, as outcome is dependent on how long the child convulses for. These are the, the, the novel treatment for convulsive status epilepticus, and most of the time it depends on what you have in your hospital. Uh, first, we have the first line treatment, which is usually a benzodiazepine, followed up by your second line treatment, uh, we can be a phenobab, phenotoin, sodium alprate, whatever is, is, is available to you. So, as you heard, fibril convulsion is one of the causes of status epilepticus. The, ex the exact definition of fibril convulsion varies in the literature. Seizures that are accompanied by fever but not associated with central nervous system pathology. So, basically, you need to rule out that there is no infection of a nervous system in the cranial lesion in the nervous system before you can say that it's a fibril seizure. So it can be simple or um, complex uh, fibril seizures, where simple is generalized seizure lasting no longer than 10 minutes. Complex can be any of the following, lasting than more than 15 minutes, can be partial or focal seizure, more than one episode within the same 24 hours, or within the same fibril in illness with incomplete recovery. Um, recurrent fibril, they can be recurrent fibril convulsion, uh, seizures associated with fever on more than one separate occasion, and can also cause uh, status epilepticus. There's no seizure lasting longer than 30 minutes or multiple seizures within 
with incomplete recovery lasting for 30 minutes. Um, there is no routine investigation required unless it's in a very young child. The rest of re recurrence increases further with each additional convulsion, and the most important mainstay of treatment is um, reassurance of parents. Moving on to shock, which is um, acute failure of the circulation, resulting in inadequate tissue perfusion, oxygenation, and incomplete removal of harm harmful metabolic waste product. Common clinical problem associated with high mortality in low and middle income country, gastroenteritis, sepsis, malaria, and severe anemia has been found. Yeah, it's okay. Has been found to be the, mo the, the most, the cause, the most uh, potential causes of shock in children. We have five classes uh, classification of shock, which can be hypovolemic, usually due to gastroenteritis in our setting. Distributive shock um, is abnormal dilatation and constriction of vessels, usually due to sepsis and anaphylaxis in the children that we see. Cardiogenic shock um, is usually due to congenital heart disease. Obstructive shock, which is abnormal blood, abnormal blood flow, obstruction of the vessels, tension, pneumothorax, like and cardiac tamponade. This, these things are usually not present in children. And dissociative stroke is usually in our settings. <laughs> This is, sorry, they're telling me there's 10 minutes left and I'm thinking about what I still need to say. <laughs> Dissociation shock is, um, is usually what we see most is in, due to oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and profound and, and, and it's due to profound anemia and you will see it associated with illness such as malaria where you have profound anemia and, and, and carbon monoxide poisoning. So what is important here, the clinical history, physical examination findings are crucial for early diagnosis and classification of the shock. When you have hypotension, it's a late and ominous finding. Rapid fluid research is the first line of treatment. Usually, um, three time, two to three times uh, boluses should be given within the first 20 to 60 minutes, acknowledging the underlying diagnosis. Too fast, too fluid in certain conditions will also um, make complicate your your complicate the illness. Adrenaline is a preferred vasopressor and can be started peripherally in case of no excess, uh, central excess. Okay, so um, here, so continuous monitoring when you're dealing with shock is very important, especially cardiorespiratory pulse oxygen monitoring and obtaining good IV access as soon as possible. And it's sometimes it's impossible to obtain the access that you end up with intraosseous. Blood sugar is of importance, and hypocalcemia, if not corrected, can cause cardiac dysfunction. Broad uh, spectrum antibiotic in cases of septic shock should be given within the first hour. And with refractory shock, we can also use the high stress dose of hydrocortisone. A respiratory failure is one of, of, of uh, biggest emergencies in pediatrics. So that is due to inability of the system to support oxygenation and ventilation or both at times. You can get hypoxic respiratory failure or hypocapic respiratory failure. The three major etiologies in children is intrinsic or acquired lung disease, airway disorders, or neuromuscular dysfunction. This is an example of respiratory failure due to foreign body aspiration. This is where I would need a, a pointer. Okay, so as you can see here, the in the initial chest X-ray here seems to be uh, um, <clears throat> on this side. The obs this obstruction seems to be on this side. That you can see there's air tripping due to ball due to the ball valve effect that you have there. On the lateral, there's a defect there in the airways, and here that showed us that there's, um, there was a possibility of a foreign body. Unfortunately, we don't have access to uh, pulmonary cells in the country, so we make use of um, cardiothoracic surgeon. They only have access to rigid bronchoscopy. So they did the rigid bronchoscopy, and this is what they found. It's a seed of some fruit. So when this was shown to the mother, she remember exactly when it happened. It was about three months ago prior to them presenting to us. So at the time, I mean, the 
it for him, but uh, playing outside with a eat some grass. The, the child happened to be have aspirated on um, and move a rigid bronchoscopy also. Um, this is nine year old presented with acute respiratory failure in I thought there was a bilateral pre fusion to our shock we found the skylothorax. So respiratory failure in children can be diagnosed with a simple chest X-ray, um, inflammatory infect in, or infectious condition or radiopic foreign bodies can be viewed on chest X-ray. Investigation should not be delayed by um, emergent treatment such as intubation and ventilation. Christian's pathology. The gold standard of obtaining sample is bronchoalveolar lavage, but we don't have access to, have access to that. So most of the time we, we just do what we need to do and find out what's the cause later. Cardiac emergency are non, not common in children. Mostly when you, uh, they occur in, in the infant and the young. The outcome depends on the timely assessment of an accurate diagnosis of an underlying defect. Um, this three-year-old who presented to us with congestive heart failure, kidney injury. When you look at the blood pressure individually, they are not impressive. But this one here is the upper limb blood pressure, and this is the lower limb blood pressure. I'm, post, I'm sure most of us can already deduce the diagnosis. So this child was diagnosed with a coarctation of the ascending aorta which is a quite a, a non-common occurrence in children. So this was his chest x-ray. As you can see, the cardiothoracic ratio there is increased. And the ECG, I would rather not comment, but you can see the strain on the heart. I'm sure the ECG expert can elaborate. <laughs> here, as you can see, you can see the narrowing here on the CT angiogram. This is this, this where the problem was. Yeah, this child was diagnosed, was tended successfully and discharged home. The most common infection we see is a still meningococcal disease, which presents with a pedicular rash, signs of meningitis and or shock. And prompt administration of third generation cephalosporum is... Um, there's also a high risk of invasive disease in those with asplenia. We have a lot of... Um, Patient with functional asplenia due to um, sickle cell disease and also complement uh, deficiency. This is just what you see on the slide in microbiology. This is now invasive uh, meningo meningococcal disease. Oh, okay. So basically, management is with a, a third generation cephalosporin, supportive care, hearing assessment. They all get hearing assessment before discharge because they can have hearing impairment, uh, impairment afterwards. And then post exposure prophylaxis, chemo prophylaxis for the for the patient, uh, for the close uh, contacts. We basically make use of one of those any um, antimicrobial. The other issue that we do is non-accidental trauma, which is a life-threatening condition. This is living trauma with um, unverifiable or unexplained mechanism of injury. Um, thorough history and physical examination is of utmost importance, especially if there's red flags. Um, Evidence-based guidelines should be followed to detect occult injury. Children with sexual abuse may present with vague or pervasive uh, symptoms. This is usually a multidisciplinary team approach to get to the diagnosis and to deal with the consequences. The, the red flags in the history are usually an inconsistent history of the injury, implausible explanation or mechanism of the reported injury, and delay in seeking health. 
Um, red flags in a physical examination can be burns in multiple stages of healing, bruises on torsos, ears, nose on, on a child less than four year old, pattern injuries like submission burn injury, buckle handle belt injury, and bruises on infant less than six year old. Imaging and accidental trauma, um, non-contrasted CT head for all infant less than six months, non-contrasted CT head for any child with altered mental status, uh, sign of injury, CT abdomen where both with AST, ALT greater than 80, skeletal injury in all children less than two years of age, skeletal survey in non-verbal children. This is a, an example of a, a report of a four-month-old who was hit by a father repeatedly with a horse pipe. The vision of the father here is was he was aiming at the mother who was holding the child at the time. To him, it was like mother. But yeah, so but the child is the one who ended up with the injury, was diagnosed with a severe traumatic brain injury with multiple skull fractures and cerebral edema. After intubation and ventilation for two, three weeks, was successfully discharged home with no comorbidity. Yes. Diagnostic red flags in a non accidental injury, refractions in ages less than one year old, subdural hematoma in ages less than one year old, hollow viscous injury in ages less than four year old, um, genital injury, retinal hemorrhages, fractures of the long bone of one of non arbitrary children and multiple fractures in various stages of healing. I'm left with three minutes, that's why I'm marching through it. <laughs> so basically when it comes to non accidental injury, our duty as a healthcare worker is to understand our responsibility and mandate to report these cases and one needs to become familiar with the local reporting law. <clears throat> the suggestion of maltreatment and abuse is often uncovered by constellation of history physical examination findings than, rather than one single finding. So the take home messages in pediatric emergencies, um, the acutely ill children present to emergency department have the potential to deteriorate. Outcome depend on a prompt evaluation and stabilization. Hist thorough history and examination are integral part of reaching a diagnosis. Focus investigation, although they should not hold back your immediate um, initiation of treatment and um, yeah, immediate initiation of treatment can be life-saving. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lauren. And sorry for all the challenges <laughs> we have in with our pointer. Okay, so we're gonna take uh, a few questions from the audience and then there's also one online question. Yes, any question? Then we will start with the online. We have one question online, and it's from Dr. Obedine Unkoba. And it says, you said that an EEG can also be performed in children in coma. But we, have, but we know that sleep deprivation is a must before taking that exam. When the patient is in coma, their brain is functioning at its lowest stage of alertness. So how will we be able to, how will we be able to, how will the result of those patients in coma be? Can it be conclusive? How will it help us in the management? Um, it, it's true, you, you can't do the EEG immediately. Those investigation are listed investigation to be done for you to get to the diagnosis. So it's not necessarily that it's done immediately as a child arrives. Like some of us, you will get an EEG in a week or two thereafter. Then everything that needs to be done before the EEG is done will be done. So we, we, we don't do the EEG immediately as a child arrives. What we might do immediately will be the imaging like the CT, CT brain and the um, MRI. But the EEG will be left for much later. Yeah, but it's one of the things to get if you still have not arrived at the diagnosis by the time the child has recovered and needs to go home. My question is on your case where the child with the bilateral uh, pleural effusion and it turned out to be chylothorax. Um, how often do you find that in pulmonary tuberculosis in pediatrics in Namibia? Because I work in Zimbabwe where I uh, work mainly in 
uh, adult TB cases, and I rarely find um, Kyla's uh, effusions. Thank you. This was actually our one only patient so far, but at the time we were quite perplexed about the treatment further. We discussed the case with some of the pulmonologists from SA, and he also happened to mention that he had seen it once or twice in his lifetime. So it's likely a rare occurrence and usually happen when the TB is sitting close to the thoracic duct. And yeah, and that's when the chylothorax happens. So it's a very, it's not commonly, I have seen it once. And my professor from SA to whom we referred the case has also seen it once or twice, and he's been in practicing pulmonologist, speed pulmonologist for quite a while. So I would say it's not common. Jen? Um, I wanted to find out, in your practice, um, do you usually ca see cases of uh, non-convulsive status? And then if you do, in what context do they present? And uh, due to the nature of presentation, do you have any diagnostic challenges between uh, presentation as well as uh, diagnosis? And what are the usual approach to, to management in your setup? Thank you. We, we do have diagnostic challenges because we, we don't get our test results as soon as we would like to have them. So most of the time, you, you manage what you're seeing. You have a convulsing child, you have a child in coma, needs to be intubated, you intubate. You do what you need to do while you're waiting for what you need to have. And unfortunately, we also don't have pediatric neurology services, so we make use of adult neurology to, to help us out. And it's one of the diagnostic challenges because sometimes they'll just come and say, I've never seen this. So yeah, it's, it's quite challenging. Thank you very much, Dr. Lauren. This is actually a very broad topic. I've been allotted 45 minutes for that. I'm not sure I'm going to just teach to this topic in 45 minutes. So this will be my flow. I'll actually have, as usual, I have a few cases of my own and some are published cases. And I'll go to the usual protocol, the definition, pathophysiology, epidemiology of disease, uh, clinical and laboratory approach. That's what actually I'm concentrating on here. Some more cases I have. And if the time permits, I'll have the last part that is actually I have two different cases, uh, not actually the cases, two diseases which one is a prototype disease, another one is interesting for me. So if the time permits, I'll have a brief discussion on that. So this is uh, case one, a 34-year-old farmer presented with fatigue. He had uh, severe pallor, mild ictus, and uh, there are no significant organomegaly. He had all the cell lines which are low, hemoglobin seven, total count low, and platelet 75,000. And of course, whenever you see an Cytopenia, first question I ask my residents is, is there any abnormal cells, rule out leukemia. That's the first thing I'll ask them. So there is no abnormal cells in smear, and there is an indirect bilirubin of 2.4. I think you got a clue there. So it's an anemia with ictus and pancytopenia. So a patient's uh, mean corpuscular volume was 110, and you can see the pictures here. Uh, hyperpigmentation, very clear hyperpigmentation noted in the palm, tongue, knuckles. So you don't need a, a, what you call a rocket science here to make a diagnosis. It's a vitamin B12 deficiency. So it doesn't end there actually. So vitamin B12 levels are very low. Diagnosis done, treat. But uh, whether you stop there or further investigate is your choice. So how much to investigate a B12 deficiency? Is it a pernicious anemia or some other cause? Ideally, they need an apogee endoscopy to look for an atrophic gastritis, biopsy to look for a, uh, any abnormalities, and obviously, H. polar testing, there is a good link between H. polar and a B12 deficiency. Again, ideally, needs an antibodies to intrinsic factor for confirming the diagnosis. And uh, if these cysts are normal, we have to evaluate the ileum function, where actually the vitamin B12 is absorbed. But uh, very often, we will not be able to do this. Simplest way is treat and continue to treat. So this is an article I saw, a very recent publication in uh, uh, e-journal of hematology, pernicious anemia presenting as pancytopenia. 
this is so rare that's what i thought because i'll i'll go to the epidemiology i'm not sure it's uh, good enough to publish one one case of a pancytopenia due to pernicious anemia we'll move on to the next second case it's a 43 year old man chronic kidney disease on dialysis pancytopenia he has a splenomegaly and bone marrow done which was hyper diluted this is not my case this is a published case this is the osteomedullary biopsy showed nice picture i am also not good at interpreting all these things so this is actually a case of primary hyper hyperoxaluria it's a very rare case so i just picked up one of the very common case to a very rare complicated case and uh, patient underwent a renal transplant and it's everything was reverse and is published in a pan african journal in 2018 not to forget few points there is a confusion between pan cytopenia and bi cytopenia some of the textbooks say bi cytopenia also can be called as pan cytopenia that's actually i learned when i'm doing my post graduation so many disorders cause pan cytopenia also cause bi cytopenia that means two cell lines decrease is also taken significant to be given significance second thing is the institutional cut off values for a hemoglobin or a platelet sort thing actually supersede the published reference standards because the geographical distribution of particular disease has made change but still you have a reasonable definition for pancytopenia it's a nice article review which uh, published in i think uh, 2018 which tells most of the things about pancytopenia how to approach this is a reasonably accepted uh, definition for a pancytopenia hemoglobin less than 12 grams for a non pregnant woman and less than 13 for men and the wbc count absolute neutrophil count of less than 1800 of course you have to include polymorph bands if they report like that and platelets of 150000 or less so basically all this roam around uh, between uh, bone marrow and a peripheral destruction by predominantly by spleen so bone marrow is a dynamic organ so hematopoietic reservoirs responds to ongoing needs of blood cell production so there should be a balance between the blood cell production distribution of other distribution in the other organs and of course ongoing cell destruction so if there is a balance you find everything is fine so we want to classify pancytopenia in as a broad way it can be classified like this so causes of pancytopenia bone marrow infiltration or replacement classical example will be leukemia lymphoma myelomas mds sometime even tb bone marrow aplasias bitter folate not actually aplasia there is a something called a uh, improper or a, a, a abnormal erythropoiesis there aplastic anemia is a classical example parovirus is an example another example hep b and some drugs and of course another common cause are blood cell destruction or sequestration dic ttp rare mds common hyperspinism is a very common cause for under this category also we should remember some diseases can have multiple mechanisms like b12 deficiencies or lymphomas for example if you take lymphoma there can be infiltration of the marrow there can be immune mediated because some of the lymphomas have coombs positive immune destruction of the cells there can be a big spleen cause hyperspinism and of course drug we use for lymphoma all might contribute for a pancytopenia so now if you look at the if you have done a bone marrow which is a basic test in evaluation of a uh, pancytopenia pan set up in a hypocellular marrow these are the common causes i think most common will be acquired aplastic anemia this is an another important point to the older age people hypocellular mds generally mds will have a, will have hypercellular but it can be hypocellular mds then these are the rare other causes if you look at the pan set up in a with a cellular marrow it can be a primary bone disease or secondary to systemic disease again the most common one i listed here mds probably the list in a high quite high in the list paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinia not very common but you do find myelofibrosis and of course other diseases and uh, this is an, another important category you have a cellular marrow but due to systemic disease so sle hyperspinism deficiencies hiv disease of course other infections like tb brucellosis and even in sepsis sometime there may be sometime you have a hypocellular marrow you done marrow for some other purpose there may not be any pancytopenia basically you must have done for some other purpose these are the classical causes for a no cytopenia with or without cytopenia with hypocellular marrow q fever anorexia nervosa an important point here legionnaire's disease once in a while even tb also 
uh, here you find a combination of both impaired production and peripheral destruction. These are the diseases will confuse you. When you evaluate a patient with a pancytopenia, if you classify them as impaired production versus peripheral destruction, these diseases will always confuse us. So PNH, which can have a marrow problem, also can have a hemolysis. SLE can have multiple causes for pancytopenia, like I told lymphoma, immune peripheral destruction or a bone marrow involvement, immunity against a bone marrow cells also, so multiple, all drugs. HLH is a very typical prototype of this disease. I think I'll get a time, I'll briefly discuss on this. Some drugs can cause multiple problems and uh, transfusion associated graft versus host reaction also. There's a huge list of drugs which can cause pancytopenia. I just put, I think, two or three examples, that's all. So direct toxic effect on stem cells like cytotoxic used in mal a treatment of malignancies. Oncologists, we use this. And the dose dependent, it can be chloramphenicol and the immune mechanisms. So immune mechanism, the common drugs which can induce even a one tablet of something like an emocylide, I've seen people having problem. Colchicine is well known, thiazide is well known, and of course, carbimazole antithyroid drug. Alcohol and cytopenia, these are the different mechanisms under which it can cause uh, pancytopenia, direct bone marrow toxicity. This is most common probably, chronic liver disease with portal hypertension and hypersplenism. Increase iron absorption, alcohol is supposed to increase iron absorption, probably is a rare entity here, and interference with the even the folate absorption also. Briefly, if you look into the pancytopenia, you divide into inherited disorder and acquired disorders. Inherited, I think Fanconis and other some syndromes like dyskeratosis or Schwarzman Diamond syndrome, familial HLH is rare. If you look at the acquired disorders, these are the simple way probably you put some common diseases. So typical bone marrow failures, aplastic anemia, MDS, PNH, bone marrow infiltration, myelofibrosis, lymphoma, autoimmune, SLE, nutritional probably, anorexia, it's not very common in many countries, B12 deficiency probably very important, sequestration, hypersmonism, and some other causes. So this is a probably a simple list which has a reasonable approach to a patient with pancytopenia. So if you look at the etiology of pancytopenia in uh, different part of the world, the contributing factors will be the age. For example, the etiology changes with the age, geographic location, of course. I'll put some, some of the slides on different areas. Nutritional factors, probably the environmental and exposure to toxins also. These are some uh, uh, publications related to the cause of pancytopenia, how much each disease contributes. This is from the west part of the India, Maharashtra is in, in, in Mumbai, you would have heard Mumbai is from in Maharashtra state. So here actually 250 patients, almost 30% uh, almost had hypersplenism due to congestive spleen or malaria and all. Good number due to infection, again uh, HIV contributed in a major way. This Remember this is a little old publication. I think nowadays probably it has come down, enteric fever and all. Myelosuppression contributes good number and megaloblastic anemia 13% here and only 4% were actually hyperplastic or aplastic anemia. Actually, relatively quite less in, in this particular study. Another study from, again, Western India, uh, they had actually 166 patient, good number, almost one, th one third had aplastic anemia, and little less had a megaloblastic, and probably lymphoma and hyperspinism contributed for the next two common causes. This is from Delhi. Again, uh, this bit old, I think 2014 publication, but the, it's surprising to say very good number, 66% having megaloblastic anemia. Of course, the other, I'm not sure, probably it's in the rural side of the Delhi. Publication is from Delhi. Another from Western India. This is a relatively new publication, this year's publication. I think I spread out here everything. So almost 17% uh, leukemia, megaloblastic contributes in a good number in India, whichever study you take. A plastic 11, hypersminism 7, 6, like this, well distributed among, but still probably acute leukemia, megaloblastic anemia, and aplastic anemia contribute to the first three, I think, uh, the batsmen in this, in this field. It's also a recent publication. I think they observe here 73 patients after excluding a drug induced pancytopenia, they showed aplastic anemia is the most common cause. So 31% had aplastic anemia. 20% B12 deficiency and some infection. So, this actually we, we do find, uh, this is one, uh, one, one of the district in the, in the middle of the Karnataka where I practice. 
and one of the particular community there have huge number of patients with megaloblastic anemia. We have not investigated whether it's a pernicious or not. If the patient comes from that area, this, this is one of the district name from this place, uh, we straight away ask whether they belong to that particular community and check could be 12 level. We'll stop there. We'll not further investigate. I'm not sure what is the reason. Again, this publication is from Karnataka, so huge number. So 77 cases out of 104 are due to megaloblastic anemia. This is from Mexico. I think there also we found a reasonable number with the megaloblastic anemia here. So benign hematological disease 20 in that 11 are megaloblastic anemias. If you look at the hematological malignancy, 22 out of, uh, uh, I think it, it's around 20%, uh, so almost 100. MDS contributed a big number here. And of course, hypersplenism also a reasonable number. So it's, it's seen in many places, megaloblastic anemia, as a one of or the most common core pancytopenia. It's a big list of uh, causes of pancytopenia, but I think you could just uh, look into the country from where it come and look at the percentage. So if you look at the papers from US and maybe somewhere here from uh, Europe, you find, look at this, this is the most common, don't bother about these columns, look at only the most common diagnosis. If you look at the Europe, US and all, I think the aplastic anemia and maybe here if you look yes, again post chemotherapy, MDS, they became the most common cause. But to look at the studies from India, Asia or even China, megaloblastic anemia contribute in a big way. Here also from Africa also, most of the studies say megaloblastic anemia is the most common. So overall, if you say, and there are some papers saying Nepal and Bangladesh having aplastic anemia as a more common disease. So overall, it's megaloblastic anemia, aplastic anemia, and MDS. These contribute probably the most common cause for pancytopenia. So what is the clinical approach? So take a history, clinical examination, baseline test, and special tests you do whenever indicated. By this time, up to bus 3, you should decide what test you are doing here. You can't keep on doing all tests to everyone. So I just put a list of some emergencies in uh, uh, in pancytopenia or emergency in hematology basically. I think this all of us know severe neutropenia or thrombocytopenia, symptomatic anemia. These are the diseases which are need emergency attention. Suspected DIC or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Or, of course, as I told you in the beginning itself, circulating blast. These are the alarm for emergency. So medical emergencies associated with acute leukemia are uh, promyelocytic leukemia, DAC or tumor lysis syndrome. Severe aplastic anemia is an emergency. And suspected hemolytic hemophagocytic lymphocytosis also is an hematological emergency. So you take the history about time, course, and severity of anemia. Symptoms of cytopenia, you please ask about this. This undergraduate teaching usually fever, infections, neutropenia, fatigue, dyspnea, chest pain due to anemia, bleeding due to platelet deficiency. Constitutional symptoms may give you a clue, particularly somebody has a jaundice or a body swelling, it is a liver disease, hypersplenism, cytopenia, like that. Or maybe a disseminated tuberculosis may have a long standing fever. Previous treatment with vitamin B12, folate, iron transfusion, this is very important because. Very often we see a patient with severe anemia, pancytopenia, you check the vitamin B12 level, it will be high. The simple reason that most of the practitioners, as they go to the clinic, they give one vitamin B12 injection. It's a practice in India, the private practice, they give some injection, to some, otherwise the patient will not be satisfied. So level-wise it will be high, but you have a high MCV, you have other features of B12 deficiency. So please ask these questions, this is very important. And there are problematic some herbal medicines also, which may contribute for a pancytopenia. So these are the diseases with the constitutional symptoms. I think viral, acute viral infections are very important cause of pancytopenia. I have not highlighted that because that's a kind of a different picture, including any, even a dengue virus can present with the pancytopenia, but it's a very acute event. I concentrate on a chronic uh, pancytopenia. Fungal disseminated TB, endocarditis, HLH, lymphoma, autoimmune disease can all have a constitutional symptoms. So if you look at the physical findings, you may get some clue about the disease. So these are the important examination findings you should look and these are the clues. So if you have a rash, it's likely to be an SLE or a drug reaction or a viral exanthem if it is acute. Oral lesions, almost SLE again, 
drugs, once in a while some AML can cause some rash and all gum hypertrophy, other things. Lymphadenopathy, leukemia, lymphoma, TB. Splenomegaly, hypersplenism due to anything. The most common cause will be again portal hypertension due to cirrhosis or non-cirrhotic portal hypertension. Leukemia, lymphoma. Jaundice again a clue for a chronic liver disease. So I think I've just told these things already. Lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly. If you have a splenomegaly, most common thing is cirrhosis. Uh, uh, visual dysmeniasis in some part of the India is very common. I'm not sure in Africa you find or not. Malaria, viral infection, this I think I've already told. Extramedullary hematopoiesis like uh, thalassemia are also important. Splenomegaly, right heart failure rarely can cause storied diseases. And a rare, like an, I think you heard of Felty syndrome, you have a neutropenia with rheumatoid arthritis with a big spleen. So these are the few causes for splenomegaly with pancytopenia. So move on to the labs, initial labs. Of course, you have to do a CBC with the peripheral smear is very important. Look at the reticulocyte count also. It may give you a clue about hyperproliferative condition. PT, APT is important because you find a coagulopathy. There are very clear clues. So pancytopenia with the coagulopathy. Uh, I think I'll come back to it later. Uh, and serum chemistry, at least a renal liver function test and LDH are a must. These are the basic tests for evaluation of a pancytopenia. If the person with pancytopenia also has a prolonged PT or APT, there are only two possibilities. If there is a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia features like cystocytes or elevated LDH, it is probably sepsis. If there are no features of sepsis, it is APML, that is acute promyelocytic leukemia, which is well known to present with these things. If there are no features of MAHA and the PT is prolonged, that must be a liver disease. So this is the simplest way I approach these patients. Again, these tests has to be done in all aplastic anemia, HIV, hepatitis, BCR, well known to cause hetopenia, CME, EBV, if indicated, not that we do in everybody. What is the next test? So we have done all these tests. You might have got already some clues. If you still have no clues, go ahead with other tests. One more is probably the next test. You need aspiration and biopsy and sometime even culture. But these are the, what you call, you should be a little careful when interpreting the bone marrow. So it may be unhelpful or distracting, like the recent discontinuation of a suspect medication. For example, they are taking some herbal medication, which is induced some cytopenias. They stopped it, and at this point you do marrow, there may be a maturation arrest. It may look like leukemia. Second thing is the recent treatment with the growth factors for uh, look like, they may look like a mild proliferative disorder. They have taken some growth factor for some reason, it may look like a mild proliferative disorder. And if it is a peripheral destruction or sequestration, marrow will be kind of uninformative. It will say probably a cellular marrow, but it will not give you further clues. Next line test you have to decide on individual patient. We cannot do all these tests for everybody with pancytopenia. So if you are suspecting a PNH or acute leukemia, you need a specific flow cytometry for that. That will be the diagnostic of PNH particularly. You have a deficiency of CD55. Whereas acute leukemia have its own panel, so you can do the different flow cytometry for that. Cytogenetics, and again, when you require, when you think it's a hematological malignancy, molecular studies are important for a malignancy again. And rare disease like brucella, you might need a macrobiological help also. So bone marrow culture or bone marrow serological test in the blood also. I think I'll not go on to this. There are some nice articles on looking into the somatic mutations, different mutation and blood cytopenias. I think I'll skip this part, probably it's not run test of this. Then there are some specific mutation. We have a good link or a positive predictive value for a myeloid neoplasm like, uh, see that JAK2, which has a very good predictive, positive predictive value. Even this one has a good predictive value, that SF3B1. So when you see a peripheral smear in a patient with cytopenia, so it gives you a very important uh, information. So it's worth a clinician going to the hematologist and see the peripheral smear himself or herself. So it gives an important clue in many of these diseases. I'll show some of the pictures also. Leukemia, lymphoma, MDS, atypical lymphocytes in viral infections, myelofibrosis, metastatic cancer will show some abnormalities. So as I told you, any, anybody with the anemia, cytopenias, rule out leukemia first. So look for a circulating blast. So acute leukemia, here is a leukemia. If there are dysplastic leukocytes or something called a pseudo pelgar cells or reduced neutrophilic granules, it can be MDS, 
myelodysplastic syndrome, which is more common in the older age group. Immature myeloid cells like myelocyte, promyelocyte, metamyelocyte, all you see, but you don't see a blast. Once you see this, you are a little worried, but you don't see a blast. That is typical of a myelofibrosis. There is something called a leukoerythroblastic picture. Again, it's more common in myeloproliferative neoplasms or myelofibrosis. These are some pictures with the pelgar hute cells with unusual shape uh, nuclei here. It's seen in MDS. You see a lot of other cells in, a, I, I spoke about malignancy there. Uh, in a non-malignant conditions also, we see abnormal cells in the peripheral circulation. The most common one we see is a hypersegmented neutrophils. Neutrophils with five or more lobes with oval macrocytes. It is very clear, diagnosis is vitamin B12 deficiency causing megaloblastic anemia. It's a very clear, as I told you in one of the examples, if you find a high B12, but you find all these pictures, that means patient has received one injection of B12 few days prior to your, uh, uh, your interview. Atypical lymphocytes are very common. They are lymphoid cells with generous and malleable cytoplasm. It's very common in acute infections like infectious mononucleosis. Sometimes you find a hypersplenism also. Leukoerythroblastic picture is again, I've just now told you. So teardrop cells, nucleated RBCs, classically seen in metastatic cancers, which are uh, infiltrating the bone marrow. Cystocytes are again an emergency. I think the blasts and cystocytes are emergency in cytopenia. So it's uh, rarely seen in sepsis, but uh, classically it may be seen in APML also. These are the hypersegmented neutrophils in, see there are so many lobes in patient with B12 deficiency. Atypical lymphocytes with the large amount of cytoplasm in typical viral infections. Leukoerythroblastic picture, you can see giant platelets and the nucleated RBCs, tear drop cells and immature white cells also. Cystocytes are alarming always, I told you. Uh, these are the cystocytes here, fragmented. They are basically fragmented RBCs because of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. They don't have a central pallor and the different shapes of RBCs you find there. It's an alarming condition. So this is another case. A 24-year-old gentleman referred for a uh, management of thrombocytopenia. He had pallor, it's a big spleen, even liver is also palpable. All the three cell lines are significantly low here and there are no abnormal cells in the peripheral smear. So this is actually, I have seen this case around maybe around 15 years ago. I don't have a pictures of uh, this, whatever I am showing now. Uh, it's almost 15 years ago. Still this patient is under follow-up with me. We had done an ultrasound abdomen to look for the whatever organomegaly, but we found that IVC was grossly dilated. Then I sent the patient to my cardiology friend, so we did an echo and Doppler. There was some kind of a sudden cutoff in the IVC in Firavene a 3 centimeter before the IVC RA junction. And we did an angio, it showed a web side, like a structure there, probably it's a congenital web. And they have, cardiologists have done a percutaneous dilatation of this uh, web. And on follow-up, his hemoglobin TLC normal, platelets are slightly low even now. I think it's around 15 years ago. Even now, once in two years, this patient comes for my follow-up. It's around 80,000 to 100,000 now. Liver normal, spleen is just around three centimeter palpable. He's not on any drugs now. I think he's on only folic acid. No other medication is doing well. This is another case, 40-year-old farmer, asymptomatic, incidentally detected uh, pancytopenia with very low WBC count. Peripheral smear was unremarkable. PT was prolonged here and he had a normal albumin. I mentioned normal albumin because whenever you find a prolonged PT, you think it's a liver disease with pancytopenia, but PT is prolonged but normal albumin. That means not a chronic liver disease. This is a peripheral smear, R rods. I think you can see here R rods, cytoplasmic inclusions of abnormal fusion of primary. This is actually what you mean by R rods. This is a typical of a promyelocytes with R rods. So APML is a diagnosis. Acute pro-myelocytic leukemia. So one more aspiration proved this. Flow cytometry also confirmed this. And I think he was confirmed with this diagnosis also. He was put on, uh, he was sensitive to all trans retinoic acid. It's an acid form of vitamin A along with the arsenic trioxide. Atra, ATO combination he was put on. And I think he re I transferred this patient to oncology side. He initially responded. I'm not sure what happened after that. This is the case five with a 40 year old farmer, fever two weeks, plenomegaly plus cytopenia. Routine screening, almost all the tests are negative for malaria and other things. Even brucella, we suspect this patient negative, HIV was negative. 
We did a bone marrow here because I didn't have any idea here. So no granuloma, no abnormal cells, but it showed extensive hemophagocytosis. So viral screening for hepatitis E B we done because one of the very common virus which presents as an hemophagocytosis. Because conventional other tests you already done. T B rolled out, HIV rolled out, other things. So what to do here? What is the next test? So we suspected a primary HLH, that is hemophagocytic lymphocytocytosis. These are the clues for that. Very high ferritin and significantly high triglyceride. These are simple tests actually, which are ferritin can be high in many other uh, chronic conditions, but ferritin with the triglyceride high is a rare combination. So if you find these two, it's a diagnosis of HLH will come. So this we proved as uh, HLH and he was managed with according to the protocols, he was managed with the steroids and etopicide, that is the treatment for a primary HLH. Patient actually improved, but in hospital he succumbed due to an, an, an gram-negative infection sepsis. So if the time permits, I'll go for another seven minutes. Okay, fine. So I've I'll just go through two of the, I told you, two of the important uh, diseases. Not important, I would say, this is a rare disease, but it is of my interest. That's why I put here. What is HLH? There will be aggressive life-threatening syndrome with an excessive immune activation. More common in infants, but may be seen at any age. It can be familial or sporadic. Triggered by many events like Im infections, autoimmune, etc. Primary HLH is usually a genetic disorder, whereas secondary can be due to uh, another condition or some other unknown mutations. So actually it doesn't matter, we got description of these two doesn't matter much because we treat the same thing. So this is actually about the primary thing, don't bother about this thing, these are all the different mutations they mentioned here. Acquired ones we should know some of those, the infectious organism, endogenous like sepsis can cause, sometimes rheumatic disease with the macrophage activating syndrome and some of the malignancies can also cause HLH. The pathophysiology is uh, extensive inflammation and tissue destruction, dysregulated immune response. Most important thing will be macrophage will secrete excessive amount of cytokines. This will end up in a tissue damage and organ failure. So NK cells and cytotoxic T cells fail to eliminate the activated macrophages. This is another issue here. So whatever, whenever there is an activated macrophages, the normal body cells should be, NK cells should be able to take them away, which does not happen here. So macrophages eat host cells, RBC, WBC, platelets, all will come down. This phagocytosis observed in spleen, liver, bone marrow, this is where we pick up actually. We don't usually do spleen or liver biopsies. Bone marrow biopsy we do and get the phagocytosis. It can be other immunodeficiency syndromes also may be there. This is the diagnostic criteria for in adults for HLH. I think it's given everywhere. I just want to say if you find a specific genes, it's fine. If we don't have a specific genes, which we don't do generally, look at this. So five out of eight should be there. That's why I told you fever, spinomegaly, cytopenia will be always there initially. Look at the TGL level or fibrinogen. This is difficult to do in all patients. It's an expensive test. Ferritin, simple test. This is again, if you have a facility, you can do for this. So we look for this. In our patient had fever, spinomegaly, cytopenia, TGL high, ferritin high and hemophagocytosis in the marrow. Only these two, fifth and seventh, we are not done and we had a diagnostic of HLH in that patient. I think I'll skip this slide, this is actually for... Okay, so what you do, once you make an HLH, there is a reasonable consensus on treatment of HLH, atopicide for eight weeks and dexamethasone for eight weeks. If there is a CNS involvement, use intrathecal methotrexate. Followed by this, you may have to use another immunosuppression, either cyclosporin or tacrolimus for eight weeks. And very often, some patient may end up, the, the prognosis is not very good. This is a very bad disease, basically. Our patient actually had an initial improvement, but died due to an infection. But even if they survive, they may end up in a stem cell transplant later. The second topic I chose is actually aplastic anemia. I think it's a very common uh, disease uh, into the clinical medicine. So I'll just briefly tell about this. So it's due to a direct bone marrow damage. It can be constitution, what is called a Fanconi syndrome, which is seen in children. There can be immune aplastic anemia because when I talk about treatment of aplastic anemia, I talk about this also. Basically, there will be alteration in hematopoiesis, both the stem cell number, stem cell clonality, and the telomere length. All will be affected here in aplastic anemia. This is not just a 
decrease production of cells, there are multiple more uh, mechanisms will happen there. Uh, this uh, epidemiology and male female should be one there. I don't know why it came as some. So age is uh, bimodal. They, it can happen in a second and third decade or fifth and sixth decade are more common, but anytime it can happen. And etiology for aplastic anemia, these are the overall list I put, I think it's everywhere. I can just look at the autoimmune diseases, chemicals, drugs, idiosyncratic. This is important actually. Dose dependent are carboplatin, methotrexate, most of the chemotherapeutic agent, whereas idiosyncratic is more common in carbamazepine, phenytoin, methimazole, and antithyroid drugs, and even NSAIDs. And idiopathic is actually very common actually when you don't have any specific diagnosis. If you look at the acquired bone marrow failure syndrome in adult, these are the three common things. So aplastic anemia, pure aplastic anemia, red cell granulocytosis, thrombocytopenia, reticle, all cells will be low here. Most important thing will be no lymphadenopathy, no splenomegaly. If you find a splenomegaly and a pancytopenia, almost you are ruling out an aplastic anemia. So no splenomegaly, no organomegaly, hypocellular marrow. MDS, more common in the older age. Again, you find all cytopenias, but there will be generally splenomegaly. There will be abnormal cells in the peripheral smear and you have to do the chromosome analysis. PNH is a rare disease, but still, if somebody has, it's a very rare combination, aplastic anemia, venous thrombosis, and hemolysis. This is a typical triad of an, everything may not be there in a given patient, but somebody has cytopenia and also thrombosis, I will think of PNH first, or hemolysis. Of course, you have to detect and diagnose by deficient CD55 or CD59. This is the usual uh, natural history of a typical aplastic anemia. The, the red one is the uh, blood counts and the blue one is the uh, clinical response. And uh, generally the red sound, even if you have treatment, sometimes it goes on coming down. I think I'll skip this. I'll have a, there is a nice guidelines and it's one published article, recently published article in the immunosuppressive therapy for aplastic anemia. I'm not talking about the transfusion issues here. Patient would need a transfusions whenever required. But basic management, aplastic anemia, less than 40 years, try for a transplant. So if they have a sibling donor, it's the first choice. If there is no sibling donor, try cyclosporine and high dose anti-thymocyte globulin, ATGs anti-thymocyte globulin with cyclosporine. Response, fine, go ahead, no response. If you don't have a sibling donor, try for an unrelated donor. That's matched unrelated donor. Mud is matched unrelated donor. Whereas if you look at more than 60 years, obviously it will be a little less expensive, uh, uh, aggressive. Uh, you try with the drugs first because uh, transplant is difficult in the stage, immunosuppression is difficult in this age. Go for cyclosporine and ATG. Second dose, again you try one more trial of immunosuppression. Then you may try for a donor or sibling donor or you can go for some experimental therapies which are going on. Recently, last, I think, few years ago, you must have heard of L thrombopag. It's basically used for a thrombocytopenia. It's a thrombopartin analog, kind of. But there is a uh, recent uh, uh, alma mater. This has been added to the treatment of aplastic anemia also. It helps in the treatment of aplastic anemia. There are nice articles on that. This is a particular article in published in 2017 by NEAGM. They took some three different cohorts and different way of giving, whatever it is. The overall response is almost 74% or 80% at three months and six months. That's a good for an aplastic anemia. So at present, the consensus treatment for primary aplastic anemia will be l thrombopack 75 mg for six months, ATG for four days, and cyclosporine to continue. And you can use, you have to use steroids when you're using ATG, but it has to be tapered and stopped immediately, not more than 30 days. So primary treatment will be l thrombopack, ATG, cyclosporine, and steroid for a very brief period. There's another drug which has been added in, again into, there are good trials on this alemtizumab therapy for a native or a refractory, different types of refractory anemia that tried here, treatment name, relapse, refractory. And uh, overall, I think all the three groups actually it's responded very well to alemtizumab. But all these aplastic anemia, please monitor them for a clonal disease. I told you this is not just an aplastic anemia or cytopenia. They may end up in any of this disease in the future. So PNH, clonal cytogenic changes, MDS and AML, you have to look for all these patients with aplastic anemia. I think this is what I have already almost told about this, pancytopenia, CBC, do the initial workup, 
peripheral smear showed macrocytes, it is either MDS or megaloblastic. Then you divide into consumption, production, and peripheral dissection along with the production disorders and classify according to this. And you will get a kind of disease here. The last test, all this mentioned here, are probably for the very few cases. Most of the time, you get a diagnosis at this level. So, blow cytometry or at least an, a, a consumption disorder by splenic testing or all those things, you get a diagnosis. So, what are the take home messages? It's a clinical spectrum, it is not a disease. It can be very benign, like viral infections, just an uh, infection one nucleus can cause cytopenia to malignant like leukemia. It can be simple to diagnose, I'm not saying simple disease, simple to diagnose like primary aplastic anemia to complicated like HLH, I was just discussing you, it's a one of the very complicated hematological disease. Very common like B12 deficiency in, at least in Asia, in India definitely, even in Africa I see the whatever the literature I've seen, to the rare like paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. So you need to differentiate between hypocellular from other varieties because treatment is totally different for hypocellular marrow and catch the hint from clinical examination and by early labs. It is to catch there and no, no same, like next patient cannot be the same. He has to be a, a different cause and you can't see that I have seen B12 deficiency, this patient, next patient also B12 deficiency. It doesn't work out. So you have to examine the patient and look for the early labs. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vasudeva, for that wonderful presentation. We're going to take a very few questions, maybe just two or three. Any question for Professor? Yeah, thank you very much, Professor, for the wonderful and enlightening talk. I'd just like to make a small query on HLH. Now, uh, what is the, the, the probability of HLH occurring with lymphadenopathy as a presentation? as pure HLH? Primary HLH lymphadenopathy is taken as one of the criteria added there, but it's not a, that five out of eight criteria is not included. Organomegaly is included, but it is seen. Lymphadenopathy is seen. Okay, yeah, yes. thank you. But secondary, of course, depends on the disease you may have. Yes. yes. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> yes. Um, my presentation will consider some of the challenges and successes in neonatology and also look at some of the future directions, uh, future directions for our speciality. I'll start by updating the audience on current survival and long-term neurological outcomes of babies born extremely prematurity, in extreme prematurities in countries such as the UK to, to show what is possible. And then we'll focus on the reasons for the improvements that we've seen. And, and I hope what you'll see is that whilst advanced intensive care is very important, a lot of what we do is quite simple and can be done even in resource limited settings and will help babies born at any gestations. And then finally, we'll take a little look at some of the ways that, uh, which we can think about preventing term admissions. So why is neonatology so important? Uh, unfortunately, we know that the highest risk of dying is within the first 28 days of life. And, and a global perspective, at least two and a half million infants die each year in the neonatal period. And we also know that that's not even across the globe, is it? So for example, a child born in, in sub-Saharan Africa is, is over 10 times more likely to die in that first month than a child born in high income countries. But the reasons are quite similar. So prematurity and low birth weight accounts for, for, for a majority, as does uh, congenital uh, and early acquired infection. And those babies that die as a complication of perinatal asphyxial events. So we'll talk about some of, uh, of these issues as we go along. So how are we doing then? Um, of course, this varies across the world. Uh, this slide shows outcomes for babies offered active intensive care in the UK, Sweden, and North America. And advances in recent decades mean that we expect the large majority of babies born, even at 24 to 26 week gestation to survive. Um, indeed, we're also seeing survival at 22 and 23 weeks gestation as well. So quite, quite extremely premature now. I'm gonna skip over the next slide. So apologies for a, a quick flick through this bit. In the UK, uh, this represents significant improvements over the past few decades, as we can see here, with survival increasing quite significantly uh, from between 1995 and around 2015, 
uh, all of the extremes of gestations at 23 to 25 weeks. And these improvements have led to a change in standard practice in the UK. So around two to three years ago, the British Association of Perinatal Medicine uh, published uh, a document advocating a move towards offering more active intensive care at 22 week gestation. And that's controversial for some as that's really extreme and not something that's been done, certainly in Northern Europe uh, previously. However, we see that if we do offer active care, even at 22 weeks gestation, for those who have been able to optimize uh, prior to delivery, we can see survival in perhaps as much as three uh, in 10 of those babies. And by 26 weeks, this figure is around eight in 10. So, so good, good outcomes. But at what cost? So it's important, isn't it, to, to look at the quality of life. It's not just about survival. We need to look at the impact of severe disabilities as well. But fortunately, that's also getting better. And whilst the number of babies with severe dis neurodisability is high, uh, if you're born at 22 weeks, we see that by the time uh, we get to babies that were born at 26 weeks gestation, perhaps only around one in 10 of them will have a severe neurodisability. So we are seeing good improvements, but how did we get here? And, and is there any relevance that perhaps we can, we can, all, we can all share? So can any of the interventions used uh, be, be, be useful in more resource limited settings? And I hope so. Um, throughout the next few, sli few slides, I've provided references for anyone wishing to look in detail at any of the evidence or toolkits or guidelines that we use to help us optimize preterm outcomes. And we'll consider in the next sort of portion of the talk, antenatal and perinatal optimization strategies, um, delivery room management, and the importance of the multidisciplinary team in providing neonatal care. So a large focus of what we do is to try and try and optimize antenatal care for when, 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 we're, when we're expecting uh, preterm labor. And of course, that's not always possible. So many women just present in labor and deliver. But when we know there's a, a threatened chance of delivering premature, prematurely, we, we look at sort of four key areas. Um, the use of antenatal steroids that we administer to mothers, uh, magnesium uh, infusions that we administer to mothers as well, antibiotics, uh, and in the UK uh, and in Europe and most of North America, the, the key organism is group B streptococcal infections. And so when we recognize that mommy's colonized with that, treating her with antibiotics, and also the place of birth as well. And what I'll do over the next few slides is go through each of these things in turn, to talk about why those interventions are helpful and perhaps think about which may be, uh, may be possible in, 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 different, in different settings. So antenatal steroids then, we know that if we can administer a course of antenatal steroids, so, so that's usually either betamethasone or dexamethasone, um, it, which takes around 24 hours to give uh, before delivery. If we can give a complete course of steroids, we reduce deaths by around a third in babies less than 34 weeks gestation, uh, and including the most extreme terms, um, such as those less than 25 weeks, where the mortality will, will be even greater. So it's not just about the extreme preterms, it's those later preterm babies as well that have a benefit from steroids. As well as improving survival, it also reduces the incidence of respiratory distress syndrome, so the need for, for invasive ventilation and prolonged oxygen, uh, the risk of intraventricular hemorrhages, and the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis in the babies that are born most extremely preterm. So it, it improves morbidity as well. The optimum timing is to give within seven days of birth. So you, you ideally need to give it 24 hours before birth uh, and the effects start to wear off um, over uh, if, if, if delivery doesn't happen in those first seven days. But the mortality benefits are there, even if you can give a dose just a few hours before delivery. So even if a, 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 a woman presents in advanced labor, that could still be benefiting giving them. We talk about whether we give reduced, re repeated courses for those who threaten preterm labor, then don't go on to deliver. But the, the, the benefits of steroids there are, are much more uh, controversial. A real key for us at the moment, certainly in, 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 in the UK and Europe, is, is, is to try to more accurately predict when uh, women may go into to, 
to, to pre premature labor so that we can optimize the time of antenatal steroids. But of course, that's a very tricky and challenging situation for, for anyone to do. Uh, perhaps in more recent years, although it seems to have been right, probably the last decade or so, is noticing that giving magnesium infusions um, in the 24 hours before birth for those uh, babies born less than around 32 weeks uh, is associated with a, a decreased risk of cerebral palsy and death uh, to the baby without seemingly causing any compromise to the mother. Um, it's got similar effects across a range of gestation, including the most extreme preterms. And again, ideally we need to give that at least four hours or so uh, before birth. So that this is really focusing on the neurological outcomes if, we, if we've got the ability to give that. Antibiotics, so where there's been preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes, um, we know there can be an association with group B streptococcal infection, uh, it, which is the main organism, as I've said, in, in, in Europe and North America, and where we give antibiotics at least a few, four hours before delivery, that reduces uh, the risk of the baby going on to develop sepsis by around tenfold. So giving, the, giving those antibiotics to the mother while she's in labor can have a significant uh, benefit for the baby uh, as well. And the final sort of antenatal optimization, if you like, is thinking about place of birth. And I, and I appreciate that that's not something that all of us have the luxury to be able to do. But certainly um, in, in uh, Northern Hemisphere, we know that, uh, or Western world, we know that um, if we can deliver an extreme preterm baby in a bigger centre, so a bigger, busier, specialised neonatal intensive care centre, that the mortality can reduce by around 50% as well as there being significant reductions in NEC, IVH and PBL. And that's perhaps not a surprise. What it's really showing us that the more practice you get at looking after these babies, the better we do. And I don't think that's that that would be a, a surprise to anybody. So we have a lot of focus, if possible, if a woman is in threatened preterm labour, perhaps in a smaller, smaller unit or, or, or in a more sort of remote part of the country, we'll try and move them, uh, if safe to do so, to deliver in a more specialised centre. And this is just a summary slide really of the things that I've just said. So I won't talk too much more through it, but perhaps for those that are a little bit more visual, um, this will give you a better idea, but it's really sort of focusing that try and move the baby to, uh, try and move the mother, sorry, to a, to, to a, to a, a place of birth, the specialized center and thinking about steroids, magnesium and antibiotics where possible uh, before they deliver. Uh, again, I think I'll think I'll probably just skip this slide because it's it's um, something that was published by uh, the British Association of Perinatal Medicine, which summarizes all of these um, all of these interventions in an acronym called STAMPS. But the reference is just there for people that might want to refer back to that uh, later on. So from a global perspective, then, you know, we, we, as I said, we know many of the deaths are attributable to prematurity and infection and those interpartum complications. And the, the reason why these babies die can broadly be put into these sort of five or six areas. And um, what I'm going to do in the next few slides is look at some some ways that we can try and prevent some of the, to try and prevent some of these uh, becoming issues, particularly around thermal management and respiratory support. So we'll look at what we can do in the delivery room first. So in the delivery room, I would suggest there's three main things for us to think. Well, I would say there's four. There's, there's delayed cord clamping, thermoregulation, respiratory support, and then of course, it comes to the team that's there uh, uh, providing this. So we'll talk about each of these in turn. Optimal core clamping. So, you know, the practice in uh, the UK and Europe for, for, for many years now had been that, you know, baby's born, you just clamp that cord straight away, um, take the baby over to the resuscitator or, 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 or to, 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 to get some support. Um, but what we've realized is that if we actually go back to delaying that core clamping, so, so when the baby delivers, allowing a period of at least 60 seconds for uh, more perfusion of the blood from the cord to the baby before we clamp and cut it, then that can improve neonatal outcomes. So in premature babies, this period of delaying the cord clamping by 60 seconds or so reduces mortality. Um, the number needed to treat have uh, been around 20 for, for the most extreme preterm babies. 
and it provides higher blood pressure values in the preterms and less need for inotropic support. So reducing the amount of intensive care that these babies are needed. It also gives them a higher peak hemoglobin and it reduce, reduces blood transfusions by at least 10%. So particularly important to try and do this for preterm babies if we can. Even in term babies, we, we, we um, advocate optimal core clamping as it allows a greater physiological stability and again increases iron stores and hemoglobin levels uh, that reduce problems uh, for these babies in the early in the early weeks of life. So relatively, I mean, that, a relatively simple thing we can do, which doesn't cost anything at all. The next area is something that I spend a lot of time focusing on um, with my uh, with my team uh, in my unit, and that is the importance of not letting babies get cold, which sounds very obvious, but at the same time, it's something that people can do quite poorly. So the dangers of this have been known for some time, but it's still often given quite a low priority. Um, studies going back for the last 20 years have showed that the infants born at extreme preterms, if they have a temperature below 35 degrees, their mortality is greatly increased. Indeed, for every one degree, um, that you drop below 36 degrees on, in, on their admission to neonatal units, the mortality goes up by around about a third. So the effects of getting cold cannot be underestimated. And it's a really crucial uh, thing for us to focus on um, at all deliveries, but particularly uh, for premature babies. And again, these interventions aren't something that really necessarily need to cost anything. So why do babies get cold? Well, they've got a very large surface area, so they'll have a, they'll have a, hot, a relatively big head and small body with a high surface area. Um, there'll be a lack of brown adipose tissue, so um, it, you don't really start to accumulate that fatty tissue until at, at least sort of 26 to 30 weeks gestation uh, and, and not really until much after that. They'll have very high evaporative losses, so they won't really have a, a keratinized stratum corneum so that, that the losses through their skin will be very, very high. Um, and if you lose water, you'll lose heat and you'll lose a lot of energy um, try, trying to, 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 to get back to, to normal regulation. Um, so we lose it by various mechanisms, so that'll be evaporation uh, uh, from, from um, wet skin into a low humidity cooler environment uh, through convection, um, particularly if there's open windows or doors or drafts and um, conduction if the baby's on a relatively cool, if they're born and delivered onto a cool trolley or, 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 or table and direct transfer of heat through radiation as well. So they're losing heat losses through all, all, all sources. So it's really important that we think about doing these measures. And, and, and I say these are things that are very simple to do. Um, so delivery room temperature, the World Health Organization recommends that delivery room temperature is at least 26 degrees. I appreciate we're from very different parts of the world. Uh, 26 degrees sounds very hot for us in the UK. Um, uh, so some of our mothers struggle, but we want the rooms to be nice and warm, um, free from drafts. It's closing doors and windows. Um, and not having things like fans um, in the room um, to, to avoid to avoid cooling the baby down. For any baby that's born below 32 weeks, we deliver them uh, and place after the cord has been clamped, we, we, we will put them straight into a polythene bag, uh, as you can hopefully make out from my picture there. Um, obviously feet first, and we put that bag up to the level of the shoulders and we place the baby on top of warmed towels. Um, we don't cover the baby. Ideally, we would have a radiant heat source uh, overhead, so a source above the baby that will allow them to warm up. But the important thing is hat on um, into a plastic bag on top of warm towels and ideally with a radiant heat source above as well. We're also lucky to have things called trans warmer mattresses. So there are there are products that you can get where, where, where you can you can put a, a, a warmed mattress and un, un, underneath as well, which which is shown to improve emission temperature for very low birth weight babies. But most of those interventions are relatively simple, but can make a real big difference to the outcomes uh, of preterms. So real concentration on, on delayed core clamping, optimizing conditions for the babies born, keeping them warm when they are born, and then thinking about respiratory support. And this is something that's really, I guess, changed even over my career. So there was, I, I think initially, you know, pe people thought that, that the important thing to do is get these babies out, put them onto a ventilator, give them lots of support, and that's what we need to do. And as time has moved on, we found actually that's not true. A more conservative approach is, is, what, is what's needed. Most babies, even when born premature, prem, prem, premature, 
don't need resuscitation per se, they need transition um, to, to, to breathing in room air. It's just that they're early, not that there's a physiological problem with the baby. So really the key is careful assessment and gentle support and having a fairly moderate approach to try and avoid iatrogenic or you know, doctor, doctor inflicted complications uh, for these babies. So there's a few aspects to consider with that. Um, the first is about whether we use air or oxygen to resuscitate. And again, in previous decades, uh, th there was a feeling that these babies need lots of oxygen. Surely, you know, these babies come out, they look blue, they're small, surely they need oxygen to help them. But we know now that the opposite is true and that oxygen itself can cause problems in terms of neurological outcome, in terms of um, risk of retinopathy of prematurity and, and, and blindness, and in terms of making lung disease worse. So there's, there's a focus on starting with either in air or a very small amount of oxygen. I've put some figures up there on the slide for those that, that, that want to see where they are. And realizing that, that, that babies will have relatively low saturations when they're born. This, this by the way, uh, is appropriate for both term and preterm babies. We accept that we expect the, the oxygen saturations to be low over those first few minutes of life. Um, indeed, it, it, the, the mean time to get to 80 and 90% gestation uh, saturations is seven and, and eight minutes respectively. Um, and so just being judicious in our use of oxygen to try and prevent those, uh, those long-term complications, as I've mentioned. The next consideration, so, so when we've set up whether we're going to be resuscitating or, or, or assisting this baby in oxygen air, it's thinking about what the initial breath should be. And again, there's lots of very good studies and evidence that suggest that if we overdo it with too much pressure, either from a bag of mask or if you've got them from sort of TP sort of ventilation circuits, if we give too much pressure and too much volume um, to the babies in those early few seconds and minutes of life, it can have long term consequences. Uh, on the baby. So we start with initial breaths of giving inflation breaths, you give five, five inflation breaths of two to three seconds durations each. Um, in a term baby, if you can set settings, depending on your, your setup, we, we start with uh, pressures of 30 centimetres of water over five, but in a preterm we use slightly less pressures. If that's a small bag and mask, it's just effectively squeezing it a little bit less uh, on the premature babies. So being very careful about what pressures we're using, and the other thing that we've realized has made a very big difference to babies is the early use of PEEP, again, if you've got that available. So it's not just about you know, putting babies on ventilators, it's, it's, try, it's, it's giving them positive pressure support through CPAP or, or whatever you may have. Um, that prevents alveolar collapse. It reduces the need for intubation and for later need for surfactant, which can be very important uh, in some settings. It reduces the amount of time that babies need on a ventilator and it reduces the, the risk of pneumothorax. It's very clear that if we intubate babies and ventilate them, that that in increases their risk of chronic lung disease. Now, some of the most extreme preterm babies clearly are going to need to be put on a ventilator to give them support. But we know that if we try to give them CPAP early on, even if they then go on to need ventilation afterwards, that overall the outcomes are better. Again, I've referenced two very, they're, they're, they're a little bit old now, those two studies, but they're, they're two very important papers that, that, that have set our practice over the last decade or so uh, from the um, from Colin Morley's group and also from the support trial um, in, in North America. What about those babies that, that, that do have an oxygen requirement and are struggling? So I, I, I think there's two probably major interventions that have made a difference over the last couple of decades, isn't it? One would be the use of antenatal steroids for mothers and two is probably the use of, of artificial surfactants. So we know pathologically, of course, that the, the, the reason for RDS uh, at any gestation, but certainly at the more extreme preterms is gonna be a, a, a lack of surfactant. Um, if we give surfactant, then that can reduce morbidity uh, and uh, air leaks uh, and mortality. But we know there's no benefit in giving prophylactic surfactant. So again, going back when I started my training, probably, a, well, a long time ago now, um, but a decade, 15 years ago, we would have, if we had a premature baby, almost immediately given them surfactant to try and prevent there being problems. But we now know, again, that's probably not the right thing to do. It's better to give them the PEEP, uh, the CPAP support. And if baby goes on to have an oxygen requirement, then to give them surfactant. 
again, perhaps a change, particularly over the last five years or so, but in a research setting, it's probably been longer, is can we give that surfactant by a less invasive technique? So historically, we've always had to put an endotracheal tube down um, to give the surfactant. Now we're trying to give surfactant whilst the baby stays on CPAP by inserting something similar to sort of a gastric tube or, 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 or a bass calf um, between the cords, um, giving the surfactant directly into the lungs and then taking that tube out and putting the baby back onto CPAP. So, so to try and avoid putting the baby on the ventilator at all, or at, at worst, maybe just have them on for the minimum amount of time possible and then getting back, back onto um, CPAP again. And that method of administering surfactant has um, been shown to reduce the need for mechanical ventilation and to um, reduce the risk of um, death, uh, death uh, and or chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Apologies. Oh, sorry, I've skipped a slide. Apologies. Okay, so I think that those 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 concepts of the delayed cord clamping, uh, the thermoregulation, and that real care around respiratory support in the delivery room are things that we can apply in a lot of settings. Um, hopefully, then we've in, we've got that baby through to the to the neonatal unit, and then what are the most important uh, things there? Well. For us, the, the most important thing is recognizing that early feeding is good. So again, on premature babies, um, certainly um, in the UK and Europe, there was a period where we thought it was the wrong thing to do to feed them too early, that their, that their tummies weren't quite ready, that we'd risk um, sepsis or, or NEC. So we'd put them on lines, put them on IV fluids, and, uh, and of course that's still necessary. But we now know that giving a small amount of milk right from the start is, is ideal. And that really, we really want that to be breastfed. So again, uh, we're, we're, we work in different settings, but formula feeding uh, has been quite common. We know that formula feeding is much associated with adverse outcomes of the extreme preterm baby. So early um, instigation of breastfeeding in small amounts that we then build up gradually over the first five days or so of life was, is the optimal way um, uh, to, to, get, to get these babies fed. In the meantime, starting early parental nutrition, if we can, with, with lipids, with, 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 with glucose uh, and with the various um, uh, mineral requirements that babies need, um, if that's available um, to us. Okay, just checking how I'm doing for time. I think I've got about 10 minutes left. So those are the real focuses on what we can do for a preterm baby. And then just at the end, just a couple of slides really to think about um, other ways of preventing term admissions. So there's been a lot of focus um, again in the UK recently about avoiding unnecessary uh, admissions for babies and what, and what can we do. And I think that's a whole talk in itself. And I fortunately don't think I can go through all of that with you today. Um, key reasons for admission for us would be respiratory conditions, um, jaundice, uh, hypoglycemia, and complications uh, relating to perinatal asphyxia uh, and, and encephalopathic pitches in babies. Key preventative techniques, so avoiding elective cesarean sections, and again, that might well be different um, for it, depending on what settings we're in, but we know that those babies that have elective cesarean sections, particularly, um, particularly uh, before 39 weeks of gestation, are more likely to run into complications That'll be because they probably haven't gone into labor and they certainly won't have been born through the birth canal. And so instance of things like transient tachypnea of the newborn, so where there's food on the lungs, instance of respiratory distress syndrome with so that late preterm having a, a relative surfactant deficiency um, and instances of, of, of things like poor feeding are much more common if we deliver these babies early. So, so where we can avoid it, we should not um, deliver babies electively uh, below 39 weeks. Uh, the second thing, uh, again, for all babies is keeping them warm. So if babies get cold, obviously for preterm babies, the complications are, are, are fairly clear. But even for term babies, cold babies are at much more risk of getting hypoglycemic. They're at risk of developing secondary surfactant deactivation and so developing respiratory problems. So again, there's a real focus on keeping these babies warm at whatever gestation they are. We can help to do that by early skin to skin and feeding them. So of course you can make sure you wrap them, put hats on, et cetera, but, but actually just having the skin to skin and feeding these babies early will help prevent a lot of those problems as well. So early feeding and temperature control will reduce your hypoglycemia, will reduce incidence of, of jaundice and will reduce incidence of respiratory distress. 
And then the final talk as well, it, the final point as well is again about supporting that transition at delivery. So we've talked about the or giving people automatically really to the premature babies, but for those term babies that are showing signs of respiratory stress as well, a lot of the time that early distress will probably be to do with with, with, with fluid on the lungs or just needing to open up and the early use of, of PEEP, if it's available to you, um, will, 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 will help prevent that. I'm not sure how well this slide, slide projects, but, but the final point I wanted to make is just about um, highlighting on the ward those babies that are starting to struggle. So these have been used in adult medicine for a long time and in A&E and, &E and, we, and in more recent years we, we, we've used um, these observation charts um, for our neonates as well. So the first thing we do is identifying risk factors that mean that babies are more likely to run into problems. So you'll see on the left hand side of the screen um, uh, risk factors that make them more likely to, to, to be at risk of sepsis and therefore might need some heightened observations to, to be able to spot that early and intervene early with antibiotics when necessary. Um, risk factors for hypoglycemia, so as well as being um, growth restricted or premature, um, mom, mothers that have got diabetes or that, have, that are on certain types of medications will put them at more risk. Um, and babies that are, that are at risk of having um, consequence of perinatal asphyxia. So again, you might not have uh, access to things like cord uh, gases, but those babies that have had low APGAR scores or needed resuscitation would obviously require uh, a little bit more more monitoring and then we just have an alert system really so so so, so, so recording observations at at uh, predefined intervals with those babies that are scoring in the ambers or in the red zones prompting uh, for an escalation to have a review from uh, either senior midwife or a doctor to see if we can stop stop these things happening early and often early intervention um, prevents escalation uh, for to neonatal intensive care. So in summary then, um, to leave myself a few minutes for, for some questions and answers, um, I think the, 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 the patterns of the extremes of viability are changing, certainly in the developed world. And we've moved from a situation where, you know, at the start of my career, you know, 25 weeks was the lowest that we would go to, to gradually creeping down. And now survival is possible uh, at 22 weeks gestation. And there's a real move towards focusing on how we can optimize the long-term outcomes of these babies as well. So it's not just about survival, it's about good quality of life and, and reducing, um, reducing long-term complications such as chronic lung disease and neurological impairments. Um, and we, we know that in order to do that, um, that antenatal care and that early delivery management in the first few minutes of life is, is vital. Globally, of course, premature birth and early neonatal death remains a significant challenge, which, which I don't need to, to spell out to, 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 to you all. Uh, but many of the advancements we've found over recent years focus on what I think are relatively simple strategies. Um, so those perinatal optimization, delivering the baby in the, the highest level of care that, that is possible, steroids that we could administer to mother, and the thermoregulation techniques, which are in general free um, and cost effective and make probably one of the, the biggest single difference to what we can do in the delivery room, delaying the cord clamping to, to allow that stabilization physiologically, as I've said, and a, and a real focus on trying to provide good quality non-invasive ventilation rather than having to, 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 to think that we need to jump down to, to ventilating these babies and, not, and offering um, more, more advanced intensive care. Uh, and, and as I've said, finally, just thinking about strategies to prevent those unnecessary term admissions uh, and separation of, of families and babies. I think that is all of my slides. So um, thank you very much. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour through neonatology. Uh, I appreciate um, it's something we could talk about for a whole conferences itself. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions and I'll leave my contact details as well there for anybody that wants to get in touch with me for further information about any of the things I've covered for today. Uh, thanks once again for inviting me. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ian, for that in-depth presentation on neonatal challenges and the future direction. So we will take some questions now from the audience. And if we have any on the online platform as well, we will do that. Thank you very much, Dr. Ian, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm really glad that um, you touch on this area 
Um, I'm, I'm one of your students um, currently uh, doing the mini-anatology course. Um, so the question I have is no doubt that um, in developing countries like ours, um, we still need um, tremendous effort to make sure uh, we reduce the, um, the neonatal mortality rate. So, um, but my focus and question will be uh, what I want to ask, um, especially concerning the thermal regulation. Um, we are in, in our countries, uh, we spend a lot of time and effort in trying to um, transport some of these neonates, especially preterms, to more specialized cares. Um, um, so um, the transportation is also always an issue. But um, you came up with, um, talk about some simple strategies that can be used um, by using polythene bags. So what I want to ask is, um, do we have special polythene bags or we can improvise um, any of um, these polythene bags to transport them? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. So, 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 so it, and, and it's nice to have somebody on, on the course here as well. So thank you. Um, it's, we do have specialized bags, but if I'm honest, it's one of those things that probably you don't need to be paying much for. So, so, so in the absence of them, so for example, if our paramedics went out to a, a lady that's delivered at home prematurely, they would just use whatever plastic bags they can get. So um, we have food bags <laughs> um, or even, or even, you know, carrier bags, you know, that you would have sort of like from a supermarket type thing. So, 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 so any form of plastic bag would be helpful because what, what it's doing is, is helping to prevent the, the trans epidermal water losses and keeping the humidity relatively high around the baby. So, so it doesn't have to be anything specialized. No, you can improvise with what, whatever you have. Um, the, 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 so, so the two or three best measures really are, you know, one, getting a hat onto the baby, two, hopefully having some warm towels or warm surface underneath the baby um, and then putting the and having the baby wrapped in that, that, that bag. We don't dry the baby when they're born. Sorry, that I'm not sure if I said that on my slide, but just to be really clear, when they come out, they'll still be wet. You do not dry them. You put them straight into that bag. And it can be an improvised one, as you said, and then put them onto the warm towel. So, so the idea is that by reducing the fluid loss and the evaporative losses, that's how you're that's how you're 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 maintaining your temperature on those babies. And we keep them in that until we've got them to the neonatal unit, and we've got them in a nice warm incubator uh, with some humidity, and then we can take them out. So yeah, so it's 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 to reduce water losses. So so whatever you have is fine. We probably get charged money because people like to make money from things, but you can uh, you you don't have to have specialized equipment now. Any other question? Um, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Morris. Um, my question deals with the global issues of um, um, that you mentioned. The first one, you mentioned hydration, nutrition, and drug delivery. I think you touched a bit about the drug delivery um, when you're talking about the surfactant, and then um, the hydration, no, sorry, the nutrition, you mentioned early feeding as well. But I didn't catch much about the hydration. When you talk about hydration being a global issue, are you talking about how we um, hydrate the patient, the sorry, the neonate um, intravenously, or you're talking about in general, everything, fluid losses, fluid um, balances. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. And, and apologies again, I think that, that's, uh, that's probably easily 40 minutes or more I could talk just about hydration. So it depends on the setting. So I think that the, the, the most simple thing would be, would be the, the most common reason would be term babies who you can't hydrate if there's no access to, to breast milk for whatever reason, if mum's unable to. Um, but for premature babies, you're right. It's it's about the losses. So so we know if you're born, for example, at let's pick somebody like 26 weeks gestation, the amount of fluid that that baby loses if they're not in a in a, in a warm humidified environment will be something like 100 um, to 120 mils per kilo per day. And of course to start with and so you need to provide that with hydration and whilst we want to feed, feed early uh, we know that dehydration can be quite a problem if they get dehydrated they'll become hyperglycemic they'll become polyuric they'll go into sort of a catabolic state and an acidotic state and these are the babies that tend to do quite poorly so fluid management so, 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 so three things are really key thermoregulation as we mentioned respiratory support of course but fluid management is is really challenging actually and, and 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 probably as important as the the respiratory support but people tend to focus less on the, the hydration and more on the respiratory and actually you need to do both so yeah it's about sort of being able to get good 
um, replacement for, for what will be quite big losses because of the lack of stratum corneum and because of the um, the, the difficulty in, in temperature regulation for the preterms. For the older ones, it's really about sort of access to feeds uh, for those babies where, where mums are unable to produce milk and, and, and things. So, so, so on a global position in some countries, that can be that can be rather a big challenge, of course. We won't have access to donor milk. It won't necessarily be access to formula milk. Uh, and things like being able to buy IV fluids won't always be so easy either. Um, yeah, so, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. I, again, I think we could probably talk for hours about fluid management, uh, and we do on my course. Um, so, so yeah, but th th those are probably the key things I would I would point out. All right, thank you. Um, I think when you were talking about preventing the hypothermia, um, the drift I got was that you don't want anything less than 36 degrees Celsius. I just want to know whether you have um, an upper limit like i mean as we are getting the baby warm is there a ceiling that we shouldn't also go beyond and what is it thank you okay i'm glad you've asked that question because forgive me if my slides misleading the temperature should be maintained in the normal range so i don't want the baby below 36.5 um but that, that that point on the slide was quoting some evidence that showed what the outcomes were when you drop below 36 but but you don't want the temperature to drop at all so the normal range should be exactly as it is for everybody else so 36.5 to 37.5 um, that, that's what you should be aiming for. You are right to point out that if a baby gets too hot, that also can be detrimental, uh, both in terms of you know, tachycardia, um, fluid losses and um, neurological impact as well. So you just need to make, I say just, it's tricky to do. You need to maintain a normal temperature of between 36.5 degrees and 37.5 degrees. Um, we, uh, we now, um, we, we, we measure we measure regularly the temperature even in delivery room, we measure the temperature of the baby when we get to 10 minutes we measure the temperature of the baby when the baby's admitted to the neonatal unit we measure the temperature it, it we, we're constantly looking to this to make sure that we get it in that right range but no 36.5 to 37.5 i.e a normal temperature um that you would have for any age group one more question before we will take a leave of you dr ian Thank you so much, Doctor, for the presentation. I'm Dr. Sam Rutare from Rwanda, Kigali University Teaching Hospital. Uh, we've not been used to giving magnesium sulfate to mothers who are to deliver preterm, only to those with preeclampsia and eclampsia. I wonder whether we, we could start giving to magnesium sulfate to every mother who, who is at high risk of delivering prematurely. Number two, uh, particularly to this mother with eclampsia or preeclampsia, uh, there has been, uh, I don't know whether you can call it a war between the pediatricians and the obstetricians. They want to deliver at 37 weeks of gestation. They are worried of continuing up to 39. And you, you are telling us to avoid elective C-sections before 39 weeks of gestation. So how, how have you been working with the obstetricians there so that you continue up to 39 weeks of gestation uh, without having the C-section done? Thank you. <laughs> That's a very, a very astute point. Um, so... Um, we have to work very close to the obstetricians, as you can imagine. And there's a slight difference in there. It's that the obstetricians, quite rightly, their focus is has to first and foremost be on the mother. Um, the baby obviously is very, very important, but the focus has to be on the mother and the safety for her. Um, my focus on neonatologists, not surprisingly, is the longer you can leave this baby there before you deliver them, the better. That generally is a, is a good thing to do. Um, the the what we know is if we deliver below 39 weeks that it increases the risk of admission for the baby and it increases the risks that i mentioned you know hypoglycemia respiratory distress etc clearly though that has to be a balance so if if the risk to mum's health is high then that's fine um you know i will have a chat with the obstetrician and they will say you know we need to deliver this mum now that the, the, the preeclampsia is too much if we don't deliver we're worried about her health Likewise, if the preeclampsia is that bad, it probably starts to compromise the health of the baby anyway. So, so the baby will probably have stopped growing um, and will run, it, run, run, run into potential 
issues and you'll have an increased risk of, of induced death. So, so, so it's a risk benefit balance, isn't it? It's a, it's a two way conversation between the obstetricians and the neonatologists. At the end of the day, if the obstetrician says that they need to deliver this baby now because of the risk to, to mum or the risk to baby, then they have to. I guess what I'm saying is, and perhaps this is less of an issue for countries like Rwanda, in the United Kingdom, we, we have more requests sometimes from mothers to electively deliver by cesarean section for no real reason other than that's what they want to do. Um, uh, if we're going to do that, then we should really wait till 39 weeks. I guess that's the important thing I would say. But if there's a threat to mum or baby, then by all means, um, go with the obstetrician. I will personally never argue with an obstetrician. If they want to deliver the baby, I'll say, you go ahead, That you, you, you do what's what's necessary. So that's that point. Um, the point about magnesium, yeah, it's it's, it's an interesting one. So, so 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 I think that's really how we found it. Really, so so so, so yes, you, you're absolutely right. The magnesium is typically given for preeclampsia, but we found that those mothers that had magnesium given, the outcomes from a um, neurodevelopmental and specifically around cerebral palsy, uh, was lower for where, where we could give magnesium to, to 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 those that were delivering prematurely. So that is now a standard practice and it's one of our main um, audit points um, within the UK to ensure that mums where, where preterm delivery is threatened, they can get that. Now you don't want to just waste it and you don't want to give it out. You, you need to give it ideally four hours before delivery. So I think as is always the real problem, it's predicting which of those women that come in with threat and preterm labour are going to go on to deliver. But where, where you think there's a strong possibility of a, of a preterm labour, then the current evidence suggests that giving magnesium is helpful. I would say it's much less important than the steroids, but, um, but, but if you have access to it, it is, it is something that does help. And it's one of our main four things, uh, as I highlighted on the slides. Again, I hope that answers the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ian. It's been wonderful <laughs> listening to you. And we are very happy you made the time to be with us today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I'm going to talk about recognition of sepsis on the wards and uh, how can we establish the links in the chain of improvement. Um, we have been talking about the chain of survival when we are talking about uh, resuscitation um, and sepsis being a medical emergency uh, does need um, this chain of improvement. We are not as pressed for time as we are in resuscitation, uh, so I, I would like to coin it as improvement rather than just survival. Um, I've got no conflict of interest to, to disclose, uh, but I would like to acknowledge the help of the Welsh Intensive Care Society um, and the Fiona uh, Elizabeth Agnew Trust, uh, who has supported uh, some of the work which is going to be presented here. So what is the problem? Well, sepsis, as I said, is a medical emergency and it needs prompt treatment uh, and recognition first before you can you can do the, the the treatment but there is not a perfect method to categorize the patients who are having sepsis or not um, and there are multiple initiatives for sepsis with different goals and i think it's really important to acknowledge that uh, some of the definitions that uh, that we are going to talk about uh, had slightly different goals uh, compared to just the clinician at the bedside so obviously, the, uh, the, one of the main purpose uh, of a sepsis definition is to improve clinical care and, uh, and improve the, the, the patient's care at the bedside. One of another important one is research, because if we can't uh, do research on this topic, then, then we will not be able to progress the field. Um, we've got uh, another uh, purpose for surveillance uh, to understand that that uh, what is happening in the hospitals and also for quality improvement and audit. So we can we can have a look at what is happening, how we are doing, is our sepsis care uh, better? How can we improve it? So it was it's not five, it's now uh, over six years ago. Um, that uh, the, the third international consensus definition for sepsis and septic shock has been published in, in JAMA. Um, and this paper has been cited a lot more than, uh, than 473 times now. Um, 
and it has changed our thinking uh, about sepsis. So what the authors here describe is that sepsis is a medical emergency and sepsis uh, can be described or, and should be described um, as a um, dysfunctional, dysregulated inflammatory response uh, to infection, which is causing organ dysfunction. And all these words are very important because, because this definition was uh, A, to try to aid clinical care, because if a patient has got organ dysfunction as a result of a dysregulated host response, then, then they need uh, timely intervention. But also it, uh, it has the aim to improve research because we know that the, that that uh, the inflammatory response, if it is not dysregulated, but it is regulated and it, it's going uh, the way it should be, then we might not need to intervene um, with drugs, um, etc. So it had a, a dual purpose, and uh, as I said, sepsis is defined now as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to infection. Um, it has been criticised quite rightly, because most of the work which was underpinning this, um, this sepsis definition was carried out in the, in the developed countries, mainly in Germany, uh, partly in, in the UK, and most of, most of the, the work was done in, in the US. So um, if, you, if you look at the, um, the, the, the cases, the hospital cases of sepsis that we are um, having every year, then there is quite a lot of data on the surveillance uh, in, the, in the developed countries. And you can see that in the last decade, the, the sepsis numbers have gone up quite significantly, almost doubled um, in, in these developed countries. But we are not sure um, or less well informed at what is going on uh, everywhere in the world. Um, again, this, um, uh, this paper is just describing uh, a, a trend in the high-income countries where sepsis and severe sepsis numbers are going up but interestingly the the mortality uh, of these conditions stayed um, relatively the same so it, it, there is a question that that are we just uh, badging different cases um, with with sepsis what is the right definition so uh, i'm a big fan of hard rock and, and heavy metal and i i have been on, on this concert in 2016 um, uh, watching Guns N' Roses in, in London. And uh, that's where I thought that the, the motto of the tour was really up because there is, is there a perfect sepsis definition? When you think about the four uh, broad uh, aspects, I don't think that there will be uh, a perfect definition, not in this lifetime. So we will need to um, narrow the scope a little bit and, and see that what can we do uh, and what can we do at the bedside? Because that's where that's where I work, and that is that is what is what is uh, interesting uh, to most clinicians. Now, when you you put together uh, the criteria for sepsis, uh, and you look at the different papers and uh, and and uh, the different uh, thought leaders, then these this is the um, sort of word uh, word art uh, where you where you put everything in one slide. And then you can see that the words which are standing out are infection, criteria, uh, and clinical, and organ dysfunction. So those are the, those are the, the, the words that, that are important for the clinicians. So that's what we should be uh, really looking at. Um, when you look at the, the sepsis definitions and the sepsis criteria which have been developed, it is a real jungle. Uh, and, and you can have real fun and games there and then you can have a look at what is happening. Um, and there is no uh, true criteria. And that is probably the, the most important message of this talk uh, in the middle of this talk that, that we don't have a perfect criteria. We've got good enough, uh, but definitely not perfect. So. The, um, the sepsis definition uh, consensus uh, conference uh, 
uh, was trying to come up with a clinical criteria for sepsis. Uh, and as I said, it has been very heavily criticized because it was mostly working on uh, data from the high income countries and a, from, from uh, institutions who have got a well-established uh, uh, electronic health record. And they come up with the uh, idea of the Q sofa, the, the quick sofa, which it was looking at hypertension, altered mental status, and tahipnea. And when they looked at that, that, that data, then they found that, that it was quite sensitive in their data set. Um, and the very simplistic uh, determination, uh, and unfortunately the take home message, the very simplistic take home message that, that many people had from, from this publication was that if the Q so far is equal or greater than two, then that is sepsis. Now, actually it's not, and that, that wasn't what the, what the authors, uh, authors actually said, because they, uh, they, they had a look and they said that if the Q so far is not that high, but sepsis is still suspected, then you have to look further and assess for evidence of organ dysfunction. Um, if you don't suspect sepsis because the patient has got no sign of infection or they've got another pathology, then, then monitor the clinical condition and then reevaluate. Um, and then if you assess for organ dysfunction, then the correct and currently best way to look at it is to do a full SOFA score. Um, and if it is not great, uh, greater than two, uh, then just monitor the clinical condition and, and re-evaluate frequently. And I think this is the other key point uh, of my talk that we have to re-evaluate and we have to, to go back to that patient and, and re-look at what is happening because you will not be able to spot that one moment when you are at the bedside, you need to do it uh, as, a, as a continuous fashion. So this created a lot of controversy and it, uh, it took us down to, to Paradise City where uh, the, the grass is green and the girls are pretty, but we didn't know what sepsis was and we didn't even know what sepsis was in our, in our own institution uh, in the Welsh NHS. So with the help of excellent medical students and uh, uh, a lot of my colleagues in the different hospitals, we have started to build up a program and we, we wanted to have a look um, what is the prevalence, the point prevalence of, of sepsis and how it was screened and how the sepsis six delivery uh, was uh, was done. And we found in, in four hospitals that, that uh, it was really haphazard. And we concluded that we can't really drive the improvement if we don't know the problem, but we still didn't know what, what was the size of the problem. So we embarked on this program of work um, and we developed a digital data collection platform that, that we have been using. Um, and we have invited and involved uh, every hospital in Wales to, to have the point prevalence of, uh, of sepsis. And, the first uh, um, yearly now annual sepsis study uh, was done in 2016. Um, and we, we looked at patients who had a national early warning score three or above, and they had a documented clinical suspicion of infection by the parent team. And it's really important to, to emphasize that, that we, we had to have this clinical suspicion of infection because you can only have sepsis if you've got a dysregulated host response to infection. Um, and we only wanted to look at uh, patients who are outside of the ICU because we've got a lot, uh, lot more robust data uh, on the intensive care units. And then we, we repeated this, uh, this study actually every four years. So uh, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Um, and uh, in, in these studies, uh, we recruited uh, a large number of, uh, of patients. So we, we screened uh, over 20, 26, almost 27,000 patients. Um, and uh, most of them were inpatients and about one, uh, one fifth were, were in ED. Um, but the eligible patient numbers were, were uh, around 1900 uh, over the, the four years. Uh, we had 
quite a few who refused consent to, for for data collection, um, and then we we followed them up all uh, up the up till thirty days and. Uh, uh, a large proportion of those up till 90 days to uh, assess their uh, their outcomes. And we looked at very different criteria and we looked at very different ways of, of, of trying to establish whether the patient has got sepsis. Um, first, we used the, the SERS criteria, which were developed before uh, the third, uh, third definition of, uh, of sepsis. Um, and the reason why we use that, because all the official uh, sepsis screening tools were based on the SERS criteria. Those of you who don't know uh, the SERS, SERS criteria, it, it looks at uh, respiratory rate, it, it looks at uh, temperature, it looks at leukocyte count. Um, and it, it is trying to put together whether there is an inflammatory response. And if there is a clinical suspicion of infection, then then if you've got two or more signs of this inflammatory response, then, then it, is, it is likely to be sepsis. Then we looked at the SOFA score, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The, the, the third uh, consensus definition for sepsis uses the SOFA score as the sort of gold standard um, scoring system to see if a patient has got an organ dysfunction, but it has got its own, own drawbacks and, and issues. And then we looked at also a score which was developed by uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, uh, which was quite a complicated one, to be, to be extremely honest. And we looked at whether, whether this high score uh, is useful to, to detect sepsis. And then we also used the red flag uh, score that you might have heard about, which uh, which has been uh, developed by the UK Sepsis Trust and and has been promoted quite widely um, as uh, as a good screening tool for for sepsis. On this diagram, you can see that only twelve percent of our patients met all of the criteria, and interestingly, seven percent of the of the patients where there was a clinical suspicion of infection and they had a highish new score, so they were systemically unwell, they never met any of the criteria. Um, and and it, it, is, it, it, it was really telling that, that none, of these, um, none of these scoring tools that, that we use in clinical practice uh, or have been promoted to be used in clinical practice are actually any good to, to determine whether the patient has got sepsis or, or not. Um, and this is just a different um, uh, depiction of, of the same data. So you can see on the, these bar charts that what are the combinations that we have seen um, on the different sepsis uh, criteria. Uh, and, and I think it is, it is telling that you can, you can say that the red flag was really, really sensitive because it picked up a lot of patients. Um, but is it specific enough? And that, that, that is a big question. So we looked at um, the 90-day the outcome uh, of, of these patients, and we looked at whether um, if they had SERS criteria, um, they, they had more than two, two, or, sorry, two or more SERS criteria, whether they had a worse outcome. And then on, on, on this uh, um, slide, you can see that, yes, unfortunately, they had worse outcome. This worse outcome was even more pronounced when we were looking at the SOFA score uh, of two or above. Um, and what we have also seen is that the, the high risk patients um, looking at the, the NICE criteria, they also had a worse outcome at 90 days. Interestingly, in the the patients who, who were scored positive for red flag or didn't score positive for red flag, they had ac actually completely identical outcomes at, at 90 days. So it tells us that the red flag um, is definitely not something that we should be using um, as a, a prognostic tool. Now, we looked at other statistical tests, and then you can you can see that what predicts 90-day mortality. Um, if I'm quite honest, um, then none of these uh, tools predict 90-day um, mortality particularly well. Um, they are slightly better uh, than flipping a coin. So 
we probably shouldn't use any of these to try to predict outcome. But can we use any of those to, to, to see if a patient has got sepsis? Um, the SOFA score has been criticized quite, quite a lot, uh, especially from colleagues in the uh, lower and, and middle income countries, because to calculate the SOFA score, you, you need to have quite a lot of um, laboratory data available. Uh, and in, in our setting um, in the UK, um, in the patients who were on the ward, you can see that there were a lot of missing values, mostly uh, bilirubin, uh, which was not routinely measured in um, on, on the wards. And interestingly, although lactate has been pushed as a, as a marker of, of severity in sepsis, um, 66% of, of these patients who had clinical suspicion of infection, they have been unwell. Uh, they, um, they, had a, um, they didn't have lactate measured, uh, which, is, which was, was really interesting. What we, what we tried to do, and we, we tried to, to had, a, had a look at it on our data, is that, yes, so far is difficult to obtain um, and you need laboratory, uh, laboratory results. Is there an, an other way to, to try to pinpoint the patients who, who have got a high risk of organ dysfunction? And what we found is that if we look at the SpO2, so the, the saturation and FiO2 ratio, um, and we look at the mean arterial pressure, um, and the mean arterial pressure was dichotomized at, at uh, below or above uh, 65, uh, then we actually caught 85% of the patients who had a SOFA score of uh, two or greater. So it is possible that you can just use clinical parameters and, and have a, a sense of the degree of organ dysfunction, the degree of risk that these, these patients are, are having who have got a clinical suspicion of infection. Um, so, you know, there are there are different pathways um, and there are there are different uh, uh, different ways to to try to to make the organizational response more robust to to this medical emergency uh, and, and the real question is that it is likely that we are going back to very simple tools and giving the clinicians uh, a lot more uh, freedom and use their clinical acumen to, to diagnose uh, this condition. Um, and if we, if we look at elevated new scores, then somebody with a clinical knowledge will need to evaluate the, uh, uh, the patient. And, and that's where we could use simple tools like the SpO to FiO2 ratio and, uh, and the low mean arterial pressure, uh, which is available at the bedside. And, put the patient into that high risk category where we need to uh, improve our care and where we need to go back later on and, uh, and establish whether the patient has got sepsis, are they improving or what, what is happening? So one of the proposals that we, we have put together is that if a patient has got a, um, a slightly higher new score, uh, but not too high, so less than, less than six, uh, then those patients who have got a clinical suspicion of infection, uh, we should start the formal sepsis screening, start the SOFA scoring, send the bloods, do the uh, measure the mean arterial pressure, uh, measure measure the conscious level, and measure the um, the SpO two FiO two uh, ratio, which is a simple simple thing to do, um, and consider your medical review and the critical care referral. If your patient is in the high risk category, then uh, um, then you should you should start thinking about giving some treatment. And what treatment it can be? Um, we have uh, conceptualized uh, sepsis six, and we, we looked at it in in our data set, and it is very clear um, that the uh, that the the sepsis six bundle as such um, the completion was very low even in those patients who scored high news, they scored positive for a, a multiple of, uh, um, of sepsis tools. So we might need to tweak that a little bit because again, since 
2016, we have learned a lot about uh, what is what is really working and what might can wait uh, in in sepsis. Um, again, it is just depicting the the data that we had that we only had 14% uh, of all the six components completed, and uh, you can see that a lot of patients had oxygen. Quite a few patients had uh, had IV fluids, um, and antibiotics were given, but. Sometimes antibiotics were given just on their own um, in patients where, where somebody suspected that they, they've got a severe infection, which is um, probably not the, not the right, right approach. And again, we looked at that. Is it just the patients who are appearing less sick? Those are the ones where, where the sepsis 6 are, are not completed. But unfortunately, what we have found that across the, the, the four years, there was no change in, in, uh, in, the, in the performance. And there were a lot of patients who had very high new scores and very low completion rate uh, of, of sepsis 6. So um, going back to what, uh, what we are trying to propose and trying to improve the, the care is that if you've got a a patient who has got uh, news uh, three or above and the clinical suspicion of infection, then start measuring and start monitoring. But is it is it sepsis? You can start with simple things, as I said, with the mean arterial pressure, SpO2, FiO2. But to, to detect infection, to detect organ dysfunction, you will need to uh, make further steps. So send those bloods. Uh, look at and try to calculate uh, the full SOFA score. Um, and if you've got uh, a high risk patient, then start administering the sepsis 6. In that case, do involve a senior, senior medical review and, and, and do involve another person to, to review that patient. Um, and we know that, that the biggest killer in sepsis is septic shock, uh, which is... Um, which is characterized by, uh, by uh, hypotension, which is uh, not reacting to, to fluid resuscitation. So those patients will need a rapid response uh, to, to their condition. Those are the patients who will need uh, um, uh, antibiotics given very early because they are, uh, they are at highest risk of, of death. Now, if you... If you do this, that means that you have gone back to your patient because those bloods will not magically appear. They will take time and they will, uh, you know, you, you need to go back and, and review the patient. And in, in that case, you can actually go back and assess the response. And this is what has been lacking for many of our, um, our patients. And this is what, what we are trying to improve is to the go back and assess the response to the treatment. Um, if a patient obviously is in is in uh, septic shock, they've got hypertension. Then, then that will be obvious on on very simple uh, measurements, and they need an immediate and or very very urgent senior medical review and a and a critical care referral. So, um, I think what I would like to to summarize as a, as a take home message is that sepsis is a medical emergency. There is no perfect tool for, uh, for detecting sepsis. We can use very simple physiological parameters to put patients in the high risk category, but nothing will, uh, will replace the clinician at the bedside who is evaluating the patient, starts treatment, and then goes back to re-evaluate the patient and see whether that treatment is, is the right one and if, if it is effective. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions if, uh, if there are any either from the audience or uh, from the online participants. I, that, Thomas, are you hearing us? Yes, now I can. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, yes. Yeah. So I was asking about, um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very insightful. I was asking about a role of procalcitonin in as a sepsis marker in your setting. Um, we use it, but I just wanted to know, find out what um, role it plays with your sepsis in your 
um, in your ICU in that's in Cardiff. And then also I'd like to ask, um, I'm more familiar with the PAO2, FIO2 ratio as um, a marker. I saw you mentioned the SPO2, FIO2 um, ratio, and I know that there's a correlation. I know it's been demonstrated that um, a PA, PF ratio of 300 is about um, a, PA, a SPO, SF ratio of about 315. So, but we use it to determine ARDS and um, acute lung injury. So what are your cutoffs um, at, we are looking out for when it comes to sepsis? So those are my two questions. Uh, thank you very much. They are um, they are very um, very insightful questions. Um, procalcitonin. Um, I could talk days about procalcitonin. Um, it, it's we thought in the late 1990s when when it when it came to to four that that will be uh, very helpful in determining whether the patient has got sepsis or not. Um, I think when you put everything together all the uh, all the information uh, we cannot use procalcitonin as a as a rule in marker for sepsis we know that if procalcitonin is low then bacterial infection is very unlikely but sepsis can be caused by other pathogens than than bacteria so um, you know the covid-19 pandemic is a, ca a case in hand uh, that that caused a, a very significant viral viral sepsis pct was low uh, in in uh, in those patients so unfortunately procalcitonin as a marker of sepsis is not uh, not that helpful um, if it's very high, then yes, it is very likely that the patient has got a severe bacterial infection. Um, but uh, but there are very it is difficult to give you give you cutoff values. It's much more useful to see um, to use it as a as a marker of uh, antimicrobial uh, effectivity. If the PCT is halving after you have given antibiotics, then you, you've got a good indicator um, that um, that your antibiotic is actually effective uh, against the, 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 the bacteria that you are treating. Um, but again, that is just for bacterial infection. The, the second question about the SPO2 and the FIO2, SPO2 uh, 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 ratio, the the original uh, SOFA score um, is using the, the PAO to FIO to ratio uh, to determine organ dysfunction in the respiratory system. Um, and, uh, and you are right that we are using the PAO to FIO to ratio to, to look at whether the patient uh, is severely hypoxemic and uh, whether that is, that is fulfilling um, other ARDS criteria. Um, the SPO2, uh, FIO2 ratio, uh, if it is below 400, then we have seen that that, that will be a, a very good correlation with uh, a significant oxygen requirement, i.e. organ dysfunction of the respiratory system. Okay, we will take a final question for Professor Thomas. Thank you so much, Professor, for the nice presentation. I thought you were going to give us just the exact science that you'll be looking for when you are suspecting sepsis. But now we are again left in suspense. <laughs> yeah, which is also good. Uh, I would like you to comment on fluid management. Uh, when you look at the updated management of uh, sepsis and septic shock uh, and again look at these other studies done on African continent especially the FIST trial that was done in Kenya and then uh, that was in children uh, and again this other one done in Zambia you see that when you give fruits within the first one hour uh, at 30 meals per kg the rate of mortality case fatality rate is higher to those ones who are given fruits within that one hour compared to these ones who are given longer, maybe for six hours. But again, the guideline still continues to insist on 30 mules per kg. 
within the first one hour or three hours. What is this your take on that? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Again, it, it's a very, very topical, um, topical question. Um, I think the the guidelines which are suggesting that you you give 30 mil per kg uh, fluid bolus um, they they whilst they are suggesting that and there is some data uh, behind that they have been quite careful to say that this is this this is not a mandate and uh, and some of the the data from the us where where they have mandated it shows that uh, even in the high income countries, it, it might not be the, the, the best way forward. Um, I would like to uh, caution anybody to give large doses of, of fluids um, outside of, uh, of, of a randomized control trial, really, um, and outside of a well monitored area. Uh, because we know that uh, that not judicious fluid resuscitation will cause more harm than uh, than good. So in my practice, yes, I give fluid, but I I give small boluses and I reevaluate frequently. My professor, and it's been wonderful having you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So once again, good afternoon, everybody. I am. Uh... Dr. Hilary Yuman from Liberia, I'll be your uh, next modulator. So we now move on to the section on panel discussion. We've already, we've already had an insightful experience from professors and other top colleagues that have taught us on different topics. Now we're gonna give our various experiences and how we, we've used the knowledge learned to impact our society. So we're gonna have these panelists. We'll start with Dr. Awa Tonkwara, she is a medical doctor. She's from the Gambia. She works at the Prikama District Hospital. And uh, we then look at Dr. Colin Yatsambo. Uh, he's one of our Merck's alumni, and he's from the Zim Zimbabwe. He's a district medical officer. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim S. Hubala, a specialist physician from Sierra Leone, my neighbor. <laughs> And uh, I can go in and out weekends and see him and the other team. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Solisi Nguenya, a targeted screening for active TB technici technical lead from the Zimbabwe. Uh, your humble servant, Dr. Hilary Yuma from Liberia. Dr. Lori Injolzi, specialist pediatrician from Namibia. You know, they had a good presentation yesterday and she did another one today. So. <laughs> uh, Dr. Gorata Kuda, witness, a medical doctor from Botswana. Dr. Awota Kanika, a chest physician from Mauritius. She also had an impactful experience here with us just moments ago. She had brilliant knowledge and classical case that is very rare to see the, the calothorax in the child nine years old with TB. She did brilliantly just now. And Dr. Emmanuel Steve Blankson an emergency physician from the Ghana and uh, another alumna of Merck's foundation. So to commence, we'll now call on Dr. Awatun Kara. She's gonna be doing a presentation on uh, what are the challenges relevant to her specialty? How, do she, how did she intend or how does she intend to address them in her community? How was the Merck Foundation training helpful in her practice during the time and up until now? So we can now call on Dr. Awatonkara to come and take the stage. So uh, shortly, I was just informed that our panelists will come up here and sit before the crowd and then we'll give a presentation. All right, so just two minutes and then we'll call you guys up. So in orderly fashion, we're going to reintroduce everybody. And we'll start with Dr. Ewa Tunkara, medical doctor from the Gambia. You can come and have your seat. I think we'll start from there. Uh, Dr. Colin Yatsambo from Zimbabwe. Dr. Ibrahim S. Habdullah. Habdullah, sorry. Hubala. Hubala. Yes, 
Thank you. <laughs> and Dr. Gwenya. Gwenya. So the extra seat will be for me. Dr. Lorraine. Dr. Gorata. Dr. Awota. And Dr. Blackson. Blankson. So our first speaker is Dr. Awatunkara, and she's going to be discussing on how to, how according to, sorry, what are the challenges she's faced with her specialty, how she intends addressing them in her community, and how has the MEC Foundation helped in you managing this? Thank you very much, Dr. Hillary, for that introduction. I think the topic is not only for me, which is the challenges in healthcare that we are facing in Africa, and how is Mark Foundation, um, the effort that is making in helping us to overcome those challenges. I believe that's the topic that we all have. So, um, it says in Africa, but, uh, thank you. It says in Africa, but I'll be focusing more in the Gambia. That's where I actually practice. So when I was given the topic, I was like, wow, where do I start from <laughs> about these challenges that I am facing in this small hospital that we have here that is outside the teaching hospital, the only teaching hospital that we have. And I start listing, and I'm like, this is a never-ending list. All I have to do is try to find one or two things to focus on. But honestly, if I want to start naming all the challenges that we have, we will be here till tomorrow. So um, we'll start with a map of the Gambia. I put it up there so that we will know where we are located. We tend to be confused with Zambia a lot, our sister country, but this is the Gambia, as you can see. It is a small country surrounded on all three sides by Senegal, which is a Francophone country, and the, uh, the remaining one is the Atlantic Ozone. Its population size is just barely 2.2 million, and uh, the density per square meter is about 176. You can check that through the WHO. So um, you would think that with that population size, which is sometimes only a province in some countries, that it will have a very good system in place in terms of health. But that is not the case, as we will see in the subsequent slides. So yes, the challenges that I put forward are here, OK? The first one I mentioned is a single teaching hospital in the country. Um, this is uh, the Gambia as a whole. We have only one teaching hospital, if you can imagine, and it's located at the urban area. So like my colleague, Dr. Kitabu mentioned, we in the peripherics, we have little access to this place. So that's where all the referrals comes in, and they're ref getting referrals from about five other hospitals. They are not teaching, but they're even from all of them. All over the country, this is the final destination that you're gonna go to, which I think is a major challenge in the country because it's making the place congested. Um, it's difficult to even manage all the patients. With Some of the units having a bad side of, let's say, less than 50. Maybe the best, the one with the highest will be internal medicine, but the remaining sometimes even like 35 beds. And now imagine 35 beds having to receive referrals from all over the country. This is one of the challenges. Another one is the specialized care. Um, we have a vast uh, number of doctors that is graduating every year from the University of the Gambia. But unfortunately, um, taking that other step again to go further for a specialization so that we have all this care is actually a challenge in the country. And we know medical uh, uh, education in any form, being a BSc or going over for specialization is not cheap. So it's actually very difficult for young doctors to actually transcend to that new level or the next level. This, although help is coming from the Mark Foundation, but it's still a challenge. 
most of our specialized care base is um, made of uh, foreign doctors that we were gonna that is uh, coming to the country, and some of them are from Cuba and from Nigeria. Recently, we are having, but Gambian base itself and the population of the medical doctors. The amount of uh, doctors that we have who are specialized in being in research or neonatology or internal medicine or any other field is actually very limited in the country. This, um, the third bullet point that I put was the lack of the critical care in the ICU and this one was highlighted, in fact gave us a major concern and it's one of our problems, especially when the pandemic hit because you can imagine a country with only one referral center and only, that is the only center as well with an ICU. All the other hospitals that we have in the periphery, they were not having an ICU. So we had to improvise so much. When you are not there, you need to improvise so much. And like um, my colleague said, that's one of the motivations that some of us had that we are like, okay, when the Mark Foundation scholarships came, we have to jump on it to try to see how we can save our patients. Because even before we get them to that center, it's also another time and transport was a problem. Because with the COVID, everybody was scared, like once I have it, I'm gonna die. So even sometimes you call the ambulance driver to like, help you transport, everybody's like careful. We are all worried about ourselves and our families. So this was also another challenge that I noticed. And finally, I think this is one of uh, a problem in not only the Gambia, in most African countries, which is the lack of motivation of the medical personnel in general. Some of us, like we are underpaid and we are in working in really difficult conditions. And this cause why most will decide to go over to like better countries, let's say more equipped and developed countries to practice. And this is causing the brain drain. This is why you have so many Africans will move over to Europe on, or to America to go and practice. Yesterday, the professor from Nigeria said that America's uh, health system, like the medical field, you have like, it's almost basically all made of Nigerians. So this is one of the reasons, because if I am in my country, I am being underpaid. I cannot even take care of my own family. And obviously, I'm going to move to something better. So this is one of the reasons I think is the, one of the challenges that we are facing in Africa and the Gambia Act to be precise. Next slide, please. So I was to give some solutions to those problems that I listed as well. And uh, the first one, like I said, the only teaching hospital that we have, I believe it's about time for our government to invest in the health system a little bit further, and then we get another teaching hospital. This will uh, create um, more avenues for us to have better care, and obviously not only to create it, but just don't give us the structure. You need to as well equip those hospitals, because if they are not equipped as well, it means it's a mute point, then what's the point of having another one? So I believe if we can establish another teaching hospital, it will re reduce the burden that we are having in the, in the main teaching hospital in Banjul and as well help to make the referrals easier and the commute will be less because this one will not be at the urban area or at the center. It's gonna move down a little bit further to maybe a province and this will make it easier for the neighboring ones to refer there instead of to Banjul. The second one is to decentralize special care and make specialization easier. So thank you to Mark Foundation for helping with that. We have, have been, most of us here, like you know, it's helping us. We have respiratory care now, neonatology care, acute medicine and stuff. And this has been helpful in our general patient care, in our knowledge base. But I believe as well that we can go further and add some kind of practical aspect to that because the theory alone also will need some practicals to help you manage your patients better. And I think this is something that we need to look into going forward with the Mark Foundation. And also some of the, I don't know about other countries, but in the Gambia, we will have some regulations need to be put in place or as some policy need to be put in place regarding the medical and dental councils to see how they are going to adapt to this uh, new system of education and how they can integrate it into the system to recognize it as actually a specialization because there are people whom you know, they will tell you that this was an online course. It's not sufficient for you to like 
go on and practice on your own or to like to be identified as a specialist in this unit. So I believe we need to have another talk. This one is more political, but then maybe with Mark and then the governments as they are doing their bilateral relations, they can actually work on that to help us see how we can figure this out. It will really help in the, oh, the long haul and the overall run in increasing the specialized care that we will be having in the country. The third point is the, to create, obviously, equipments in the hospitals. This one we, I already mentioned, not only to create the hospitals, but also to uh, get equipments in those hospitals. So many things have been said here by some experts. I was sitting with my brother <laughs> from Liberia, Dr. Hillary, and I was like, these things they are telling me, I don't have them in my hospital, or even in some, maybe even in, not in the teaching hospital. So now imagine you are telling me I need to do let's say a preliminary function test and all the FEU, the oximeters and stuff. I don't have those things. So in the end, I'm looking like, okay, best practice, but then how am I going to do best practice? I, I don't have these things. So it's not only about creating it, but we need to try and equip those facilities as well. That's something that we are lacking, the spinal care that has been presented here by Dr. Oteno and all so many others. I've just gone through and I'm like, in fact, I feel like we are so behind when it comes to our health system. We are still trying to play catch up to when people are way further. And finally, I think uh, there should be some kind of incentive. So if we need to keep the brains inside the Gambia in general, if not, we're gonna keep losing them. We have to put on a, put a system that is more favorable. You have long, tedious hours of work, and sometimes as a junior doctor, you also face something like harassment from the consultants when you are in the teaching hospital. So all these things makes you a bit frustrated, and then you just want to leave. I think we need to look into those things, especially the system in general in West Africa. We need to work on those things to help us with the, with the, to keep the doctors in the country. Um, thank you very much. The next presenter, who is Dr. Colin Yatsambo. Uh, Dr. Colin Yatsambo is going to be presenting on this topic. What was the thought behind post-COVID clinic being opened during the pandemic? How did you go about it? <laughs> and how has training helped you cater to the patients? Thank you. That's not, the, that's not actually the presentation. <laughs> the presentation is too general on the challenges that are um, faced. Yes. So um, I, basically, I think um, Dr. Anwar has already spoken on most of the issues. Um, by way of introduction, I'm saying Africa um, in general is, uh, I think is cased with the poverty. And um, this poverty in most of the countries, or in my country in Zimbabwe, um, is anchored on unemployment. And uh, the unemployed uh, youth, or generally the people who are supposed to be in employment, are actually roaming the street. As a result, these people are getting into uh, drug abuse. They get into drug abuse, they become uh, like me me mental, uh, they, they get into mental health issues. Some of them actually commit um, crimes and uh, sexual just by, uh, sexual based uh, gender violence becomes prevalent. The other issue that Africa is cased with is the high burden of diseases, HIV, AIDS, TB, malnutrition, malaria, and uh, the so-called outbreak prone diseases, which in most of our countries are really endemic diseases like cholera, typhoid, um, Ebola, we also are burdened with the high maternal, maternal and the child mortality, uh, mainly because of lack of human resources, lack of hospitals, poor access to our hospitals. And recently, or over the past few years, we also have an increasing 
burden of non-communicable diseases, which we, we used to think they are um, diseases from the West. Rural urban migration is also a challenge, which is leading, uh, causing increased uh, demand for the few existing um, hospitals that we have and the few staff that we have uh, in, our, in, in the urban areas. We also have injuries being a big, a big burden. I think we've had a talk this morning. Um, poor road network causing a lot of RTAs. Um, injuries from human to human conflicts. I think yesterday we were discussing about what is happening in uh, DRC and Rwanda. Human wildlife conflict also causing a lot of injuries and uh, uh, morbidity. Disasters, fires, and floods. These are things that are bedeviling uh, Africa, coupled with the political instability. This pose a big burden on, on the health system and the remaining uh, health staff. Um, I think go to the, f the other slide, not this one. Hello? Next slide. No, the previous, yeah. Previous. The previous one, yeah. <clears throat> so the other issues um, material uh, resources which we, we, we have uh, as a challenge. Lack of equipment, simple diagnostic equipment we don't have in most of our clinics and hospitals. You talk of a glucometer, you talk of a BP machine, you may find a patient being referred from 100 to 150 kilometers with no BP check no weight check, no glucometer check. So these are the challenges because we, we do lack uh, resources. Um, electricity outages, these are daily date things. So you end up having problems in central hospitals, in district hospitals. When you are doing your theaters and the like, you have to have a good backup of electricity. Water challenges. Central hospitals have gone for weeks without water. And you end up having no theater cases. You end up having to discharge patients early before they are um, fully uh, taken care of. Infrastructure is a big challenge. So uh, many of our hospitals are dilapidated. And there is no routine maintenance of these things to the extent that you end up having to close certain wings, to close certain theaters uh, because of poor infrastructure. Okay, next slide. I just want to, yes, I just want to emphasize what Anwar was saying about um, human capital. This is a vicious cycle. The human uh, resources issue is a vicious cycle in, in Africa. Uh, particularly in my country, Zimbabwe, uh, right now. Like I said, our hospitals are understaffed. Um, the few that are there are overworked and bent out. And there is, uh, like what Anwar has said, poor conditions of service. Remuneration is poor. Appreciation is poor. Um, leadership is also a problem. Uh, we are being led by people who probably don't appreciate uh, what we do as um, healthcare workers. Some of them, even at a lower uh, leadership level, will try to frustrate the few, the overburdened, dedicated workers who are on the ground. As a result, a person migrates to greener pastures. Our healthcare workers um, are migrating in droves to UK, Canada, USA, Australia, and we are left with very few, probably the old like me, who 
uh, we actually need to some, somebody to uproot them to go to the, these countries. We have inadequate numbers of trained staff because the trainers have left. Uh, the training grounds have remained uh, constricted. These institutions, you know, some of, like in our country, they are very old. The new ones that are coming in are very, uh, taking only maybe uh, 20 doctors per, 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 per intake. And that is not enough. And like I said, there is a leadership problem. Some politicians think actually you need to keep training more, even when the resources, the trainers, the institutions are uh, not capacitated to do that. When actually we should be concentrating on retention of the little, of the few that we have, if we were to retain them, over 10 years, I think we have adequate numbers. Uh, next slide. I want the solutions now. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. So, solutions are basically the, the, the flip over of what I have been talking about. We need to train manpower. We need exchange problem, uh, programs or attachments so that the ones that we have who are dedicated, who are willing to work in our institutions can get some experience from other countries, other people who are having a, a, a good uh, training grounds. We need to retain our manpower. Like what Anwar said, we need to appreciate them, to remunerate them, to improve their working conditions so that they remain in the, in the countries that we have. Our budgets should probably increase, uh, probably just to the 15% according to the Abuja uh, declaration. That may actually go a long way. Uh, we need to involve the private sector in the provision of health care. Um, in a way that is not expensive for the consumer in a way where the government probably has got some shares and we can control the price. Right. Next slide. How do I do? Yeah. So, um, MEC is transformed, I think, us and the, 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 the whole of Africa in terms of giving us online learning, which has increased uh, subspeciality training and uh, fortunately in our country Zimbabwe subspeciality training is actually recognized by our uh, registration authorities so it is not a, 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 a very big problem this increased number of subspecialists means there is also increased access of our patients to quality care at the places where they stay. Hopefully, if uh, our, our professionals remain in the districts that they are uh, deployed. Um, I think there is also need, like we said, to provide innovative uh, systems where now that we have moved from subspeciality training, we can go to some form of uh, awarding the uh, subspecialists. Probably we say if somebody has been trained, uh, let's say, in fertility, then probably after a year we can say for the number of cases that we have seen and uh, done one, two, three, we can probably pay you 5% of that so that we can incentivize um, our, our, our doctors. Next slide. I think that's the end of it. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Yasu. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking up the stage and allowing me to be in this platform. My name is Dr. Hubala, and I'm coming from the beautiful west coast of Africa called Sierra Leone. Um, I was 
allocated only five minutes to do this presentation. Maximum, they said three slides, even though I cheated and I think did five slides. I believe we need five months to discuss this, not five minutes, but uh, regardless of whatever, we still have something to project. So the green, white, and blue, which you see on the slide is a reflection of the color of our flag. So um, a disclaimer is I'm not an epidemiologist or a public health specialist, neither do I hold any politically affiliated position. So I'm just projecting some of the problems which uh, occur within the healthcare system in Africa, and I believe they are generalized. So please don't hold me responsible. Next slide, please. Okay, um, we all know that uh, there are healthcare challenges globally. This does not only apply to Africa, even the West, some of the most developed countries also facing challenges within their healthcare system. However, um, in South Saharan Africa, we do know that we are faced with uh, countless challenges, uh, despite the numerous efforts and strides that have been done to improve on the healthcare system. And as healthcare providers, we all know that the primary objective of all of us is actually the delivery of uh, effective, protective, uh, healthcare service delivery to our people. Um, the problems in Africa, healthcare system are many, and this is further compounded by the increased burden of infectious diseases we have, such as TB, HIV, malaria, malnutrition, and non other non-communicable diseases. So I think most of us were given the same task. So some of these things will happen to be repeated along the presentations by uh, other colleagues. So I think the best way I looked at this presentation, next slide please. Okay, there is what we call the WHO uh, building blocks system of uh, healthcare delivery in Africa. This was developed in 2007 and they looked at six pillars which they think are the main arms uh, of which we fall short and should work on in terms of developing our health care service delivery. One is uh, human resource, the other is leadership and governance, medicines and technologies, financing, service delivery, and health information service. If I should start, I think the most important here, which some of my colleagues have already elaborated on, is the human resource and we all are geared towards human capital development. So this starts from training of healthcare workers. And if you realize I'm not only specifying on doctors, every healthcare provider in a hospital or a clinical facility is equally important. I remember a few months ago when we had our porters strike in the hospital, I can imagine the impact that had on the hospital. This clearly tells you that everyone is equally important within the system. So one is the number of training of these healthcare workers. For example, the country I come from, uh, we have a population of, what, about 8 million? But uh, we only have one medical school. And this medical school, on average, we have probably like 30 graduates maybe per annum, for a population of uh, almost eight. And there is about, WHO estimates we have about 1.4 uh, doctors per 100,000 population, which you can imagine is definitely very, very much inadequate. The other aspect is the specialty training of these doctors and other healthcare workers and then you need to equip them with the adequate skills and knowledge because most of our patients are vulnerable and sometimes they fall in front of a healthcare worker who probably is not properly equipped with the knowledge and skill to attend to that medical condition. 
we all know the levels of impersonation we have in our daily practices. Pharmacy technicians pretending to be doctors, even butchers put on white coats, some of them have been approached by patients and they give them prescriptions. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> these are real time issues which we're facing in Africa. The other aspect within the human resource is, apart from training them, apart from specializing them, is the attitude of these healthcare professionals. Okay, this is another whole long topic. And then if you have succeeded in doing that, the other big problem is retaining them, as some of my peers have mentioned, the brain drain which we suffer from in uh, uh, Africa. WHO estimates that the global disease burden in Africa is about 25%. The global disease burden, 24 to 25%. Yet the total healthcare workforce is only 3% in Africa. These are statistics as recent as 2018. So you can imagine the fall shot we have. So most of these doctors or nurses will end up migrating to another country in quotes for greener pastures. So this human resource aspect is a very serious problem. The next one is leadership and governance. Of course, there has to be the political will in every aspect uh, for that facet to grow. And you realize that most governments will focus a lot on probably the defense arm in their ministries, um, maybe what, agriculture and so on. Health is given less priority. And of course, within the same leadership and governance, we talk about levels of corruption, which can stem from the highest some of the highest positions to the lowest. So you have people um, attaining these positions who embezzle government funds, who misappropriate them, who demand for incentives or percentages for awarding contracts to other people. The problems are so many. And also, when you have the wrong people being appointed in certain key positions because of their affiliations and nepotism. So this arm is also equally very important because once there is no political will to improve on the healthcare system, eventually that arm would never grow. The third thing is medicines and technologies. And as we all know, <coughs> many a times, our government medical stores will fall short of medicines Sometimes these medicines are stolen by healthcare workers or their affiliates. You are in your private practice and they will, the, the thing will circulate. They will bring those same medicines to come and sell to you. Sometimes we are even faced with substandard medications and counterfeit drugs. I mean, we know about the recent issue of cough syrups in Banjul, the Gambia. I don't know what came out of that investigation. <laughs> so these are all many, many problems. The other aspect is health financing. The budgetary allocation from government is usually very low towards health. That has to come up. As I usually say, a healthy population is a healthy future for the country. A healthy population is a healthy future for the country. So if you have inadequate financing of the go of, of, for health, and then there is poor budget reallocation, and in Africa we are more or less very much donor dependent. We are seated there depending on NGOs and other foreign aids for our support, whilst we sit on wealth and riches. The big question is why? And obviously, when you look at financing, within the health system, for example, there was a study done and it shows that um, in Nigeria, Cameroon, and Sudan, you have almost 70% of health care delivery being done out of pocket payments because we have underdeveloped insurance schemes. There is no insurance policies, no insurance schemes to cover people up for that. Okay? 
it, in that same study, it revealed that we, we, Nigeria, for example, we have over 5,000 people going on medical tourism per month with a total expenditure of close to $1.2 billion. That's a lot of money which could be recirculated into the country. Of course, service delivery, that is we talk about the different levels of hospital care. And you have those from community levels to uh, regional district levels, regional, before you get to a tertiary center. For example, in Sierra Leone, you have more or less community health centers. You have your district health centers, and then you have your main tertiary hospitals. Most of these centers, when you look at them, so the, the service delivery, the problems are immense, starting from the structures themselves, uh, talking about uh, the, 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 equip, the equipping these structures, uh, providing all the logistics, and the other aspect is the maintenance culture. The maintenance culture in Africa of healthcare facilities is very poor. People go with the attitude that, oh, this is a government property, I can destroy it, so what? It's not mine. So that, that, that sort of uh, um, love and care for your country's belongings is not there. And finally, information system, wherein we need to develop registries for database collection. This forms a hub. This forms a hub for you to collect, to analyze, to process, and publish data. You can equally use this same one okay, to advocate for policy changes because the evidence is there. So these are the six main pillars which the WHO has advocated for as the main um, areas that has to be looked on in terms of healthcare um, uh, problems and solutions. Next slide, please. I came across this uh, study. It was done by uh, a fellow called Ole Oleribe et al and colleagues in 2019 during the African Epidemiologic Association meeting that happened in Mozambique. And uh, he, they, they, he did a study call, called Identifying Key Challenges Facing Healthcare Systems in Africa. So this was a meeting attended by from over 11 African countries along from also Portugal, Cuba, and the United Kingdom. And they did a study on this uh, attendance um, and then they found out that the human resource aspect contributed most. Some of all the problems we have mentioned was one of the key factors that uh, is, is breaking up the healthcare system in Africa. And then the other one was uh, inadequate budget allocation and poor leadership. And they advocated that solving two, if you happen to take care of this, two thirds of the problem are solved. Final slide, please. Okay, so um, solutions of healthcare is just the flip end of like my colleague said. So one is political support, finance and budget reallocation. You need to develop insurance scheme. And then there's what we call a public-private partnership. This public-private partnership, for example, one of the advocacy was if you have mining companies to come into your country, okay, you tax them a certain percentage which you actually use to develop health centers serving that community where you're mining. So that is a sort of reflection back to a community and then training of healthcare workers, encouraging them, building hospitals, research centers, and then of course the public awareness because now we are geared towards preventive medicine. You need to advocate, you need to inform our, our people because most of them are poorly informed about their health conditions and they present very late to hospitals. And of course you have to work with WHO and UN. Final slide. Okay, so for, with regards to Mark Foundation, I think one, we are very grateful towards their efforts and because they have been playing an integral role in promoting the healthcare system in Africa. They have supported in the training of many uh, doctors and other healthcare workers in diverse specialties. And uh, we are all being trained in well-recognized uh, institutions um, in the UK and others. It also helps us because this training increases your horizons and, and make you a better, better critical thinker 
and uh, you are able to analyze facts better. And then, of course, because the Mark Foundation happened to liaise with Office of the First Ladies and the Ministries of Health, they are there in a place to help advocate for policy implementations. And then, of course, in our country, today we are having a promotion in oncology services and respiratory medicine, for which is one of is the cause I'm pursuing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Huba. Uh, our next presenter is going to come, Dr. Molisi uh, Ingwesa. So we are operating in five minutes. Let's try to stick within the time frame, please. All right, definitely. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are from. So thank you very much, um, and good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're coming from. My name is Dr. Mkoli Singwenya. I'm from the Ministry of Health and Child Care, Zimbabwe. And um, the target is screening for active TB technical lead. And basically what I do is um, I'm involved in uh, TB screening at the national level, uh, where I'm also integrating uh, the screening for communicable with non-communicable diseases. And I did with the MEC Foundation a postgraduate diploma issue with human resources. I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, and there is a general lack of accountability amongst the healthcare workers, uh, the leaders, and even the patients and the communities themselves. And of course, we have the issue of funding. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through that table um, where I'm just presenting solutions and the impact of these Make Foundation scholarships uh, that um, has been realized and the impacts that are yet to come, uh, looking at the trajectory that we're actually on. So we're looking at the challenge of healthcare worker capacitation and what we really want to have in the end on the last column there, we are saying the potential impact is that we need to have improved patient diagnosis, treatment, and care. And how exactly are we supposed to get there on the outcome? We're looking at high quality international standard service delivery. And what do we exactly need for us to do that? We need a trained cadre to attend to our patients. And the intervention that we need there is to train healthcare workers in various disciplines. And Make Foundation really has come through um, to a certain extent, they, by giving access to high quality training for practicing cadres. Secondly, looking at healthcare worker staffing, we see that what we really need at the end of the day is still the same impact of having improved patient diagnosis, treatment, and care. Um, and um, the solution really is to train healthcare workers in various disciplines. It's also to increase the number of trained staff, so increasing the staff establishment. And um, the interventions that we've had is the training for multiple cadres. Because you look at the initial one, we're looking at access to the quality training. But now we're looking at the volumes now, because training one particular cadre in the whole country is not really going to, to help much. Um, but like um, uh, Senator Raj said, uh, that we're now increasing the number of people that are, are going to be trained. I think this may then come in handy to increase the number of quality healthcare workers uh, that are working in our hospitals in, in Africa and resulting in uh, more staff to deliver our standardized services that are of international standard. Uh, and then we have the challenge of poor uh, patient access to care. And what we really need to do there is to improve care by decentralizing services. So this issue of centralization seems to be um, prevalent in so many African countries where we have the best services being given to those who are in urban uh, centers, the best services being given to those maybe who are in the capital cities and so on. And for us to be able to decentralize, we really need to have mid-level healthcare workers trained on a large scale. So the training of specialists on its own is not sufficient, but we need to train even the most junior of doctors to be able to provide the bare minimum of what we call quality care. And these junior doctors are actually quite content to work even at the lowest levels of our healthcare system, while they provide quality. And we really need to actually scale that up. Next slide, please. And I was also asked to talk about um, the integration of TB and diabetes screening. Um, this is a case of health system strengthening. So in our country, Zimbabwe, there was a study that was done that, shows the, that showed the feasibility of TB diabetes bidirectional screening amongst risk groups for TB and or diabetes. Um, so this intervention was piloted by the Ministry of Health and Child Care with support from partners. And what it showed was that amongst newly diagnosed TB patients, 11.5% of them actually had diabetes mellitus, which is quite a huge number. So we then said, 
it's actually worth it to then say if we newly diagnose someone with a TB, let's screen them for diabetes. And if we have someone who is a non-diabetic, let's screen them for TB. So uh, my Make Foundation sponsored training in diabetes has come in handy to develop a web-based system uh, to enable bidirectional screening at community level. So with my knowledge of diabetes, I then integrated that um, with the knowledge of TB uh, so that we develop a system that we're using that automatically selects the clients that are actually eligible for TB screening um, amongst those who are diabetic and those eligible for diabetes testing um, amongst those who have come for TB screening and then support a robust referral system for DM clients and improve community awareness on NCDs and their link to communicable diseases. Uh, so high-risk groups being screened for TB and at risk for diabetes are automatically detected, screened, diagnosed, and enrolled uh, for relevant treatment. And the potential impact of this is that we will then reduce negative TB outcomes and detect diabetes mellitus early and reduce the complications at a community-based level. Next slide, please. Um, then this is just a summary of the impacts that we are yet to realize if we continue on the current trajectory to improve the quality of care being delivered to patients, uh, access to specialists and international best practice and evidence-based medicine, opportunities for health system strengthening, setting up of integrated clinics and comprehensive care, as the example in the previous slide, minimizing patient costs, uh, decentralized service delivery, adoption of new innovations in terms of screening, diagnostics, treatment care, awareness and prevention, and broadening the horizons of healthcare workers. So this will then also stimulate research like it did when I was doing my MSc, uh, trainings and also innovation in our African countries. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much. I think that was the last slide. So just a quote from B.B. King says, the beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. So one scholarship that has been gifted to us as Africa is a perpetual gift. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. I would like uh, now Dr. Hilary to share his thoughts on the following. Uh, what are the challenges rele uh, relevant to the, your specialty and how do you uh, intend to address them in your community and how Merck Foundation training help them in your practice? Doctor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So basically much has been spoken and it's just a re repeat of everything that has been done but I'm just going to touch on this acute medicine situation in my country and the fact that it's a new experience and how we are going about it there. Let's proceed, please. Okay, so never mind a lot of writing. I'm just gonna go straight. So everybody know Liberia is the most beautiful country in Africa, so that's where I'm from. And, uh, <laughs> and we, we, we are having a population of approximately 5.3 million people based on past uh, assessment. Currently, there's an ongoing census. We have a more recent statistics. However, I think uh, our health sector is, if not, one of the most challenged ones in Africa based on so many challenges we've had. We were the worst hit by Ebola, COVID, civil crisis, and a whole lot. But there's something about us as practitioners. We are very resilient. We are some of the most committed set of people because in the midst of all of these things, we are still thriving and making sure that we'll meet our targets. So for that, I hats off to all Liberian doctors out there. And um, basically, acute medicine is more or less a new thing, a new phenomenon around medicine. And uh, I've been blessed to be one of two Liberians trained by Merck Foundation in the field of acute medicine. But with a population of about 5.3 million people and having only two acute medicine specialists, you can imagine what we are going through meeting up with the challenge. Next slide. So considering we had, next slide, we had only three slides to produce, so I tried to jam them together. So I just summarized my challenges and means because of access or means of transport. Ambulance services are now readily available. Even in the capital, you have similar challenge. Patients in patients with stroke MI, instead of riding an ambulance, they use tricycles, transport car, and they come to the facility. And these are things that we need to work on. That's what I see as my personal challenge. I need to work on that. I need I see it as a goal, personal goal, that I must resolve that challenge in my country. Meaning in first world countries and other countries around the world. If there's an emergency, a patient calls, in the next five minutes, maximum 10 minutes, you're going to have trained personnel 
at that patient door, taking the patient to the next facility or the nearest facility as soon as possible. And they're going to be making necessary interventions as the patient is being transported. We don't have such services available in our places of work. You see the patient being transported by relatives. And that patient might, in some instance, be in a case of MI and die on the relatives on the way to the facility without the relatives even knowing that the patient has expired. Sadly, we face these things almost on a regular basis because we don't have means of giving our patients proper ambulatory service. That's a personal goal for me. And another thing, the facilities. I was asking a question and like Dr. Ewa was saying, most of the things that were discussed here, we don't have them in our emergency settings. How do you expect us to arrest these situations timely, properly? We don't even have patient monitors in the emergency room. How will you know the cardiac status of the patient whilst being under your care? We don't even have the defibrillator readily. How will you arrest such situation? So it's saddening, but it's something that we need to work on as a people and as a nation. Trained personnel. Dr. Hubala said something very important. The training is not only for the healthcare, the doctors, but everybody who is involved in patient care, they must be trained at some level. Let them have the basic understanding of what to do at what point and when. And that's where I can just list to my last slide. The final slide. That's why I can just list to my last slide because that's something that I've tried to do with my team. I work currently at a facility wherein we, we initially, when I started, we were seeing 15, 16,000 patients in the emergency room annually, more or less. And with time, based on these trainings, I've had a chance to reach 20, 22,000 in the last year plus. Now, what I've done, managed to do is set up treatment protocols in my emergency room. Make sure that even if I'm not there, the next person in line knows the guidelines to follow and it's all standard. Once you are doing these things, you have knowledge being spread from one person to another. So with the little knowledge we acquire from this training, we must transcend it to, the, to our colleagues and other paramedical staff, people around us that we work with. When they are well equipped, they don't have to be as well equipped as you are. If the chance is there for them to be as well equipped, they must be. You must give them the chance to learn. Everybody must get involved because in order to give a quality service to our patients, we must all be hands on from the doctor to the nurse to the physician assistant everyone should be active so i set up protocols and do routine refresher guideline training with my staffs and we are being effective that's why we have this improvement with our patient load with time and trust me when i started my my program in the first two three weeks and i picked up i mean i got my nerves were much calmed in my emergency room i'll walk in and see an emergency i'm not there are times that when you're on top of your game, you don't panic as much because you know these are the trend of even in this acute condition. How do I stop it from progressing from this point to that point? When you have this under control, you walk in your emergency room and you confidently manage these cases. And the knowledge base has broadened remarkably. So, so far, these are the points we've made with time, and we are hopeful that we'll continue to impact our society positively. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hillary. Uh, now I would like uh, Dr. Lorraine to please share with us the scope and challenges of pediatric emergency medicine in public sector and what are the new services and facilities that you intend to provide after this specialized training? How will, you, uh, be, uh, how will your patient benefit from it? Hi, you can move up to the, okay, the slide. So basically, most of the things were already said are generic to all the hospitals in Africa and all the ministries in Africa. We are struggling with all the things that has already been mentioned and there's no point in going back to that. Um, so basically what we have on the ground, I have alluded for before to my other topics, in my other topics. Um, so what we have currently, um, we do both pediatrics emergency and routine primary pediatric services within the same setup. So we have 
a department that catered for both. So initially it was quite difficult because the triage wasn't done properly, whether this is an emergency or not an emergency. So we have managed to, to divide the two also now that um, uh, those ones that are just there for ambulatory medicine go to separate department and the other ones that are there for emergency can be noted easily and easily um, triage. Um, the resuscitating rooms are now equipped with the appropriate size consumables and equipment and that's due to the COVID donation. If one thing for Namibia, we receive a lot of COVID donation, either from foreign donors or the private sectors. And we have managed to, to use this um, equipment and consumable appropriately to find the pediatrics one, the neonatal ones, and, and set up what we needed to set up. So the resuscitation rooms are now well equipped with it. Um, and there's also an excellent exposure to a variety of common uh, pediatric emergency condition. Next slide. Now, when it comes to the challenges, initially it's now rectified, but initially we didn't have a pediatric emergency department. It was just a corner within an adult emergency. And most of the time, the nursing care there and everybody there, all the healthcare workers there, you tend to find people who shy away from seeing children, who shy away from necessitating children. And, and that's not because they don't want to or they don't care. It's just because that they haven't received enough training. They don't have the basics to, to, to resuscitate children. So we are also trying to, to set up programs to do the basic pediatric training in just basic courses so everybody can become comfortable. If when I see a gastro child, when I see a child with a pneumonia and is or need uh, resuscitation, what is the basics I should do? And, and it, in that process, we are trying to develop guidelines. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, the stuff, and then the, the flow charts and the guidelines that are existing there, um, mostly uh, adult related. You will want to run to a flow chart to look for the dose of adrenaline, what's written there, it's, it's for adult. So we are trying to also develop guidelines and, and, and um, flow charts that are more equipped for children. Um, yeah. And yeah, so and then also the, the TRIA system to develop a TRIA system and also um, implement a TRIA system. So all these things were not there when we started off and from the MEC Foundation training, uh, we were able to, I was able to acquire the knowledge and start implementing some of the things and still it's an ongoing process and we're still working on it. Next slide. So basically this is what we have done because instead of the children walking into blank rooms where the anxiety will be up there, they work in a calm, they're in this type of rooms and um, it's, it's automatically calms them down. And we are trying to do that for most of the hospital because this doesn't take a lot of money. You just need to find paint and somebody who can paint and, and you do the creations. And people actually like doing this like on their off day as part of giving back to the nation. So you just decide, okay, today we are painting here and you paint there. And also we have created the playroom, which is especially useful. The last picture here, it's a playroom. It's a big, very big playroom, which is especially useful in the the malnutrition kids, the stabilization phase when they need to be um, stabilized. So that's what we have done there. Next slide. There's a lot to be done, like developing the, the <clears throat> like developing the guidelines, say putting in place a proper trial system in the pediatric department, making sure that everyone that works with children is appropriately trained for children. And not everybody can afford to go and study and do big courses, but the basics. A, B, C, this is what you do when a child come in with this and have simulation courses done so that everybody are comfortable. When, it's, when we see a child, we don't all go into corners trying to disappear, but we all move towards a child that needs the, the help. Yeah, and then we, like I said also earlier, we have started with outreach programs because um, where I work is the only tertiary hospital in the whole of Namibia. So all referrals come here. And some of these people are sitting 800 kilometers away. They need to be able to know when the child come to me, I'm 800 kilometers away from where the next help is. What do I need to do? So for this reason, we are doing outreach pro um, 
programs to these places and try to set up an emergency department also in these areas and yeah, also giving them the basics. So most of the time when you are on call for, on, for the department, you are on call for the whole country. You get phone call from as far as 900 kilometers from Vandong. Like the organophosphate patient I presented here came from the south about 900 kilometers. And over the phone trying to direct the person how to safely intubate the child and get the child to you is quite challenging. And most of the time you make use of the technology and then you were like, please switch on your WhatsApp on video. Doctor, I don't have data. And you're like, okay, I'm going to send you data, but we need going to do this over WhatsApp. So you talk the patient through intubating. And that's why we saw it necessary. Maybe it's also for us not to sit here in the capital city on our high horse. We need to go down to these places, spend a week or two every month there in a different area every time teach them on the ground as the patients comes in, this is what you need to do. And all this would not have been possible if it wasn't for the knowledge acquired during the MEC Foundation. I thank you very much. So our next presenter is Dr. Gurata Kuda, witness. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I know that when you are in the last band of presenters, everyone's just tired and everyone has just said all the points, so they are now bored. But I will not deprive you from the opportunity of hearing my voice. So you are welcome. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to be presenting about the challenges also and the solutions in uh, healthcare in Africa, more specifically in uh, Botswana. So I'm going to be focusing more on the dermatology field. This is where Meg sponsored me to study postgrad diploma in, um, in, in dermatology in clinical practice. So currently I'm pursuing masters in, uh, in dermatology in uh, clinical practice. So when I first got the call from Dr. Kingsley, so he was uh, interviewing me for the scholarship. So dermatology you can just synonymously say underserved specialty. So initially, when I saw this uh, international call, I was so sure that this is a scammer. No, why who will be calling me from this international number? So India was like, no, I'm Dr. Kinsley. I got your number from Minister of Health. So are you ready for interview? I'm like, yes, I've been ready for years. I'm ready. I'm ready for this. So and then ultimately, I, uh, I was sponsored and did the program. So now I'm going to be talking about the challenges. So disclaimer, I'm not an expert or a specialist in dermatology. I'm a medical officer with uh, now also with more knowledge on dermatology field, but not an expert. So, but those challenges, like we have been or we have uh, been saying, they're all common to us. So, which shows us that from here, what do we do? We don't just say our problems in silos and then we just say, oh, in Gambia, we don't have specialists. Or in Zimbabwe, we don't have specialists. So, this is the opportunity now that we see as Africa. Our problems are the same, so we need to be working together in our problems, find a way to work together. So the most common challenge we have already said it in adequate manpower, in adequate specialists. So which uh, means that for patients, especially in the dermatology field, they have to have long waiting periods to be seen by the only two dermatologists in the whole country in the public sector, which means in those times when they're waiting for the specialist, what happens, their conditions, they deteriorate, they have a disfigurement, and also they go on to have more anxiety and depression problems, which now leads to reduced manpower at the work because they are now so depressed that they can't work. Ultimately, it affects the whole country in terms of economic impact because they can't be productive at work from just the simple dermatology conditions with that if we were to focus more on them, then this will be happen. Now they become more expensive to manage. So, and then we have our competing priorities. So we mentioned that mostly we focus more on um, mortality issues. So in, uh, in Africa, it's mostly infectious diseases, I guess. So which means now dermatology, because uh, it causes more morbidity than mortality, is not a priority. So we want to deal with those that will kill you first. But as the, the significant morbidity it causes, it causes a great impact in our quality of life, which is also an important factor. 
So, and then the other thing is that when you have that one dermatologist which covers the whole half of the country, they don't even have the basic equipment to manage and uh, diagnose those conditions. Like uh, Prof was presenting earlier, he mentioned something simple. To him, it was something simple like give IV beta, beta blockers. We don't have IV beta blockers. To him, it seemed like a simple thing, but those are the simple things that we really don't have, basic things. And then lack of multidisciplinary and also international um, partnership. Like we are saying, one from Gambia was saying that we don't have specialists, we don't have equipment, but we are all from Africa. From Sierra Leone also, he was saying that they don't have specialists. So now we have to find a way to work together so that as Africa, the most beautiful continent since we all our countries are all beautiful like we said so we need to find a way to work together so that we can improve more on those things because it seems like if you work individually we have been doing it individually and it hasn't been helping so it's time for us to find a way to move on forward so the other thing is lack of in or in inadequate scholarships so MEC has been working hard to provide us with the scholarship so that you can prove on that. So like I said, dermatology doesn't get sponsored. That's why I was thinking, no, Dr. Kingsley, this must be a scam because dermatology doesn't get sponsored. So as a medical officer, because I'm not a specialist, even though MEC has um, helped us in terms of gaining the knowledge that we cascade to our colleagues in terms of theoretically, the problem is that there isn't a practical component which is also very important. I think that's why mostly in my countries and other countries I hear that is the same thing is not recognized. Because if it's recognized, we will see by the pay uh, so the pay will tell us that it's being recognized, which is an incentive will make us work harder. Because I think if it continues like that, the application rate is also going to drop because mostly we are going to feel that it's not really useful in terms of helping us. Because you need to be motivated to be able to effectively help other people, right? So and then in terms of the solutions, I've been saying some of the solutions like in camp, in, uh, empowerment and capacitation of healthcare workers. Like we said, healthcare workers, we're not only talking about doctors, we're not only talking about nurses, but everyone who is uh, involved in patient care. So empowerment in terms of um, incentives, the top one, empowerment in terms of scholarships, empowerment in terms of also practical scholarships, and also empowerment in terms of um, allowance of uh, basic equipment, and also um, continued empowerment in terms of uh, educating also other uh, cadres which deal with patients. So and the other thing that we talk about is sensitization, sensitization in dermatology in terms of uh, public awareness. Because sometimes the reason why the condition they end up um, complicated is that patient doesn't even really know that you can actually go to the clinic to be helped in terms of this thing. A simple thing like acne. So a patient you will see, like previously when we talked uh, initially about COVID, we talked about how COVID was coined online by our Facebook um, users. So it's the same thing in terms of, if I can give an example with acne. So you see someone posting, oh guys, I have this um, pimple here, what can I use? And someone will be saying, no, you just use betamethasone. I was prescribed it way back and it helped. But this is not the right information because it's a very dangerous cream when not used properly. So this is the empowerment that we need so that our patient knows that when this happens, you can actually go to the hospital or clinic and be helped. And then you also have researcher opportunities that are, are lacking. So if we're given, if we're to be given in terms of grants, or also if our governments and also even private um, companies were to provide in terms of funding for research opportunities to actually help and also actually help in terms of really finding out the, the, the problems. Because if you don't know the, the magnitude of the problem, then you can't solve it and you can't actually know how significant it is to solve it. So and then multidisciplinary and international teamwork, I've already said it. So from now on, we're not going to be saying uh, in Nigeria, we have a problem with uh, specialists or in, uh, we are going to be saying in Africa, we have these problems. How are we collectively going to address these problems? So and then other thing, last thing is mental health support. So working in a system where, a system where there are so, 
the challenges, there are so many challenges, it's mental taxing. We all know that we've also experienced that a system where there are no incentives, there are no equipment, is mentally taxing. And for us to be moving on and be motivated, we need that mental health support. Next slide, please. So um, in the way MEG helped in capacitation and empowerment that I've already said in terms of the scholarship that we move on to cascade to our colleagues, even though there are no incentives, but it does help at that point of care of the patient that you see, which leads to more accurate diagnosis in dermatological conditions, more timely referrals, and also it cuts the time for patients to wait for dermatologists because we're able to effectively initial manage them which improve in, ter in turn improves the morbidity and mortality and improves the, the quality of life. So I'll conclude and say that I hope make and also our different governments the work towards uh, the, the issue of uh, recognizing these causes in terms of uh, in the system of how they can recognize them in the system. And also have uh, is Africa and Asia, right? So in terms of dermatology, there is a particular cause that you can do in a uh, post the uh, MSc in um, in dermatology. So if there's anyone here in Asia who is watching or in Africa, I'm here, they can sponsor me. I'm ready to go there and uh, <laughs> I'm ready to go and continue so that I can effectively be recognized and uh, also effectively be recognized as dermatology in my system. And also I was hoping to see the first lady, but I didn't get to see her. I hope she's watching that I'm ready, I'm here for sponsorship. I'm ready to serve my community. Please, you can just call me or send me a Facebook chat. So thank you guys. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Gorapta. Uh, we now move on to Dr. Awata Kanika. So myself, I've already introduced myself as physician from Ministry of Health Mauritius. I have done my undergraduation, next slide please. I have done my undergraduation from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi, India, and my, uh, my post-graduation from Banaras Hindu University, India. And after that, I was thinking I will not study anymore. But when this course they gave me, I say for the better care of my patients and for improving myself, I will really going to go ahead with the diploma in acute medicine where I got distinction and again they gave me a course of masters in acute medicine. I was thinking no I will not study anymore because you know it is very difficult when you are working with kids to study more. But then again for the betterment for myself, for my patients and the passion I have for medicine, the amount I like to study, I again I'm doing masters in acute medicine in one month I'm finishing. So uh, I have been uh, given a topic, training in acute and respiratory care in Mauritius and abroad during the COVID pandemic and beyond. This is a bit different, no challenges, no solutions. Here we are just discussing that how Merck <laughs> is helping us. So uh, next slide, please. I have also done a special course in polysomnography and bronchoscopy, and I have special interest in these patients. So feelings, my feelings regarding this course, I believe that medicine is a constantly evolving field and we should keep pace with the advancements in medicine to provide a better care for our patients. Online learning is a good experience. It gives a positive atmosphere as we can check and learn many things side by side on the internet. It motivates e-learning atmosphere at home and constructive use of information. This course has helped me improve my skills, increase my knowledge and bring out the improved version of myself. One very good thing about this course is that it is all guidelines and evidence based. So it is very interesting to work methodologically. I appreciate the way this course is planned. The tutors provided to us by the university are always ready to help and guide us. All friends and tutors I met on this platform are from different countries. The spirit of learning and the teaching is great and it is not enough to express myself in words regarding this experience. Next. My vision for this course, as a respiratory physician, when I practice the cases of respiratory medicine, I usually come across many associated comorbidities 
And of course, the COVID patients, when we were treating, we were having so many comorbidities. So this course of acute medicine has helped me a lot to understand my patients well and treat them. This course has covered many important topics in the branch of medicine, which is helping me a lot to have more global approach towards the management of my patients of respiratory medicine with associated comorbidities. During the COVID pandemic, I was posted to COVID hospital many times, and it was a great experience during the challenging situation, and my up-to-date knowledge, which I got through this course, has helped me a lot. The way this online course is helping and giving an opportunity to many doctors who want to study more, and, but due to the lack of resources, they cannot do so is appreciable. In Mauritius, my other colleagues who are doing this course also feel the same way. I also wish to add that when we go abroad for meetings and conferences, our knowledge helps us to have better communication and understanding about the subject. So I found that online learning is a good step to improve knowledge of doctors and make them learn new modalities, advancements in medicine. And doctors who are getting this opportunity to learn online should be grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we'll go to my Ghanaian emergency physician who is going to be donating a cardioversion machine to me very soon. Dr. Emmanuel Blankson. Right, thank you very much. Um, so I, th I guess we'll, we'll, we'll go back to the same challenges and solutions. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm Emmanuel Steve Blankson, an emergency physician working at the, in Ghana with Ghana Health Service. All right, um, so I think the topic we are all familiar with. So I will just um, focus on a few areas that probably I want to throw more light on. So I think that, so next slide, please. All right, so basically what we are saying is the same. Healthcare in general has, has improved in the whole world, but even in Africa, but if you look at the improvement, I think still Africa lags behind. And the last statement is actually what should really scare you. Okay, 20 countries with the highest maternal debt, 19 are African countries. Indeed, in Ghana, the when somebody is pregnant and goes to deliver and comes back, the greeting, if you translate it in English, is like lucky you. It's like you, where you went to, it's like a dungeon, kind of. So these are some of the issues. All right, please, next slide. All right, so I think one of the colleagues um, highlighted this briefly, but I think most of the things that we have said, um, I want to make it more or less like a take home message. So whatever problem that you are looking at, if you disintegrate it well, it may fall into one of these. The poor leadership, inadequate human resource, inadequate funding, um, basically the challenges in healthcare system in Africa. Um, the, a, a major part of it was attributed to the inadequate human resource. However, if we are able to really interrogate the issue, you notice that underlying all of them is the poor leadership. And I would want to argue from this point, assuming we, we get about 1,000 top-notch specialists in Africa, in the next 10 years, if we have poor leadership, all of them will end up going somewhere and will come back to square one. It's the same thing. If somebody comes and say, okay, all the money that we need for logistics, funding, hospital, everything, if they give all those things to us, with poor leadership, we will maintain it well, we will motivate the people, and by the time we realize, these things will happen. And indeed, there are practical examples where people funded projects. We got support, and then they funded some projects, and they left. And soon afterwards, you notice that maybe when they come back some few years again, everything would have come down. So leadership is very, very key, and it's at all levels. The other important thing is that um, certain aspect of healthcare goes beyond, uh, let me say, health in general. So health, it becomes something like a product. So for example, um, this morning we learned about spinal cord injuries and all that. So the trauma surgeon does what he's trained to do. But from the etiology, you notice that you need to fix roads. Road is really not under health. Okay, we need to talk about regulation, the police and the rest, these things are not really under health. If you're talking about maternal and all those ones, 
we are talking about education of the of the of the female okay or the girl child which is really under ministry of education so there are certain things that go beyond um, the health sector in general and that's where the, at the governance and the policy level these things have to be looked at then when we come down even at the lowest level to the leadership rear its end um, it's good Mac is doing this thing and um, it's good all of us are passionate about it but um, if I use my experience and uh, if we are being frank not all of us really do what we are supposed to do as specialists at times you get to the upper level and where we need a specialist to be I'm an emergency physician so I'm passionate about this so it's like maybe at 2 a.m when you need the specialist to attend to that child with um, maybe status epilepticus most of the bigger hospitals, you won't get any of those bosses around 2 a.m. on Sunday or Saturday. So that is leadership at that level. So in the hospital itself, when we need something done, what happens? What time does the head of the facility come to work? What time does he leave? So these are things that we have to really, really, I mean, discuss. Because some of the issues, you notice that training and all those ones, some of them may not necessarily depend so much on money i mean getting protocols and guidelines and all those things you may not really need anything to do it and so the leadership is something that i want all of us to maybe start thinking about because at times it appears like everything is money and the, to the extent that the things the little little things that you can do to save patients life i mean monitoring someone's vitals even if you don't have extensive gadgets you can actually check a pulse you may not have SPO2, but you can actually count respiratory rate. So these are things that um, we are we will be able to do on I mean on our own. Please next. All right. So I think I've highlighted um, a lot of it. But as we say, so budgetary allocation to the health sector should be improved locally, and then external partnership with relevant organisations should be sought to meet teaming demands of the healthcare. Um, I must emphasise that. Again, this one is important. Um, although it's good to partner people, what Mac is doing and all that, again, we should think about how to wean yourself off. You cannot have Mac every day all the time. So at a point, we should look at, so wh why can't our government lead something like this? So that's where I think we should be looking at. When you need help, somebody can help you. But to some extent, you should grow to become an independent person. And that's something that we have to also think about. Then, of course, prioritize skill, um, skilled labor to address the emerging health conditions. So because we don't have a lot of specialist cover and all that, I think in Ghana, the number of respiratory physicians, we have less than 20 in the whole country with population more than 30 million. So obviously, some of these programs and the rest, I mean, come in handy. The good thing, too, is that it doesn't take you away from your facility. So it's not as if I'm the only emergency physician here seven about five regions but when i was doing this program it's not as if i left and then the staff strength there will i mean will also be affected so it's very good and the, the opportunity of hearing from your brothers and sisters in other places with similar challenges so maybe i maybe ghana maybe i may be complaining but uh, we have five public um, medical schools and two private medical schools so if i hear that somebody is saying that they have just one then you know at times you don't really know whether you are supposed to bring this as a challenge or not so i think these things help and you may be amazed like as i've heard maybe medical officers and all that they are doing great in their district and it's something that um, motivates you to know that um, you are not the only one suffering but other people are using um, very minimum resources to make an impact and of course getting to know top-notch specialists and all that to exposes you to a lot of um, current information. And right from the respiratory program, we were able to, I was able to liaise with the pediatrician. So we established like a specialized clinic to take care of asthma patients. And um, suddenly I started seeing a lot more of COPD patients. And somebody said that at times, if you don't have, maybe if you don't have any um, car, if you buy a Toyota Corolla red, suddenly you start finding a lot of Toyota Corolla that is red color in town. And that's what I guess happened. So suddenly I was able to pick a lot of these COPDs and we give them tailored care. So 
Um, I think basically that's that a lot has been said, but I'm very grateful for whatever that has happened. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Blankton. Uh, we've had a lot of splendid presentations by our panelists and a few highlights. Uh, Dr. Ewa mentioned issues with uh, brain drain due to poor compensation and demotivation. And um, our doctor there, sorry, uh, Dr. Yatsambo, and he mentioned something pertinent to infrastructures and uh, having public or uh, private involvement in these facilities and government subsidizing. Dr. Hubala, <laughs> sorry, <but> I, <laughs> Dr. Hubala uh, mentioned something pertinent as well, referencing to the same government involvement, training of staffs, paramedical and medical staffs, and also with that of the WHO requirement for setting up a facility or a vibrant healthcare sector, which is very important. And um, Dr. Uh, Zolisi, right? <laughs> Dr. Zolisi mentioned similar issues. So it just point to points that uh, we are all faced with similar challenges in Africa. And uh, Africa is one in so many aspects. Um, the doctor from Botswana, sorry, Dr. Gorata, she mentioned the multidisciplinary and international teamwork, which I see as very important. We all need to work together. I think we can start from here. We we'll set up a WhatsApp group and we can be able to link up with challenges in our different places and see how we can get help from different, different specialists around Africa. We can set up a team, visit each other and see how we can fill in those gaps. So international and multidisciplinary teamwork is very important. And I want to say thanks to everybody and we appreciate your presence here. Do we have any questions from the audience? Just one point regarding solutions. Uh, somebody didn't talk about like involving media. What I was thinking, is it possible in your countries to involve media for patient education and let media know about your problems? And maybe then the politics will get some interest in it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wanika. Ganikanika. Okay, I'm mothering your name since morning. Yeah, um, when it comes to media, unfortunately, what we see is not the positive kind of media that we are having as in other countries. What they would do is more like twisted. Um, if you have done something wonderful, you are not going to read that on the paper or on TV, but make a single mistake. That is the one they're going to publish. That is the one they're going to pick on all the social media platforms. So that's the problem we are having. So media education is very important. And that yesterday we mentioned one of the first ladies who presented. It's something that is needed. I'm happy that Mark Foundation is looking for, into that as well, because we have some media personnel right now having training on how to report, especially when it comes to the health sector, health conditions. It's very important. And we are hopeful that they will take whatever information, the knowledge that they have, and share it with their colleagues when they go back home. We have one from the Gambia. I'm looking forward to see what is going to be different when he go back. So yes, the media has not been friendly so far with the health sector, but we are hoping that at some point we will come together and it will be better. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. So the media is, like you say, is very important. Uh, we should get involved with them despite their way of presenting things. Uh, what you said is very important because the more they carry negative media and press about the health sector, the more the patient's trust in the facility is reduced. And uh, hence, I think that's one of the reasons why I give that classical example because a patient will know they have a condition, but it will seek other means because they don't trust the system. And that other means will give them a perceived fast solution to their condition, not knowing that in the next two weeks, they're going to be in shock and they're going to be running back to you. At times, you will explain to them, they will sign AMA and go home. And in less than a day or two, you see them coming, somebody's pulling them in wheel or so. So it's a challenge both ways. The media needs to play their part. And like you said, it's good Merck's foundation is getting them involved. And once they start to speak positive things about the health sector, 
then we can start to make progress. Patients will start to trust us more. And we, when we speak, they will listen more often. We definitely don't need to stop. We need to keep trying to reach out to them and reach out to our patients, make it an active process. Um, one more thing also, I think we left out, I'm not sure, because at some point I was tired and I think I do so, even though I'm up here. If the traditional medicine, I don't discourage it, but it's been a major challenge in Africa. And I think it's something that the media will be really helpful in trying to shed light on that as well. I just want to add that there. Thank you. I also want to add the beautiful songs the Merck Foundation is giving for patient education. That is the wonderful job they are doing, and I really appreciate they should keep on doing it. Thank you so much. You have a beautiful voice.